Beware of illegal video cassettes. Check whether this video cassette carries a genuine hologram. Video piracy is a crime. Do not accept it. Demand a genuine cassette from your video store. Poor quality illegal video cassettes reduce your viewing pleasure and jeopardize future film production. When in doubt, telephone the Federation Against Copyright Theft, FACT, on 0181 568 6646. Or alternatively, if you live in error, please contact, in fact, Suffolk Chambers, 1 Suffolk Street, Dublin 2, error. Telephone 01 671 seem a long way from your safe, cozy living room. Or is it? Because now, with these, the same mind-boggling effects can infiltrate your very home. And look, this was Pop, Mom, and little Charlie. So remember, do not underestimate the power of PlayStation. Brain Dead 13 is one of the earliest games to release on the PlayStation, having come out in 1995. Do you remember those interactive animated games from the 80s like Dragon's Lair and Space Ace? Well, this game is pretty much the same thing, for better and for worse. This game also came out on multiple other platforms, including the PC, Saturn and 3DO. The selling point of these games has always been that you're basically playing a cartoon, your character runs into different scenarios, and you need to quickly react with a tiny button press to move. If you press the wrong button or take too long to press it, you'll die. And believe me, this is a game where you will die a lot. The story for this game is pretty fun. You play as Lance, a computer technician who's been called out to an evil ominous castle for some tech support. After fixing up the problem, you happen to insult the evil disembodied owner of the place which leads to the castle's inhabitants, stopping at nothing to have you killed. Soon, nothing shall stand in my way. I will rule the world. Uh -oh. <laughs> From there on, you gotta try to escape the castle and kill any of the creatures who get in your way. I really love the animations and backgrounds in this game. You get a great Saturday morning cartoon vibe with the characters and locations, also mixed in with a surprising amount of over the top gore as well. It's all very lighthearted and silly gore, but it still makes for some great death animations because of it. The real draw of this game, to be honest, is seeing all of the incredibly vast amounts of ways that you can die. For each screen that you end up on, there's probably at least three or four different ways that you can die in it, and they're nearly all brilliant. As far as the presentation, the soundtrack, the voice work, everything here is fantastic. There's so much of it that they had to split it across two discs as well. It's clearly a very high budget production, and I think they nailed the gory Saturday morning cartoon style that they were looking for. The problem, however, and this rings true for pretty much any game of this style, is that the gameplay is incredibly shallow, obnoxiously difficult, obscenely obtuse at times, and incredibly repetitive. The entire game is more or less a test of your patience and memorization. 
The controls in this game are very simple. The game's weirdly CDI-esque option screen will show you all five commands available to you within the game. Any room you enter, you have a brief second to input a direction or press the action button. If you press the correct button at the right time, then you don't die. If you press the incorrect button or you mistime your button press, you die. Pretty simple, right? Well, it would be, but the game doesn't give you any prompts on which button you need to press. So you can show up in a room, a second will pass and you're dead. Then when you try the room again, you press the wrong button and you're dead. Do it again, dead. And again, dead. And again, okay, I got it this time and uh, dead again. There is a layout to this castle that allows you to move around it, but since you've got pretty much a second to decide which way you want to go, getting your bearings around the place is pretty much impossible your first time around. And some of the more action oriented rooms require very specific button presses nearly five or six times in a row with practically no info on what you've got to do. It's just guesswork and memorization. It looks like I knew to dodge the marionette a few times, kick it up and then climb up the rope, but for a few minutes before that, I was just dying over and over again because there's no way for you to know that you can do any of this. And the fact that it's time too, so if you press the right button in the wrong split second, you're dead anyway. It's so much unnecessary trial and error. I suppose it's a good thing that the game has so many cool death scenes because you're going to be seeing them about 100 times in your first 30 minutes of playing, but even then, because of that, you're going to end up watching the same scenes over and over again with how often you need to restart. And even the coolest scenes can wear a bit thin when it's your 10 times seeing them in the space of 5 minutes. I honestly don't really mind quick time events in games, but games like this that are built around them, and especially ones that give you no information whatsoever on what you're meant to be doing, they've just aged so, so poorly. There's no denying here that this game looks amazing, but even by 1995, this style of game had already worn out its welcome on the scene. The Sega CD, the Trudio, the Philips CDI all banked on games like this, and you can see how they turned out. Once you get over the pretty FMV and you get into the shallow, frustrating gameplay, it's something that only the most dedicated players wouldn't give up on within a few minutes. If you're into these type of games, absolutely give it a try. It's one of the weirder attempts at this genre and there's some genuinely great animation and dialogue here, but for everybody else, just watch somebody play through the game on YouTube instead. It's not that long and it will likely be 1000 times more enjoyable without you stopping and starting all the time. I can promise you that. <laughs> The wheel will provide. I'll assume you're all aware of Insomniac games, you might know them as the creators of Spyro the Dragon, Ratchet and Clank, the best Spider-Man game, Sunset Overdrive if you're cool and played that one. Well Disruptor is the first game the studio ever developed. Released in 1996, here we have a console and PlayStation exclusive sci-fi FPS game, and guess what? It's actually pretty good. Disruptor feels and plays very similarly to a lot of the Doom clones available at the time. We were still a few years off Half-Life, so you can expect to see all of the genre staples here. Individual levels, secret areas, lots of switches and doors to unlock. But Insomniac have put in a lot of effort into making the game stand out from the other early FPS games released on the platform. For one, this game's levels are built with 3D texture maps, and for 1996, this probably looks stunning compared to a lot of the games on the market, let alone FPS games. Sure, the weapons, items and enemies are still using 2D sprites, but they still look really nice mixed in with the 3D environments in the levels Insomniac has crafted here. While the levels still flow similarly to most Doom clones of the era, the map design does try to take advantage of the engine that they built for the game. Each of the levels look visually different than the last, with distinct colour changes, new additions to the level geometry, indoor and outdoor levels, although the outdoor levels have some heavy draw distance limitations that could make the original Turok jealous. As for the game's combat, the gunplay is basic but effective. Of course, you've got your pistol, machine gun, shotgun as expected, but Insomniac's love of weird weapons didn't just start in Ratchet and Clank. Disruptor features a bunch of plasma weapons, homing rocket launchers, plasma grenade minigun things. 
this uh, one-use flamethrower jet that wrecks everything. If I'm being honest, the weapons could feel and sound a little punchier at times. This game's shotgun in particular is pretty low down in the pantheon of video game shotguns, but it does get the job done. Interestingly, this game isn't just focused on guns alone. If anything, the game barely gives you ammo for any of these things. In the game's later levels, you'll find yourself struggling for ammo, even if you're hitting up some of the secret areas. This is part of the game's design though, because on top of your standard weapons, your main character also gets a bunch of psionic abilities as well, a new one being added after select missions. The psionic abilities give you a lot more options for combat, damaging, shockwaves, shields, heals, steerable, AoE, balls. The abilities will be just as important as your guns for getting through the game. There's also an ability called Drain that lets you regain some extra energy off downed enemies. So a big part of the game is swapping between your weapons and psionic attacks while trying to manage your limited resources on each. It's a really interesting gameplay mechanic and it does make the gameplay a lot more intense, especially since the game can be pretty brutal even on the default difficulty. There's a surprisingly wide variety of enemies in this game as well, ranging from melee, projectile hit scanners, big rocket boys, cyber mechs, bigger cyber mechs. There's a lot here and they'll make sure they make your life hell. Honestly, the levels, the gameplay, the enemies, everything here is great for a PS1 FPS game. We even get a full CD quality soundtrack, and while none of the tracks stuck me as particularly memorable, they all fit the levels really well. Now you might be wondering about the controls, but since this game doesn't use the Y axis similarly to Doom, movement and aiming is really easy using the D-pad and shoulder buttons for strafing. Changing weapons and powers can be cumbersome in the middle of a fight, but for a PS1 FPS this plays about as well as it possibly could. Now outside of the gameplay, I still need to talk about my single favourite thing in this game. If you don't have the brain power to outmaneuver a few droids with attitude, I never forgive myself for sending you on a real mission. Just remember, think fast, shoot fast, and kick ass. It is full of live action full motion video cutscenes. I'm talking cheesy B-movie, sci-fi, Starship Troopers-esque military storyline that's delivered surprisingly well by the actors they hired for the job. There's one of these before every single level and they just get better and better as the game goes on. Some of the delivery is just perfection. They want to see if you can nail the bad guys without blowing away any of the hostages. Hostages? Mm. In the words of your brother, being a stormer, it's more than just kicking ass. Show us you got what it takes and then maybe, just maybe, we'll send you out on a real mission. <laughs> And before every single level, the guy always turns to the camera dramatically and we get this scene. Every single level, I never get sick of it. Disruptor is a pretty tough game, but I genuinely had a lot of fun in my time playing it. For Insomniac's first full game as a developer, Disruptor is a really entertaining and polished effort, especially for a console exclusive FPS in 1996. If you like older boomer shooter style FPS games and you think you can tolerate the PS1 control scheme, this game comes highly recommended from me. If not for the gameplay, at least try it for the full motion video scenes, it's worth the price of admission alone. will provide
So I added this next game to the list because it looked like a Micro Machines clone and I, like most same people, love Micro Machines so I was looking forward to trying it out. When I booted up the game to my surprise, I found that that's actually developed by the same people who made Micro Machines 2, Turbo Tournament, Military, Supersonic Software. So this is legit a real Micro Machines game in everything but name. And what a name it is, Daredevil Derby 3D was released exclusively on the PlayStation in 1996. In Europe, this game is called Supersonic Racers, which not only references the developers, but is just a much better name in general. But if a game has a name as bad as Daredevil Derby 3D, then that's the one I want to play. This game packs a surprisingly large amount of content. We've got six different modes available from championships, head-to-heads, time trials, grand prix. There's plenty here to do and the game features over 30 different tracks to race on, with each of the game's 10 different locations housing 3 unique tracks. While a lot of the racing will take place on the road, in true Micro Machines style, this game features a variety of different vehicles that change based on where it is that you're racing. If you're on the snow, well, they change to snowmobiles. If you're underwater, you're in a submarine. If you're in the sky, well, now you're racing blimps. In space, you're in a rocket now, and you can barely control yourself. It's great. What's cool is that each of the vehicles control quite differently from one another. It gives the game a pretty steep learning curve since just as you're learning to get used to one vehicle, you're hopping immediately into a whole new type of vehicle in between races, but it does help to keep the gameplay fresh. The levels themselves are fun for the most part. The tracks are pretty short with three laps of one track taking anywhere from a minute to two minutes to complete on average. You can expect lots of hazards and drops. Most of the levels as well have a ton of sneaky shortcuts. This game also features a lot of the fun level gimmicks from Micro Machines like this whale that spits you ahead of the track or these platforms that you gotta drive onto that transport you further throughout the track. I always love these. Visually, the large amount of level variety is nice. All the tracks are very bright and colorful if a bit basic. Each world has its own unique look and feel, it's just that none of them are really that memorable. The graphics overall look very much like that of an early PS1 game. They do the job, but they are pretty much just passable for the most part. The game's roster of characters on the other hand, I think I hate each and every one of these designs. Thankfully, you're not going to really see them much outside of this screen, but it's slim pickings. Each character has their own vehicle design which is nice and they can range from pretty cool to just like a orange blob, I guess. The music here is surprisingly quite good as well. It can range from catchy to atmospheric and it even has top tier underwater music as well. Not bad at all. Once you get to grips with the control in Daredevil Derby 3D, there's a lot to like here. It really is just bare bones micro machines, and if that's your thing, you'll probably like this a lot. Although the game does have a few issues that are worth noting. The AI in this game can be pretty brutal at times. A lot of the races require you to use shortcuts and drive perfectly to win. And the game has some wild bouncy physics when colliding with your opponents, and they really love to crash into you too, so sometimes races can be a complete write off thanks to the AI just deciding that it hates you out of nowhere. The camera angles can also be a little too close up in some areas, so some of these tracks will require a bit of memorization rather than quick reflexes to beat, but that's kind of been the case in previous Micro Machines games too, so I guess that's to be expected. Another big thing is that this game only supports two players, and while I'm sure this game is a blast with two players, Micro Machines V3, which is also on the PlayStation, supports eight players simultaneously. In fact, Daredevil Derby 3D's biggest problem is that there's pretty much no reason to play it over Micro Machines V3, which does every single thing that this game does, but much, much better. More elaborate tracks, more vehicles, more modes, more players, weapons have been added. Codemasters just came in and made the definitive PS1 Micro Machines game a year after this, making Daredevil Derby 3D pretty much obsolete. It's a shame because there's still a lot to like here. It's pretty basic, but at its core, it's a fun racing game on the PS1. It's colorful, the music is good, the characters, uh, okay, forget about them. But if you're into Micro Machines games and you're looking for more of the same, you really can't go wrong with this one. But if it's your first time trying out any of these top-down racers, just go for Micro Machines V3 instead. It does everything this game does, but just way, way better. Except for the underwater music. Daredevil Derby is still the king in that regard. Every single day stress comes in every way and got no time for nobody.
My style is rich, though fat and rich. We'll make a cake today that looks rich. Crack, crack the egg into the bowl. Crack, crack, crack the egg into the bowl. Parappa the Rapper, the great new music video game. We're us a cake that you've never seen before. Once you played it, you can't get it out of your head. The other day, I was called a little turkey. But I'm a chicken, got it? You beef jerky? PlayStation. The wheel will provide. If there was ever a fine example of a unique game on the PlayStation library, this is certainly one of them. Dirt Jockey Heavy Equipment Operator was released in 2003 and was a North American exclusive in the West. This game was originally released in Japan in the year 2000 under the name Kensetsu Kikai Simulator Kenkai Ipai. And can we just take a moment to appreciate the Japanese box art for this game? Now this is how you make a logo. When I first saw that this was a construction game, I was really hoping we were going to get something weird like the construction vehicle fighting game on the PS2, which, yes, is a real thing, and yes, is amazing. Dirt Jockey, on the other hand, is actually more of a straightforward simulation game. If you ever wanted to experience the exciting life of somebody who transports dirt for a living, well, the PS1 has the game for you. So the main goal in this game is to go through the stages of building a structure from start to finish, although this mode is out of reach for the meantime because, well, do you know how to drive a heavy vehicle? Do you think they're gonna let you onto a Japanese building site without the proper credentials? No, of course not, dummy. So that means first, we gotta get ourselves a license. Now the game features a total of five different vehicle types to choose from. We've got diggers, dump trucks, bulldozers, more diggers, and even a crane. Each vehicle has its own individual training course and license test to take, and since this game veers more towards the simulation side of things, these training missions are pretty much mandatory to complete before you can successfully attempt anything else in the game, which is why they made them mandatory, I suppose. Good game design right there. The game of course isn't going to be as fleshed out or in-depth as a PC simulator that has access to an entire keyboard's worth of commands, but the game does make use of pretty much every button on the PlayStation controller to give you a technically complex but surprisingly accessible control scheme for the vehicles. The first vehicle I trained on was the Hydraulic Digger which has two separate control schemes for driving and operating the machine's arm. Since the vehicle uses treads instead of wheels, driving this thing is like driving a tank. In training mode, the game shows you the vehicle's commands alongside the controller layout. It does a pretty good job at guiding you through the beginning parts of the game, and you can even use the analog sticks to control movement, which feels much more natural when driving. These training courses are pretty strict, with the game docking you points for even the slightest error, but even with this somewhat complex control scheme that's aiming to mimic the movement of a real vehicle, I found myself picking it up pretty quick and was actually enjoying trying to navigate around the course. Once you get driving down though, you need to learn how to dig, and this is where the game's difficulty took a big jump, because the amount of control this game gives you over the arm is actually pretty crazy. You've got 8 buttons that control the turning and individual hydraulics on this thing, from the arm's length to the angle of the shovel head. There's a lot going on here. You wouldn't think that the simple act of picking up some dirt and transporting it to a truck would be so tough, but hey, I guess this is why they have license tests for these things. If you've never tried anything like this before, it's something that's going to take a few minutes to click, but once it does click, you're going to feel like the top dog down at the site with the amount of dirt that you can move from one place to another. And I don't know what it is, but this entire process of digging up dirt and moving it somewhere else, it's incredibly satisfying. The game has this really basic terrain deformation that allows you to see the holes you're leaving behind, or when you're filling them up with mortar. It looks really primitive, but it's actually quite impressive for the PlayStation, and it adds just enough realism to the act of just digging stuff up to make this a pretty engaging activity. I know I probably sound pretty weird right now, but I mean, you go dig something up with a heavy vehicle and come back to me. You'll see. So when you learn all the vehicle's functions, you move on to the license test, which is a challenge putting to use all of the techniques you've learned so far. 
And these are very, very tough. One or two little errors and you'll fail and have to try it again. It's a pretty steep learning curve, but once you've done it, you'll be practically a master at the vehicle. The thing is though, the rest of the vehicles are much easier to control than the digger. Most of these things have wheels instead of tracks, so drive like any old vehicle you're used to. The dump truck gameplay is collecting dirt and driving carefully enough not to spill it. The bulldozer, which you think would be fun, actually involves smoothing out the terrain. And I mean, this is a great use of the terrain deformation, but driving around carefully, trying to keep things level, is just really boring compared to the majesty of digging. Once you get all your licenses and move into build mode, it's pretty much more of the same. You get individual challenges for each vehicle. You no longer get any tips or have the commands available on screen, but it's not a problem since you should be comfortable with the vehicles by then. From here on, the gameplay is really just the steps of working on a construction site. Move around large areas, smoothing out the terrain, carry dirt from one area to another in your dump truck and dump it somewhere else, or just do some digging, which to be honest, never gets old. There's even some nice detail with the game showing you the additional processes towards construction, even if you don't get to interact with these parts yourself. From here on out, the gameplay pretty much just involves the same few tasks, steadily increasing in difficulty, although unfortunately, as much as I enjoyed digging, the other vehicle's gameplay just got old really fast for me. I can really appreciate what they're going for with the simulation aspect, and this is pretty much what you would be doing in a real building site, but this here is a very niche title catered to a very specific audience, and even though that audience isn't me, I am very impressed with what they've managed to accomplish here. The game does have some fun additional modes as well though, with mini games that can be played with up to two players. I really like this one where you have to build a bridge using piles of dirt to move over gaps in the terrain, and you can also dig for treasure like lava. There's also a practice mode where you and a friend can set up a big pile of dirt and just go nuts, knock it down, stack it up, whatever you want, it's your dirt, go have fun. I get the feeling this was a pretty low budget production. The terrain deformation, as mentioned, is really cool, but the graphics for the terrain and vehicles just look really rough, and the game can also chug a bit in some of the bigger maps. It doesn't really affect the gameplay, but if you hate that kind of thing, you can expect a lot of it in this game. Obviously, the game also features a stupidly catchy soundtrack as well, because why wouldn't it? Dirt Jockey is a game that I really enjoy some of and really dislike a lot of, but for a game that sets out to simulate some of the more monotonous aspects of construction life, I genuinely think this game does a really good job. It's a very, very niche title, but there's nothing else like it on the PlayStation in the West, and if you think this is something you'd enjoy playing, then there's a very, very good chance that you'll probably like this game a lot. At the very least, I'm glad it exists, and that it let me experience the simple pleasure of digging holes for a living. The wheel will provide. Okay, I think I might have gone a bit too far down the rabbit hole with this one. Phoenix Games, you may or may not be familiar with them, a publisher known for releasing low-budget games towards the end of a console's lifespan. Both them and another publisher called Midas Gold are responsible for some of the worst games you'll see on the console, and sometimes weirdly, some surprisingly good ones too. Phoenix games usually come in one of three flavors. You've got copy and paste activity center games, usually themed after a low budget European ripoff of a Disney movie. You also get the movie on the disc and they're... Uh... <laughs> 
Sometimes though, Phoenix Games would bring over a weird Japanese title. These games themselves are usually older budget releases from Japan, but the odd time you'd actually get some surprisingly good games, only you'd never know because they're given horrible box art and generic name changes for the Western releases. For example, did you know that Midas Gold's release Future Racer is actually an old Japanese PS1 game called Defeat Lightning where you race mechs? Somebody was paid money to try sell this as this. And the third type were very, very low budget games churned out quickly and on the cheap by small developers. I always found these games kind of interesting because they genuinely might be the worst games on the system, but there's so many of them and they cover so many different genres. And our selection for today is one of those games, Hotshot. Now you might be wondering why I even chose this game for the list. Well, in the brief gameplay I seen online, this actually looked kind of fun. It seems like a very, very low budget clone of Wild Guns on the Super Nintendo, and Wild Guns is great, so why not check it out? Interestingly, when you boot up this game, you don't get any information on the developer or anything at all really, it just boots you straight into the main menu where you see the big proud Phoenix Games logo. Although a brief check online reveals the developers to be an Italian studio called Naps Team. Something interesting is that Naps were actually responsible for some pretty good games in the past. There was Gekido on the PS1, which is easily one of the system's best beat em ups. They also made a game for the Amiga called Shadow Fighter. Now, I'm not very familiar with the hardware or its games, but Shadow Fighter seems to be considered one of the best games on the entire system, so good for them. <laughs> But Nap's team took a turn. Not long after Gakito was released, the team pretty much settled into making these low budget Phoenix games for a while. A lot of them. And Hotshot is one of them. And it's really fucking bad. Wild Guns is a great Super Nintendo game. Move around the stage, stop and shoot at the bad guys, get cool weapon power ups, dodge roll out of the way of bullets, visit fun levels, fight cool bosses, an all time classic. Hotshot is that but with literally everything good about it stripped away. You're still running around the stage shooting and rolling but it's like you're trapped in limbo. You soon realize every level is shooting the same 2D enemy sprites over and over again to the same 5 second loop of a music track with two unique sound effects for every enemy that's killed and the guy is dual wielding full size shotguns for some reason. It's level after level of the same goons in the most depressing looking levels you will ever see in your life. Eventually you get to fight a tank and it's impressive that they managed to make fighting a tank while dual wielding Uzis bad somehow. It's genuinely impressive. So it felt like a lifetime pass getting to that point but that was just level 4. This game boasts 20 levels of increasing difficulty so I kept on going. So the game does get harder, but the only thing that changes is that the levels require you to kill more and more enemies each time. So the only change to the gameplay is that the levels just get longer, and eventually they start recycling the same few levels, just with different colour palettes, which somehow look even worse than the first time. You'll fight the tank a few more times as well, nothing changes here by the way, it's just the same exact fight on repeat. And I shit you not, when I got to the end of the game, the last few levels were just the first few levels again, except with this nasty green filter placed over the screen. Three levels and a tank battle, entirely played like this, I was going mad. Well, I beat it, thanks for playing. So that was awful, it took about 40 minutes and I could genuinely feel myself aging rapidly while playing that game, but guess what, it gets worse. Phoenix Games released another PS1 game a year earlier called Shoot. Yes, that is the box art. Shoot was a compilation disc containing 7 games and one of these games is Hotshot under an entirely different name. And not only that, there's also a Wild West reskin of the exact same game on the same disc. I'm going mad. So yeah, don't play Hotshot. It's boring, lifeless and soul sucking, just avoid. We will provide.
Konami, one of the PlayStation's most prolific developers, Metal Gear Solid, Silent Hill, Symphony of the Night, Suikoden, you can't have a conversation about the PlayStation's greatest games without Konami's name coming up. But for every well-known Konami game on the system, there's usually one or two deeper cuts from the developer that have more or less faded into obscurity. For example, here's Konami's Poi Poi 2. This was one of my favourite games growing up and I've never met a single soul who has played this game. And I imagine it's a similar story for a lot of Konami's more niche releases on the system. Hopefully we'll get to cover a few of these on the show sometime, but for now, we've got a game that I'd never even heard of before I started this show, and genuinely, it's games like this that make this whole thing worth doing. Gun Gage is a 1999 release from Konami that came out in both Japan and Europe, but never made its way over to North America. It feels like a strange love child of a few different games. There's aspects of Contra, throwing a bit of sin and punishment, maybe even some burning rangers, and you end up with this. And I love this. Gun Gage is a very Japanese game. It's full of over the top action and explosions, tons of insane guns to use, weird enemies to kill, a nonsensical throwaway story, big shiny collectibles to get, lots of big shiny collectibles, and I think you even kill the devil at the end, which seems standard enough for this kind of game. Although Gun Gage took a bit of a risk with its gameplay, while a lot of these games usually play from a side scrolling top down or fixed camera perspective, Gun Gage is attempting to translate this genre into a game with complete third person control, platforming and full 3D levels to explore. And it actually kinda works. Kinda. Objectively speaking, Gun Gage does not control very well at all. Player movement in this game is very heavy. It often feels more like you're driving a vehicle rather than controlling a person. It took a while to get used to when starting the game, and like most third person shooters of the era, features a lot of slow turning and a lot of strafing. Shooting on the other hand, this game's bread and butter is thankfully very simple. The reticle always defaults to the center of your character and features a very generous lock-on system that automatically snaps to an enemy as soon as you hold down the fire button in their vicinity. You can jump to make it snap to airborne enemies, but you also have the choice of going into a free aim mode if you just want a bit more precision with your shots. It's just such a straightforward and satisfying shooting system, and even though the actual player movement is pretty clunky, shooting stuff is so easy that it gives you the time to actually focus on your character's movement rather than just fumble around with any dodgy aiming controls as well. And once you get a bit of practice, the controls aren't even really that bad. You'll be dodging enemy fire, platforming to get secret items, it's far from the best player movement you'll ever see, but when combined with the fun and simple gunplay, it ends up working really well. This is a really arcadey game at its core, and the game's levels and multiple bosses should only take you about 60 to 90 minutes to get through in your first playthrough, but the game does have quite a bit of replayability with its roster of playable characters. At the beginning you start out with just one character, Wakel Skade, owner of quite possibly the worst name in gaming history. As you beat the game or discover hidden objects within certain levels, you can unlock three additional playable characters, and each character has different normal and special weapons, different move speeds, some even have unique abilities like being able to dash forward, and I mean having both a minigun and the ability to dash kinda makes this character OP, she's the best. Each character plays through the same set of levels but in a different order with a few unique sections sprinkled in here and there throwing a bunch of collectible flowers hidden throughout the game's levels, and even with the game's short length, there's plenty of content here if you're looking for more. On the presentation side, if there's only one major critique I can give this game, the levels themselves can look a bit rough at times. Outside of this really cool high-speed train level, most of the game's levels are pretty bland and boring visually. Outdoor areas are plagued with some less than stellar draw distances, and indoor areas generally look very similar from level to level. On the other hand, the characters and enemy designs all look fantastic. There are a lot of weird enemies you'll come across in this game, from beasts to mechs and everything in between. There's just so much variety. And while I think each of the four playable characters have very strong and appealing designs, the highlight of this game has to be the variety of bosses you get to fight. These bosses get their own cutscenes with dramatic music just as you'd hope, and I mean, look at these things. They deserve it. We've yet to talk about the music, and if you know video games, you can probably deduce that a game that looks like this, and is made by Konami in the 90s, will have a top tier soundtrack. And from the moment you step into the game's first level, this becomes quickly apparent.
If you're familiar with the Castlevania series, this music will sound incredibly familiar to you. Yes, the music for this game was composed by the legendary Michiro Yamane, famous for her work on Konami series including Castlevania, Rocket Knight, and more recently post-Konami efforts like the fantastic Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. The game's soundtrack is peak Yamane. Every single level, every single boss, the music just elevates the whole experience. Is the soundtrack comparable to something like Symphony of the Night? Probably not, but Gun Gage genuinely might have one of the most underappreciated soundtracks on the whole system. I'm dead serious. This thing is great. I'm really glad I got to discover this game. It's definitely got a lot of problems, it's short, it's clunky, it can be a bit ugly at times, but it's very much the kind of game that I love. Dumb, arcadey Japanese games where everything is just exploding all the time, the music is fantastic, you have tons of stuff to shoot and collect, and even the menus are cool. It's very much style over substance, but trust me, sometimes that is not a bad thing at all. Gun Gage certainly isn't a game for everybody, but I know there's a lot of you out there who will really dig this one. Hunt it down if you like the look of it, and for everybody else, at least give the game's soundtrack a spin on YouTube. We've been sleeping on it way too long. will provide <laughs> rehearsal for get out the vote promo take what Boys and girls, it's me, Tiny Tank. Cue the theme song. Tinky, tinky, clinky, clanky, new from Centrax, Tiny Tank, America's lovable. Wait, 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 wait. Is that my theme song? Well, it hasn't been finalized yet. Wanky, wanky, tinky, tinky, what the f is that? Volume Tree's first game is Tiny Tank, released in North America in the year 1999, before making its way to PAL regions early in the year 2000. Interestingly, this game seems to be a co-effort from two different developers, Appaloosa Interactive, who are probably most famous for their work on everybody's favourite Sea Mammal vs Alien Invader series Echo the Dolphin, and another studio called Anne Now, whose only credits are Tiny Tank and a later PS1 title called Mort the Chicken. Yeah, they, uh, they didn't last too long. Tiny Tank is an action platformer starring a tiny yellow tank called Tiny. I remember seeing advertisements for this game in magazines when I was a kid and they were... Uh, well, let's just say I remember them after all of this time for a reason. So the game's plot is actually pretty cool. You, of course, play as the titular Tiny, who is the cute tank mascot for some American defense contractor called Centrex. The business of war isn't doing so hot right now, which means profits are down and public support is even lower. Centrex has a plan to get back on top, though. They've been working on an army of advanced robots, which will be able to replace humans on the battlefield. But how are they going to win over the American government and public? With a cute tank mascot, of course. He sings, he dances, he's got a cute little cannon for a nose. It's perfect. And wouldn't you know it, it worked. Fast forward 100 years into the future, though, and uh, Centrex's robots have now taken over the planet, with the remainder of humanity now living underground. God bless propaganda. 
The machine revolution started with Tiny dying over 100 years ago, but the game starts with Tiny mysteriously being brought back to life, and it's now up to him to defeat the machines and save humanity before their leader, the evil Mutank, drains the planet's atmosphere. So yeah, for an action platformer aimed at kind of a teen audience, this setup is surprisingly cool. There's lots of jabs at the complicity of the media, propaganda, and overall the game just has this very tongue-in-cheek anti-war message that I really dig. It's mostly pretty dumb at times and features a lot of edgy late 90s humour, but for the most part, it actually really hits the mark. That's the most mealy mouth bunch of crap I've ever heard in my life. I can't believe that came out of my mouth. Somebody shoot me. That's right. Express your rage. Let it spew. Let it out. Feel better? Yeah, lots. Not you, Fred. Hi there. Hiya. The game itself is split into 25 different missions. These missions come in a few different shapes and sizes. Some can be full non-linear levels with multiple objectives to complete and a boss fight at the end. Some missions might take place in a much smaller map or even in a single room with a single objective to complete. The missions and objectives themselves are all relatively straightforward, most of the time just involving you searching out and destroying an object, but the game does mix things up with some fun and varied objectives and levels from time to time, so you never really feel like you're doing too much of the same. And while you'd expect a game based around a tank to be almost entirely focused on action, Tiny Tank also features a surprising amount of platforming as well. Tiny can jump, hover, dash, sidestep, barrel roll. I know I give games with tank controls a hard time, but this game's tank controls, they're a-okay. Tiny actually controls quite similarly to the tank sections from Star Fox 64 if you're familiar with them, only instead of being on rails we've got full 3D movement and honestly navigating around feels pretty good. You've got plenty of options for avoiding fire and while some of the platforming sections can feel a little janky and unpolished compared to the rest of the game, overall Tiny Tank is pretty satisfying to play. Combat is also very straightforward, your main weapon is your little turret nose and since there's no aiming or crosshair, Tiny just kind of locks on to enemies directly ahead of him, which works quite well. You also have the choice to rotate the direction of your turret if you want to get enemies to your sides or rear. A cool feature is that Tiny can also pick up additional weapons off downed enemies. Tiny has up to four weapon slots on his body, two on the front and two on the rear, and there is a pretty crazy amount of weapons you can freely equip and swap around on the body. Not long into a level, Tiny usually just ends up as a little ball of death, and I'm here for it. In this menu you might notice a few other options as well. You can collect these green orbs which can be freely slotted into the weapons of your choosing to boost their strength. And these orbs can also be used with one of Tiny's coolest features, these teeny weeny tanks, which Tiny can send out to either hunt enemies, collect items or act as meat shields. Even though the game's combat is quite simple, there's a ton of choice and flexibility here and if you go out of your way to collect as many green orbs as possible, it's really insane how overpowered you can get. One of my favourite things about the game though is its music and dialogue. Tiny gets his communications through a little radio antenna and in game Tiny is constantly tuned into a robot run radio station that not only plays a variety of music covering multiple genres that serve as the game's background music, but most missions also include lengthy voice sections hosted by the game's antagonist Mutank, which are not only really funny but serve to add extra layers to the plot and backstory of what happened 100 years ago. It's really unusual but it's also quite well done. When you're a machine in an organic environment, rust happens, but it doesn't have to happen to you. Now there's rust away. Simply have your fix-it crab rub this gel on the infected areas. You'll have relief not in months or days, but hours. Soon the atmosphere will be a thing of the past. Until then, there's rust away. Just put my name at your replicating unit. Also, Tiny dances to the game's music, which is a really nice touch. Unfortunately, the game's visuals and performance don't hold up all that well. While I'm a big fan of the character and enemy designs, the levels themselves really don't look all that impressive. A lot of the outdoor areas look really bland and do repeat often from mission to mission, unfortunately. The draw distance is also quite bad and you can expect the game to chug quite a bit in some of the bigger hectic levels. It's not really a deal breaker, but it's one area where the game really lags behind compared to other releases from the time. Overall, Tiny Tank is a really fun game. The gameplay is solid, and while it's nothing groundbreaking, it is a fun mixture of action and platforming that fans of either genre should get a kick out of. Where the game really shines, though, is in its humour and storytelling. You can tell the people who made this game were really quite passionate about it. And while attempts at comedy from this era usually fall flat when viewed from a modern context, especially in video games, I think Tiny Tank manages to hold up pretty well on that front. 
It's not exactly the greatest example of the genre on the console, and once again, the visuals and performance can be a bit rough, but it's got enough going for it to make it worth checking out if you like the look of it, or if you like games where cute mascots swear a lot. will provide Next we have Project Horned L, which is a North American exclusive in the West, launching in early 1996, shortly after the Japanese version, which launched in 1995. Project Horned L is one of the PlayStation's many light gun compatible games, and to my knowledge, is actually the first one ever released on the console. Well, it's either this or the Aerosmith shooter. I really hope I never have to play this one. Project Horned L was developed by Alpha Systems in collaboration with anime studio Movic. This means the game has some absolutely fantastic anime cutscenes, all of which were made exclusively for the game. And not only that, we also get characters from famed manga artist Masamune Shiro, creator of Ghost in the Shell. So as far as anime credentials go, this game's packing some serious heat. Since this was developed for the PlayStation, rather than being an arcade port, it has the benefit of having somewhat more plot than the average light gun game. You get to play as either Hiro Mitsumi or Nash Stolar, members of Metro City's Horned L Mechanized Police Unit, as you try to defend the city from a terrorist organization known as Metallica. I take it nobody has informed Lars Ulrich that this game exists. Throughout the game, you'll visit a variety of different locations within Metro City, protecting the innocent and combating a whole load of Metallica enemies, all of which are big robots or mechs, so yeah, we got ourselves a big mecha light gun game. That's pretty cool. Obviously, the preferred way to play this game is using a light gun controller. This game originally supported Konami's Justifier light gun, which launched prior to Namco's G-Con light gun, which most of you would likely be more familiar with. Either way, it's 2020, and I, like many, don't have a CRT lying around to play light gun games on, unfortunately. So, what other options are available? Well, you can of course control the crosshair using the directional pad, which is not ideal, but it is functional. Or, you can use the PS1 mouse to control your crosshair. I've played a ton of light gun games on the PC back in the day using a mouse, and while it's kind of like playing on easy mode in a lot of ways, I always found playing light gun games using this method pretty fun regardless. Plus, it's not often I'll get to play a PS1 game with mouse support on the series, so we might as well take advantage of it today. This game doesn't really have a whole lot of options, you can play solo or with a friend and co-op, and outside of a few difficulty options, the only content here really is the main game itself. Prior to each level we are treated with some anime cutscenes which keep us up to date on the plot on our small cast of characters. As mentioned before, these all look great for the PlayStation with the animation quality looking on par with other Japanese animes from the mid 90s. The game's dialogue is also fully localized for the West, with the voice actors putting out some decent performances, about as good as you'd expect for an anime dub around the time. But that still means it's light years ahead of what you'd expect for early PS1 game voice acting. Don't just shoot everything, there are civilians in the area you know. Once we get into the game, well, it's all on rails from here. Just sit back, relax, and take in the sights and sounds. And also, shoot anything on the screen that doesn't look like a human. So yeah, as far as light gun games go, this one is really rather basic. You've got your default weapon shot, which has a good chunk of ammo, and can be reloaded by shooting off screen. And you've also got a limited grenade shot, which clears most enemies off the screen in a single shot. That's about it, really. Damage is handled by a meter that starts at 100%, and different types of enemy attacks drop it by varying amounts. If you reach 0%, then you're dead, and you have to use one of your limited continues. Although, if you make it to the end of the level, you will start the next with full health, which is quite handy. The environments are rendered fully in 3D, while all of the enemies in-game use 2D sprites. 
I think the enemy sprites look really nice and detailed, even when up close, so I don't mind the choice to keep things a bit more simple in that regard. The backgrounds themselves look nice and clean most of the time, but considering the game takes place in a near future sci-fi setting, the levels do look a bit too bland and normal for my tastes. You've got a city, airport, warehouse, city again. There's definitely some really cool sections that look much better than others, but a lot of this game is just shooting cool enemies in bland environments, and it doesn't really mesh all that well in my opinion. The levels themselves tend to go on a bit longer than your average light gun game. There's only 5 in total, but most will take roughly 10 or so minutes to beat. Each level also ends as expected with a boss fight, and these are all pretty good. Some cool enemy mechs to fight, difficult attack patterns to overcome, definitely a highlight of the game. While the vast majority of each level will be taken up with shooting things, levels also take some time to get in some dialogue and banter between your characters and comms team. It slows down the action a bit and gives you some time to rest between fights, but for a game of this type, I think these sections can pop up a bit too often, and not only that, some of them tend to last quite a while, so you're just kind of watching your character slowly move along rails to the next section. Not only that, sometimes you just happen to move really slowly, even when there's no dialogue, so you're just kind of sitting there waiting for something to happen. It's nothing deal breaking, but it does make the game feel a bit oddly paced at times. The game's soundtrack thankfully is pretty great. The game features level music that mostly sounds like some lad bashed it out on a Yamaha or Casio keyboard, so it's a little primitive, but the compositions are quite strong and suit the anime mecha style. Calling 3, 7, and 4, 5. Getting strong readings on the Metro Highway. Looks like a lot of them. And you've got more coming from downtown, too. Good. Sounds like one-stop shopping. The opening and ending scenes, though, get the best tracks in the game by far, both featuring an inappropriate amount of cheese. Keep a light burning in your heart I'm gonna come back just as sure as I'm standing Truly glorious. So that's pretty much all there is to this game. It's a very competent light gun game that's fun to play, but once you beat its five levels, which should take you little under an hour, there's very little reason to come back to it. The anime cutscenes are great, but they are really short, and the plot, while better than your average light gun game, is still really bare bones and doesn't get enough time to develop. And since there's no additional weapons, no bonus items to shoot, and a lot of repetition with the enemies throughout the game, Project Horned L doesn't really give you any incentive to come back after that first playthrough. Still, as far as light gun games go, you could certainly do a lot worse, plus it's got mouse support, that's fun. AlphaVision, this game's developer, would later go on to make a light gun game on the PS1 called Elemental Gearbolt, which is generally considered one of the console's best, so hopefully we'll get a chance to check that out someday on the show. Until then, Project Horned Owl is definitely the console's best mecha light gun game at least, and for many of you that will be enough to make it worth checking it out alone, so go right ahead, you'll enjoy the sax music at the very least. I'll take care of these guys. No way, Hero. They're too much for you. Stay where you are. They're mine. Hey, Hero, don't worry. I'll handle them. Cut it out. I'm reading an abnormally strong energy field about 50 meters ahead. What's this? Wow, I've never seen a color like this on the radar screen before. What's that? Who's this guy? <laughs> the wheel will provide. You're still alive, Elroy. What a miracle. Let's hope your next mission won't be your last. Our final game today is a pretty interesting one because this unassuming spaceship shooter might just be one of the most obscure Western releases on the console. Invasion is a PAL exclusive released in early 1999. 
is both published and developed by a French studio called Microids, who are mostly known for their work in the adventure game genre, both on the PS1 and elsewhere. But this game here is a first slash third person spaceship shooter, something a little bit out of their comfort zone, and also something the PS1 tends to have quite a lot of in its library. So what makes Invasion such an obscurity? Well, the game happens to have a, uh, let's just say, an unfortunate name. Because when you go to search for Invasion on the PlayStation 1, you'll get results for a much more popular and well-known game called Star Trek Invasion, another space shooter from a series that you may or may not have heard of. But not only that, once you've gone past the Star Trek results, you'll then come across another more popular PS1 game called Invasion from Beyond, another spaceship shooter. So yeah, poor Invasion kinda gets buried by having too basic a name, but it also doesn't really help that nobody seems to care about it either. It's bad enough that it's a PAL exclusive, but there's really very little information about it online. Practically no reviews outside of a page that says it's pretty shit. So look, I don't have the highest hopes for this thing, but given how scarce information and footage is for the game, I feel we might as well play through the whole thing just to give it a fair shake. So what is Invasion? Well, as already mentioned, it's a spaceship shooter. Levels consist of large open maps with multiple objectives on them. Missions generally consist of you destroying structures or enemies, activating switches throughout the map, or defending allies from enemy attacks in the odd escort mission. Nothing out of the ordinary for this genre. The game does have a loose plot driving these missions though. The game takes place sometime in the future, probably 2020, which was a long time away in PS1 time. You'll play as Elroy, who from what I can tell is an ace pilot who's been locked up in a cryo prison for being a maverick, I guess. I don't think it's really explained all that well, but after aliens invade Earth and humanity's numbers begin to steadily drop, they need every pilot they can get. So Elroy is brought out of cryo sleep and put back into service immediately to deal with the alien menace. It's basically the plot to Demolition Man, but replace Sylvester Stallone with this guy and Wesley Snipes with, uh, aliens? The game's plot only really gets fleshed out at the beginning and end of the game. Everything in between is just brief conversations with your commander, which go into very little detail outside of presenting you with the objectives for each mission. At the end of the day, this game's story is paper thin, and it's really only here just to give you an excuse to shoot stuff. Although at least the cutscenes and mission briefings look kinda nice, even if some of the scenes are repeated quite often prior to starting a mission. As for the game, well, the game features one single ship to pilot, which is kinda disappointing, but I do gotta give it to Microids. This thing feels pretty good to fly. You've got the choice of two different view options. First person, which kinda controls like one of those six degrees of freedom shooters, like Descent or Forsaken. It feels a bit odd at first, but it does allow for some really precise control. Or you can opt for third person, where the control is adjusted ever so slightly, but feels much more like your average PS1 flight game. Although, no matter which view you're using, the game's controls are really well laid out and responsive. I never found I had any trouble maneuvering in this game, and it really feels like it hits that nice balance between simulation and arcade style movement. Although while flight is the main component of this game, you can expect yourself to be engaging in combat quite a lot of the time too. Your ship has two types of fire, an infinite auto shot that's upgradable by collecting power-ups around the map, and a limited sub-fire shot that's reserved for your most powerful weapons. And this game gives you quite a lot of options for each, with three different upgradable auto shots and well over 10 different sub-weapons, which run the gamut from missiles to grenades, up to wackier items like health-stealing vampire shots, or even just straight up flamethrowers, which is weird, but appreciated. There's some good variety on offer here, and your ship has access to every single weapon at all times, so while it's disappointing that you can only pilot one ship in-game, the vast variety of weapons do make up for it. The actual combat itself is also pretty good. The game has a generous auto-aim with your cursor, so targeting enemies with any kind of weapon is quite easy. Once again, it strikes this nice balance between arcade and simulation. It's a lot more forgiving than most games of this type I find, but flying and shooting, it's a lot of fun. Your mission objectives will still always be your main focus though. Each level has a number of objectives. Sometimes you have to complete roughly 60% of the missions to exit a level. Sometimes you need to beat 100% of the missions. Although most of the time mission objectives just consist of flying to the highlighted location on your map, destroy the clearly marked targets and then move on to the next section. Until eventually an exit gate spawns, then you just fly there and you finish the mission. Depending on your objectives completed, enemies killed, damage taken, etc, you'll get a grade and a score at the end of each mission. There are 12 missions total with about 4 or 5 unique environments between them. It's a short game taking roughly under 2 hours to beat, but there is enough variety here to keep things interesting from start to finish. The presentation is also pretty good for the most part. 
I like the ship and enemy design, some of the levels look quite nice too, if a little bland and barren at times, but it is a planet under siege, so I understand. Our old friend PS1 Draw Distance does rear its ugly head again though, and it can be pretty bothersome in this game, especially with how objectives and enemies pop in and out of vision, even if you just move a short distance from them. It's to be expected, but it does feel a little bit worse in this game compared to others of a similar style. Performance is also a bit shaky. It's rough enough as it is being a PAL exclusive game, but as soon as the screen starts filling up with enemies, the game's performance can crash down well into the lower digits. It's especially noticeable in the game's final few missions, which are hard enough as it is without dealing with performance hits. At least the game's cutscenes are kinda nice, although they are all over the map quality wise, going between CGI to animation to like, still images of real cities getting hit by lasers and explosions. I kinda love how janky it is. These are all fully voiced too by the way, and the voice acting is once again, not even that bad. It's just a shame that there's so few of them in game, but what's here is appreciated. And look, you know we gotta talk about the soundtrack, when are we ever not gonna talk about the soundtrack? Well guess what, Invasion soundtrack? It's really, really good. For real though, every track in this game is great, there's about 7 or 8 total split between all of the missions, but it's this great 90s electronic soundtrack that sounds like it would fit right at home in a wipeout game. Watch, check out a brief selection in here for yourself. I'm gonna try put this soundtrack up on YouTube sometime if I can, since it's nowhere online from what I can tell. Either way, kudos to these lads, this is some great stuff. So yeah, to my surprise, I enjoyed this game quite a bit. I'm not even gonna pretend like it's anything more than a B tier or even C tier arcade spaceflight game. It's very simple, it's low on content, but overall, yeah, it's pretty good. If you're a fan of this genre and you're looking for a super European alternative to Colony Wars or some other similar PS1 flight games, don't let this one fly under the radar. It might just surprise you too. tell you what bugs me about human endeavour. I've never been the human in question. Have you? Mankind went to the moon. I don't even know where Grimsby is. Forget progress by proxy. Land on your own moon. It's no longer about what they can achieve out there in your behalf, but what we can experience up here in our own time. It's called mental wealth. <laughs> but we will provide. Commander, hold your fire. I've got a better idea. 
Volume 4's first game is KKND Crossfire, developed by Aussie Team Beam Studios and released exclusively in PAL regions in 1998, although the UK and Ireland got it a little bit later, in early 1999. KKND stands for Crush, Kill and Destroy and was originally a series of RTS games released on computers between 1997 and 1998. I never played any of them personally, but the series seems to be considered somewhat of a hidden gem, at least in terms of 90s PC RTS games. The series takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth where a nuclear war has ravaged the planet and the remaining survivors on Earth are split into three distinct factions, each vying for control of the planet's limited resources. Think of it kind of like a more futuristic Mad Max combined with classic Command & Conquer. Now of course this is a series about PS1 games and like many popular PC RTS games of the era, this one somehow found its way over to the PS1. And if it flew under the radar on PC, well you can bet that's doubly true for the PlayStation version. Also to make things a little bit more confusing, KKND Crossfire isn't a port of the original KKND, it's actually a port of KKND 2 Crossfire. I imagine they dropped the 2 since the original never came out on the PS1, but sure look that never stopped Final Fantasy, and they did alright. But also to add to the confusion, this isn't really a direct port of the PC game either. Think of KKND on the PS1 as sort of a stripped down version of the PC game with a few changes. Impressively, the developers managed to include all three factions as well as 15 individual missions for each, all on the one disc. But of course, to fit all of this on the disc, some cuts had to be made. In-game missions feature entirely redesigned maps that are much smaller than their PC counterparts. Plus, each of the three factions have had certain units removed too, reducing the overall size and variety of the factions in this version. Even with these cutdowns though, this still remains a surprisingly full fat RTS game, especially by console standards. Let's take a look at the game's three different factions, starting with your basic human faction, called the Survivors. The only humans left on the planet and of course they're as hungry for violence as ever. There's also the Evolved who are the results of being exposed to a little too much nuclear radiation and living to tell the tale. These guys make up your monster tribal style faction. And lastly the Series 9 who are farming robots who became sentient after humanity nuked the planet and destroyed all Earth's fertile ground. Now they hunt every living thing thanks to humans getting rid of their one and only sole reason for existing. Farming. As you can tell, this is the best faction. Now as mentioned, while the game does include unique missions for each, with the Evolve campaign being considered easy, Survivor normal and Series 9 hard, I did find each of the factions pretty samey to play. Sure they all have their own individual units, but the majority really serve the same basic function, as well as each faction having more or less the exact same overall playstyle. I don't know if this is down to the units being removed for the PS1 version, but honestly most of the time it can feel like you're making a choice between the colours red, blue or yellow. What does set the factions apart though, are the briefings prior to each campaign mission, a genre staple. These can be pretty funny and definitely add a bit of personality to each faction. I wouldn't say they really add to the story much, but they're always a welcome sight upon starting each mission. We've got the usual odds. A small party of our creatures against a larger enemy party. But our creatures are fast, and the enemy are drooling idiots. Repair a rundown camp you'll find in a canyon. Use all you have to lure the enemy into an ambush. Kill him too. Now the game does play like your traditional RTS from the era, including base building, resource management and a whole host of features that allow you to group and micromanage your units. Although the vast majority of campaign missions will limit you in regards to base building, with most featuring no base building at all, instead opting to provide you with a small number of set units to complete your objectives. There is some nice variety here which does get you up to speed with the various units individual strengths and weaknesses, but 99% of the time each mission really just boils down to wiping out every enemy on the map. Now if base building is more your thing, there is a skirmish mode called Chaos Mode which allows you to play in matches with up to 3 factions at the same time across 10 different maps. And it is in this mode that one of the game's single greatest features lies. Split screen multiplayer in an RTS game. Now Herzog's Y on the Mega Drive did this first, but being able to play a proper PC style RTS with a friend on your telly in co-op or versus battles, that's pretty damn cool. So look, I think even with the cutbacks, we've got the bones of a pretty substantial RTS here on the PlayStation, but uh, we've got one big problem though. It's an RTS on the PlayStation. Which means by today's standards, this game's controls render the game almost unplayable. 
Now, I'll be honest, I've always been a person to throw console RTS games a bone. My first experience with RTS games was on the PlayStation. Whether it was classics like Command & Conquer, Warcraft, or Z, my introduction to the genre as a whole was in this format. Hell, I was still playing RTS games on console by the mid-2000s. Battle for Middle Earth 2 and Command & Conquer 3, I only played these games on the Xbox 360. And this was because my family didn't even have a home computer at this point. Of course, many years later, and with much more experience of the RTS genre on PC, well, I've seen the light. Mouse and keyboard is by far the best way to experience these games. Now once again, I'm not against RTS games on console. On the contrary, I think control schemes implemented in RTS games from the 360 era onwards actually play really well. Will you be as good compared to a keyboard and mouse user? No, absolutely not. But using a controller isn't as limiting as you might think, especially nowadays. On the PS1, however, you are very, very limited using a controller. We are bang in the middle of the experimentation stage of console RTS games, and while in the 90s people like me would take any RTS game possible due to the cost of owning a computer versus a PS1, nowadays this is just so difficult to go back and play. Now in fairness, KKND does allow you to perform pretty much any task you need to using the controller, but the whole thing feels so cumbersome and unwieldy. Trying to perform even the most straightforward micro or macro can be so, so difficult. There are shortcuts to view certain units and buildings, but scanning across the map and just having easy access to your units and your general surroundings, well, what's here, it's just not good enough. So for many, the controls will cause this game to be a write-off almost immediately. But this problem is compounded by the fact that this game is also incredibly difficult. Remember earlier when I said the game's campaigns are broken down into easy, normal, and hard? Well, scratch that. All three are hard. Very hard. The game does have a general difficulty option too, but even on easy, I found most of these missions nearly impossible to complete without severe trial and error and almost complete map knowledge. It's almost like the AI difficulty hasn't been tuned to the fact that it's a console game. You're competing with difficult PC-level AI and you're stuck struggling to control multiple units at a time. Throw in the fact that the units in this game have atrocious pathfinding, often needing to be babysat just to make sure they're not getting stuck on level geometry, and well, let's just say you're facing quite the uphill battle. The maps themselves look okay, it's a post-apocalyptic wasteland after all, so the locations can look pretty grim and desolate, with not very much variety overall. I do think they look fine for the time though. The buildings also look pretty nice, but the units are very small and can be very difficult to make out from one another at times, which kind of adds to the factions feeling very similar to play. I have to give props to the music though, as every faction has its own background themes and they match their individual styles very well, and some of these are also really, really good. Look, the bottom line here is that we have a PS1 RTS game, and unless you are really nostalgic for PS1 RTS games and you know what you're getting into, this isn't something I can really recommend for anybody else. I think the core of a good game is here, and look, we have to give mega props for adding split-screen multiplayer. But thanks to the brutal difficulty and unwieldy control scheme, it just makes this a very, very frustrating time, at least for me. But on the flip side, there's a whole PC version with more content and decent controls, so if you like classic RTS games, well then I think this might be one worth checking out if you're curious. As for the PS1 version, well, I'd still recommend going with any of the Command & Conquer games over this one. Sure, that is also hard to go back to, but it just has much better balance for console play, so at least you can ease yourself into it. Either way, at the very least, KKND had some great music and we got to chat with some Australian mutant people, so I'm happy I got to check it out all the same.
that we will provide. Next up we have Attack of the Saucer Man, which was released in the year 1999 and would you believe it, it's another PAL exclusive. This game was developed by the team at Foob Industries. I don't blame you if you've never heard of them before, this seems to be the only game they ever made. Although interestingly this game was published by Psygnosis and was the last game they published as a third party before being purchased by Sony entirely and becoming Studio Liverpool. So if the name didn't give it away, this is a game about aliens. Attack of the Saucer Man is an action platformer, although I'd say it's mostly a third person shooter that also has lots of jumping, exploration, puzzle solving and collect-a-thon elements. In this game you play as Ed the Alien and alongside your compadre Zunk you're both tasked with preventing a race of money hungry aliens known as Nedco from setting up a Ned farm on planet Earth which could end up disrupting the whole balance of power across the galaxy. So in other words humans are kinda caught up in the middle of some galactic politics and as a result Earth is getting invaded by two different alien races at the same time. Now Ed and Zunk are the good guys in this game, as members of the Grim Lloyd Galactic Empire you are technically trying to help Earth out here. But really your main goal is to stop the other aliens, which means humans are more of a nuisance than anything and you will treat them as such. There's a surprising amount of story sequences in this game. It mostly comes off as a lighthearted comedy sci-fi adventure for kids, but the dialogue between Ed and Zung can be pretty funny and the villains are suitably villainy, so I enjoyed it for what it was. Also the dialogue isn't voice, but every character makes funny noises when they talk, which you may or may not get sick of after a few minutes, but I thought they were pretty fun. As for the game itself, well the first thing that caught my eye when playing this was the graphics. Attack of the Saucer Man goes for a blend of 2D and 3D, with the majority of the character sprites and items appearing in 2D, and the environments and bigger elements appearing in 3D. It's an interesting look to say the least, certainly not the first game to try this, but it still looks kind of weird moving around as a sprite in a 3D world. I actually like the character designs quite a bit, there's some good personality on display here, even if the resolution of these guys isn't the best. I do appreciate that they tried something a little different at the very least. Also the humans being zapped into pile of bones is always fun to see. As for the 3D, well the environments look fine, I guess. I'd be lying if I said the 3D stuff here was very good. There's lots of warping and other technical issues as expected, but honestly it does the job just fine. The levels are fine, the bigger 3D enemy models are fine, I didn't really notice anything especially bad. It's just all kinda meh. At least there's plenty of different levels in this game and the environments do change often so variety isn't really too much of an issue. Although I must say, this game is a fiend for the L draw distance. The game more or less gives you a small vision cone in front of the character and everything outside of that limited vision cone is fog. For the outdoor levels, of which this game has many, it's a given I feel, but even the smaller indoor levels, this game is Fog City. Now look, if this is what the devs had to do to get the game running smoothly, that's fair enough, but this is some of the most extreme fog I've ever seen in a PS1 game, and it can be hard not to notice at times. As for the gameplay, well, as mentioned, this is an action platformer, although it controls very much like a PS1 era third person shooter, you know, pre-analog controls. You move forward and back using the d-pad, you turn left and right using the d-pad, you can strafe left and right using the L1 and R1 buttons. Honestly, this is probably the best third person control scheme we had at the time, so I'm not complaining. The game starts out straightforward enough with you crash landing in area 51, which works as a nice little opening section to get you used to the game. You have a blaster which slowly regenerates ammo, although you can still pick up ammo to speed up that process a little. The blaster also features a variety of different shot types which you can collect throughout the game, which all pull from the same ammo pool and turn your blaster into weapons like a shotgun or a... bouncy blaster? You also have this orb that follows you around which serves two functions. One is to fire at your sub weapons from a variety of different explosives to defensive items like shields, and the other is to collect these little creatures called neds who you will find around each level. 
Ned seem like dumb, tiny aliens that the bad aliens are using to ruin the Earth somehow. I'm still not quite sure what they are, but they're cute and make lots of dumb noises, so I kind of love them. Anyway, there's a bunch of these in each level, and you can rescue them by shooting them, which traps them in a bubble, and then the orb will automatically collect these bubbles if you're close enough by. Some levels do require you to collect a certain number of these aliens, and others will not, but they tend to drop lots of health and ammo pickups, so there's pretty much no reason not to try and get as many of these little fellas as you can, regardless of the level's requirements. It didn't take long into the first level before I noticed shooting in this game is kind of weird. You can't really aim in this game. There's no reticles, so your shots just come out right in front of you. But the game also kind of has an auto aim, which points your shots towards nearby enemies. Although I found it was pretty inconsistent and it kind of just did whatever it felt like most of the time. It's definitely manageable, although in sections with multiple enemies, it can be quite a bother. A good example of this is when I could shoot an explosive barrel next to a bunch of enemies, but the shots just kept going towards the enemies instead of the barrel, and unfortunately, I have no control over this. Also, while some enemies do have visible projectiles, a lot of the human enemies in this game have hit scan style weapons where it's hard to know what you're trying to dodge. All you see is the muzzle flash and you kind of just have to hope your strafing is good enough to not get you hit by whatever is coming out of their guns. The levels in Area 51 get you used to pretty much everything this game has to offer. You gotta explore every area, search for items or switches that let you progress forward, and then do a whole bunch of shooting and platforming in between. Once you're out of Area 51 though, the game's levels really begin to open up in scale, with much larger maps and a wacky time travel twist that seems you going through various locations throughout Earth's history, from Victoria era London to exploring Aztec temples. Although while I found the early levels were generally fine, the larger levels became a bit of a chore to get around and this is down to two things, the controls and the difficulty. Now while I said the control scheme earlier was fine for this kind of game, which it absolutely is, the game unfortunately just feels so sluggish to play. All of Ed's movements feel so slow and unresponsive, and while this isn't too big an issue in smaller levels with a limited number of enemies, the larger open levels that feature tons of deadly enemies, most of which can move and turn faster than you, well yeah, it becomes a bit of a problem then. It's not like the game isn't heavy on extra lives and health pickups, but the combat can just feel like a war of attrition, like you're too slow to avoid taking damage most of the time. Combat just never felt satisfying, it just felt like it was in the way more than anything, and as the levels become far bigger and more complex, the enemies get more plentiful, and the platforming becomes more precise and punishing, well I found I was enjoying this game less and less the further I got into it. And if I'm being completely honest, there was nothing in particular that really wowed me about it in the first place. Playing through the early levels, collecting all the Neds, shooting soldiers and exploring all these locations, it was just all very... meh. And while I do appreciate the bigger scale of the later levels in the new environments, the game had already pretty much run out of steam for me, and this was prior to the difficulty and control issues making things worse. Oddly enough, one of the game's bonus levels had the exact opposite problem to the main game, where the controls for this were way, way too sensitive, and it was almost impossible to move in a straight line. Looks pretty funny though. Now even though I wasn't really digging this game, I do still like to play as far as I can into a game just in case something changes my mind, or maybe I need time to get accustomed to certain aspects. You know, sometimes things just take time and patience to really come across. Although, my time playing this game came to an unexpected stop during a certain level. Here you need to find a key to access a boss fight, which upon completion allows you to exit the level. Now I explored this level completely, found the key, and when I eventually got to the door, the key disappeared from my inventory and the door stayed locked. Now I didn't notice this immediately, so I kept searching around the level for another 10 or 20 minutes, which is way longer than I should have, but I thought I was being dumb and just missed something obvious. But nope, after watching a let's play and rewatching my own footage, the game just messed up on my end and well, that's me stuck. And of course, I had not saved the game and would have had to go back and play through the first two hours again, so there you go, that's me done. Although I watched some of the next five hours of gameplay from that point and yeah, bigger levels, more enemies, more fog, it's, it's all more of the same. So yeah, I'm okay, thanks. Look, I think it's safe to say this wasn't one of my favourite games on the series so far, but even though I didn't vibe with the gameplay, I still like the characters and the premise, plus I have a soft spot for that low res 2D style used for the characters. There's definitely some charm here. Also, I haven't mentioned it yet, but the music in this game is fantastic. B-movie alien sound effects mixed in with catchy and whimsical compositions, and it's all incredibly high quality. Even if you aren't a fan of the gameplay, I think the soundtrack is definitely worth a listen.
Attack of the Saucer Man is a very one note experience. There's a lot of it, and if you like what that is, well then there's plenty here to keep you busy. Although, unfortunately for me, I never really found the gameplay stuck out as anything more than an average action platformer at best, and a sluggish, frustrating game at worst. It's hardly the worst action platformer on the PS1 by any means, but unless you really, really like Aliens, there's not much to make it stand out as anything more than a weird little obscurity in the PlayStation's massive library. <laughs> We will provide. Volume 4's last game is Bloodlines, released for the PlayStation in 1999 once again as a PAL exclusive. All hail our 50 Hertz overlords. Interestingly, Bloodlines was developed by a Canadian studio called Radical Entertainment, so it's odd that it never came out in North America. Although while Radical mostly have a history with licensed video games, this is the same studio behind the much loved Jackie Chan Stuntmaster and the even more loved Simpsons Hit and Run, so maybe we're in for a treat with this game. So what is Bloodlines? Well, Bloodlines is kind of a sports fighting platforming hybrid. If you ever imagine how the game tag could become a sport in some sort of dystopian future, well, thanks to Bloodlines, you can wonder no more. So the story here is that in the near future, all distinct cultures and individualities have been banned and outlawed by the government. So punks and rebels of different cultures bound together to preserve their unique identities by creating some sort of tribal combat tournament set across the globe. Look, I don't know how they managed to organise this whole thing with a supposed dystopian government breeding down their back, but fair play to them. You convert that old rig into a parkour playground, ain't nobody gonna stop you. Right, so clearly this isn't a game anchored by its story. Bloodlines is all about gameplay. And what you're looking at here? Well, let me try to break down what's happening. Gameplay takes place across a number of different arenas. Each of these arenas has a number of gates that a player needs to activate to win. The number remaining of these are highlighted on the hood for each player. Sounds simple enough. The catch is that only one player at a time can activate these gates. So at the beginning of each round, you and your opponent both start off as neutral, and the first player to reach one of these gates becomes tagged, so to speak. The player that's tagged can activate the arena gates, and it's up to the opposing player to catch them so they can steal the tag from them, which will then allow them to activate gates. So what you have is a pretty chaotic game where players try to outsmart and platform around their opponents to either activate gates or block their opponent from doing the same, until somebody eventually reaches the round's quota. The idea of this game doesn't take very long to get used to. Matches tend to be quite short, and simply playing a couple of rounds is all you need to make things click. Of course, the game is a little more complicated than just tagging and platforming. While you could just simply out-platform your opponent, players will have plenty more tools at their disposal to help evade or lock down tricky foes. Every player is kitted out with a basic projectile attack that can fire out quick homing shots that slow down players briefly when hit. This can also be charged up to release a stronger shot that can knock down enemies, although your movement does slow while charging to compensate for the shot's strength. Items also randomly spawn at certain points on the map that let you activate powers like speed boost, shield, super jumps, homing hammers, and many other helpful abilities. 
Each of the game's 11 selectable characters also have their own unique power to help add some individuality to the gameplay. These abilities can be activated at any time when it matches as long as your power meter is filled up to at least 2 bars. These powers sometimes mirror the game's items like a super jump or speed boost, but some of them are completely unique, like the flying ability, the magnetic pulse that pulls enemies in if you're not tagged and pushes them away if you are. Some of the powers are also completely broken, like the character that can make you swap positions at will, and also the character that can shoot you with a homing rocket that reverses your controls briefly. Yeah, that one's uh, kind of bullshit. Now, I will say the characters with the OP powers are in fact boss characters. There's a total of four unlockable characters in this game earned through arcade mode, and they all tend to be the best in the game. So thankfully, you won't have to deal with these much until the end of arcade mode, where they will make your life hell for a little bit. Seriously, a rocket that reverses my controls. What the hell, Radical? You know, this here is actually quite a fun and unique competitive title on the PlayStation. The core idea is quite simple, but it's a nice twist on arena combat, but really it all comes down to how good it feels to play. The controls are really smooth and gameplay is quick and fluid. Also keep in mind this is a PAL game, and for a PAL game to feel quick and fluid, that's impressive in itself. Platforming is simple, but it's a lot of fun, and the arenas themselves really set up some interesting platforming challenges that definitely keep you on your toes when you're trying to chase down or block off an enemy. Each of the levels also feature their own unique gimmicks like teleporters or low gravity, so there's enough variety to make each individual arena stand out from one another. I also quite like the visual style of the arenas too, their quasi-future tribal aesthetic actually reminds me a little of some of Unreal Tournament's maps. Lots of modern elements combined with ancient locales, I dig it quite a lot. The various arenas really are the star of the show, they're well designed and graphically quite nice. The characters on the other hand, do not look so hot, and that's putting it nicely. This would normally be a big deal in other competitive character centric games, but the actual game is viewed from such a distance that you'll never really be able to make out the little details on your character anyway. They don't look very good close up, but the important thing is that you can easily make out your character from a distance. So if we have to take a hit visually on the character models to focus on keeping the gameplay smooth and playable from this distance, well then that's a compromise that I'm willing to make. As far as single player content goes, well you can play through the arcade mode across various different difficulties, with expert mode and the additional characters unlocking as you move your way on up. It's fun for what it is, but you can tell this game is really geared more towards multiplayer for its longevity. Of course, you've got the option of your standard 1v1 versus matches, but you can also set up tournaments using the in-game tournament option, and even better, you also have the option of playing with up to 4 players simultaneously, which is about as hectic and crazy as it sounds. I personally prefer the more concentrated chaos of 1v1 games, but I've no doubt if you got 4 people together who knew what they were doing, this would probably be a blast to play. Hell, Sony even used this game to market the PS1 multi-tap, you know, that thing nobody wanted to buy, but we had to buy it for Crash Team Racing. Yeah, we, we've all been there. Of course, Bloodlines isn't without its problems. While the camera view does give you a good overall view of the game arena, it can be quite difficult to judge the depth of certain platforms and objects thanks to the distance. So do expect to have a few platforming mishaps from time to time. Also, as mentioned earlier, the game's balance is a little bit lopsided, with certain characters' powers just eclipsing some of the others available. Also, the fact that you have to fight the two most annoying characters at the end of arcade mode with the difficulty bumped up as well, well, it's a struggle, let me tell you. Also, the single player longevity of this game is pretty low too. There's only so much you can play against the AI before you feel like you've seen it all before. The gameplay is fun, but it's just not as varied or dynamic as something like a fighting game to really keep you hanging around to dunk on the AI all day. Although, when it comes to multiplayer, I could see this being something you'd end up playing for hours. The games are short, they're action-packed, there's great potential to outsmart and outflank your opponents, and it all feels really good to play too. Plus, throw in some 4 players and tournaments for a party, and you're in for a good time with this one. Also, as always, we can't finish up without talking about the game's soundtrack, and thankfully, we got ourselves a doozy here. Bloodlines opts for a blend of tribal and drum and bass tunes, and what we have here is a fine example of peak 90s PS1 music. High energy, high tempo tracks that feature tons of cool little nods to the locales of each arena that they're based on, it's the perfect music to match the speed of the gameplay. Another soundtrack that is absolutely worth checking out if you can.
I know Bloodlines won't be everybody's cup of tea, but I really enjoyed my time with this little competitive arena platformer. It's pretty lacking in single player content, but the core gameplay is still a ton of fun and really goes for something a little bit different. I think this is a no-brainer if you're still playing your PS1 with your friends on the regular and are up for some competitive multiplayer fun, but for everybody else, I still think it might be worth seeking out this cool PAL obscurity, or at least give the soundtrack a spin online. Seriously, it's, it's very good. You are nothing. Easy. Here we go, kids! <laughs> Terrence Turtle is my name! Turtle dancing, that's my game! Come on, kids! Everybody do the turtle dance! Not having a good time? <laughs> Play the Rugrats video game instead, with characters like Tommy, Chucky, even Angelica. Rugrats, search for Reptar. It's a 3D adventure, and it's only on PlayStation. Oh, PlayStation. A wheel will provide. Volume 5's first game is Incredible Crisis, first making its way onto Japanese shelves in 1999 before eventually making its way to the West in the year 2000. Incredible Crisis is the brainchild of Japanese developer Polygon Magic. They made a few games for the PS1 including the psychic survival horror title Galarians and the cool Japan only cel shaded fighting game Slap Happy Rhythm Busters, which yes is really cool and you should try it. Probably the most celebrated of all Polygon Magic's games though is Incredible Crisis, a single player minigame collection that's based around the incredibly strange scenarios that a Japanese family experiences over the course of a single day. It is also full of ska music. So first things first, Incredible Crisis is a very, very Japanese game, and I mean this in the best possible way. It's a celebration of the strange and surreal, and it's the kind of thing that can only possibly exist as a video game. In a lot of ways, I'm surprised it even made its way over to the West, but thanks to Titus the Fox, of all things, it somehow did. So thanks Titus, this is probably the best thing you've ever done for video games. Doesn't make up for Superman 64 and Robocop, but it helps. So, as mentioned before, Incredible Crisis is a single-player minigame collection. The game starts in the living room of a Japanese family early in the morning. The grandmother of the house declares it's her birthday, but of course every single member of the family has forgotten, and she requests that everybody better be home early today to celebrate her special birthday. What follows from here is a single day view through the eyes of each of the other four family members, the father, the mother, the son, and the Holy Ghost. I mean, the daughter. Sorry, force of habit. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that some insane things happen throughout the course of this day. You've got dancing, shopping, alien invasions, throwing water out of a boat with a bucket, a giant teddy bear, an armed gang, giant bugs. There is quite literally no way of knowing where this game is going to go next, and really that's the fun of it. You'll play as the four family members one by one, each experiencing the day from their own point of view. So in the beginning you'll start as the father who begins his day at work, and then soon after working out to some company mandated morning exercise, a ball crashes through the wall and proceeds to chase you around the office. And once you've outrun that and made it into the elevator, you've now got to stop the elevator from dropping you very quickly to your death. And of course from there, due to some more misfortune, you're now carefully trying to make your way back into the building, using a flagpole that seems to be having a hard time, uh, being attached to it. This is basically the flow of Incredible Crisis. You watch as your character goes from one insane situation to the next, in a series of fun CGI cutscenes, and every now and then you'll play a minigame in between, so they don't die and you can keep moving forward. The minigames themselves are quite simple. You'll see a lot of familiar game types making appearances, like rhythm games, brain games, memory games, slide games, turret sections. If I'm being honest, the actual selection of minigames on offer really aren't all that exciting or groundbreaking, at least from a gameplay perspective but it's the way that they're presented with such charm and personality. This is how the game wins you over. 
There are times in Incredible Crisis where I am having a lot of fun. There are also times where I am perplexed and even times where I am pretty frustrated. But there was never a point where I was bored playing this game. You always want to see what's going to happen next and how the different characters' days cross over and affect one another. It just never stops getting weirder and weirder. Just a tiny bit down there. Look, I said it was weird. The game itself is broken up into individual chapters, usually three for each of the four characters, and during these chapters you'll play usually two or three minigames. At the end of each chapter, you'll also be rewarded a rank for your performance in the minigames, and depending on how well you do, you might be rewarded a few extra lives in the process. If you fail a minigame in Incredible Crisis, which you likely will a few times, you'll lose a life, and if you lose all of your lives, it's game over. Thankfully, the game does let you save in between every chapter, so as long as you have a memory card, you'll never be at risk of losing too much progress. But having a few extra lives to hand really does come in handy for some of the game's trickier minigames. There are around 24 minigames total in Incredible Crisis, and while there are plenty of unique minigames, towards the end of the game, you will begin to see a little repetition in the game types. In particular, this Titanic minigame where you have to throw water out of a boat using a bucket, you gotta play this one game three times throughout the entire game, and the game is fully aware of how much you do not want to see this game again. Some of the games are also pretty tricky too. Don't be surprised if you drop a few lives in the process while learning some of these things, and I hope you're proficient at button bashing because some of these minigames will really put your abilities to the test. The last minigame in particular, where you have to ride a bike while avoiding cannons and a wrecking ball, requires some crazy dexterity. You need to alternate tapping the X and triangle buttons while avoiding obstacles, and while this may sound easy, I could barely go 30 seconds without my hands cramping up, and I genuinely thought I was never going to make it past this section until I learned to quickly swap between my fingers and thumb every 10 or so seconds to give each of them a break. It was pretty crazy, but hey, we did it. Overall, I'd say the minigames are fun, but really, it's the characters and the situations that will keep you sticking around to the end in this one. It certainly helps that the game itself looks great too. The character models are detailed and expressive, the animation work is top-notch, and the environments are also clean and colourful, and all the minigames run at a nice stable 30 frames per second. As for the CGI, well, it all looks great too, probably some of the nicest I've seen on the PS1, and it makes a lot of sense considering how integral it is to the game. On the visual front, there's really very little to fault here, it's excellent all round. And of course, we can't finish up without talking about the game's music, because not only is Incredible Crisis weird enough as it is, the game is also kind of a love letter to Ska. The game's entire soundtrack is composed by probably Japan's most influential and legendary ska group, the Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra. And look, ska to me is just the most joyful music. You know the legendary description of ska? It's the music that plays in a 13 year old's head when they get extra mozzarella sticks? That's it. That's the feeling of pure joy. The menu music, the mini games, the sound effects, everything here is ska infused. And if you love a bit of two-tone in your video games, you are going to have an amazing time with this one. And if you hate Ska, well, I'm sorry, you might be clinically considered dead inside, but don't worry, the Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra make sure to mix up the genres a little bit here and there, so there is a nice bit of variety to the soundtrack, all infused with that little bit of extra kick that only a multi-person Ska band can offer. Overall, I found Incredible Crisis to be a wonderful experience. How wonderful a game it may be, well, that's another story. The minigames are fun, but they really lack any replayability. A short while later, WarioWare would come out and really show you how to make a fun single player minigame collection. And while this game has its moments for people who like playing short minigames, well, WarioWare, this is not. And in terms of longevity, well, Incredible Crisis is short very short. The whole thing will take you only a little over an hour to complete, and even though you can go back and play any mini games you've unlocked, it really does feel like a one and done kind of experience. But in spite of that, I still think this is a game every PlayStation owner should play through at least once. It is one of the craziest games on the console, there is very little else out there like it, and at the end of the day, it's just a game designed to make you feel good, and that it will. Nowadays it rarely goes for any more than 20 quid, at least in PAL regions anyway, and for that price I think it is worth taking the leap. Far from a perfect game, but Incredible Crisis is one that no PlayStation fan should miss out on.
that we will provide. Up next we have Blast Radius, first released in PAL regions in the summer of 1998 before making its way over to North America in early 1999. Blast Radius was both published and developed by Psygnosis, you know that studio responsible for I don't know like 50% of the PS1's games? Don't quote me on that number but I think it's close enough. Well with Blast Radius we have ourselves a space combat sim and it's pretty much impossible to talk about this game without first bringing up another series called Colony Wars. The Colony Wars series of games were also created by Psygnosis and to this day are probably still considered the best space combat sims on the console. There's three in total but my favourite is still the first game in the series, the 1997 original Colony Wars. This two disc epic features engaging combat scenarios with varied objectives, an interesting story with high quality cutscenes, a fantastic soundtrack and some of the best graphics seen on the PS1 at the time. It also has this great branching path system where failing a mission won't always end your game but will instead send you on a completely different story path, making your performance in each mission feel like it mattered. It was really cool. A sequel to Colony Wars soon followed up in late 1998 called Colony Wars Vengeance but a few months before that, well in Europe anyway, Psygnosis also released a game called Blast Radius, which to the untrained eye looks very much like Colony Wars. And I mean, you see Psygnosis, you see space, and you see the words Colony Wars on the game's box, well your mind's gonna wander to Colony Wars. Now while Blast Radius was published and developed by Psygnosis, this game is actually the debut release of a new studio within Psygnosis, Studio Camden. These guys would later go on to develop Kingsley's Adventure and also a game called Team Buddies which I always remember because anytime I see it pop up on eBay it's always going for an insanely high price. So I guess it's probably very good. So while we do have a new development team at the helm, this game is as far as I know built on the same engine used for Colony Wars. So if you're familiar with any of those games, you'll feel right at home here within a few seconds. So what actually sets Blast Radius apart from a Colony Wars game other than the name? Well Blast Radius aims to offer up a more arcade style take on the Colony Wars games. The story driven high stakes battles of the Colony Wars series have been distilled down to their purest form, shooting lasers at bad guys for points so you can reach the high score in space. Also there's lots of techno now. Blast Radius pretty much drops all the story stuff in favour of offering a quicker, more to the point space combat game. Here the game's 40 missions are broken up into individual chapters with 4 missions each. The only story you will see here are the short mission briefings before you enter into a level, but these really serve as nothing more than a quick intro to your objectives for the next mission and are honestly just skippable. The missions themselves are still objective based similar to Colony Wars, sometimes you'll need to protect some allies from damage, sometimes you'll need to destroy an enemy structure, but most of the time the missions usually require you to just kill a select few enemy ships, all while blowing up as many fodder enemies as you can to rack up big points as well. These points aren't just for show either, because as you progress through the various chapters you can use these points to cash in and buy upgrades for your ship as well, buffing your shields and lasers or maybe even just cash in and get that homing launcher. Go on, you deserve it. As for the ships themselves, well at the beginning you have the choice of 4 ships, each with their own unique stats. When you pick a ship you are pretty much locked into using that ship for a little while at least, you can't swap or change in between missions so do make sure that you pick one that you like. Something cool though is that when you reach chapter 5 in a particular ship that will then get replaced with an upgraded version which you will then use to play the remaining chapters of the game with. This happens for all 4 of the ships by the way so there's some definite replayability here if you want to unlock all of these different ships, but do be warned you will be playing some of the exact same missions over and over again a few times and when your ship does upgrade it also loses some of the new weapons and items that you bought for it as well. So chapter 5 in particular when you just get your ship can be pretty brutal while you're just working your way back up to full power. 
The ships themselves all control wonderfully. I'd say the gameplay on the whole is a little faster and looser than Colony Wars. You've less movement options overall, but the enemy AI in this game seems to be a little bit more basic to match the arcade style here. So you'll rarely find you'll need to do any hectic maneuvers and dogfights to secure kills. Usually just following behind them is all you need. The game features two third person views and a first person view, although the game is unfortunately lacking a cockpit view which is my preferred viewpoint from the Colony Wars games, but the first person and third person options on offer here, they both work very well all the same. Really when it comes to the actual combat itself, there is very little to fault here. If you like space combat and big open arenas with lasers flying everywhere, well here it's as good as it's ever been. Although it is very difficult for me to shake the feeling that Blast Radius isn't just Colony Wars light so to speak. It's still a fun and challenging game with great combat, but comparatively the number of weapons on offer, the objective types, the visual variety, it all just feels a little bit lacking compared to Colony Wars. There's definitely joy to the simplicity of Blast Radius, but I think the grander scale and higher stakes of the Colony Wars games really give them that extra edge and help elevate them to the top of the pile when it comes to this genre on the PS1. After some longer play sessions with Blast Radius, you really begin to see the variety of missions become a bit stale. That being said, it is probably a better pick up and play game because of this, suiting shorter play sessions. Although this is where the difficulty comes into play, because in the middle of a chapter, if you fail a mission, you can get a game over, and the game only lets you save at select missions. So you sometimes need to defeat multiple difficult missions in a row before you even get a chance to save. And this is a game where flying a little too close to an exploding enemy can pretty much one shot your ship. So even if this game is a little bit more forgiving in some aspects, it is still one hell of a challenge and you might see yourself getting stuck for a while at some very frustrating sections. Visually the game maintains all the good qualities of the Colony Wars series, with detailed models and great looking backgrounds, the particle and lighting effects are as cool as ever, and I've always especially been a fan of the star shooting by you to help bolster that sense of speed. I did feel there wasn't as much visual variety to the combat arenas in Blast Radius, but really it's just a minor nitpick. The UI is nice too, it can be confusing at first with the four bars just above the center representing things like fuel and speed, but once you know what everything is, it gives you all the info you need to know without cluttering up too much of the screen. The map and on-screen targeting arrows are also really good at helping you find any enemies within the mission. Performance is pretty good too, it mostly hits a rock solid 30 frames with only a few small dips here and there. I do also love this shiny orb thing in the main menu that runs at a slick 60 frames per second. I'm not gonna lie, this still looks pretty impressive to me. The music and sound is a big highlight here, though that is to be expected from a Psygnosis game. The weapon and ship sound effects are great, and the music offers up a nice selection of electronic and guitar driven tracks, which are very much at odds with Colony Wars more cinematic orchestral offerings, but it absolutely suits Blast Radius more fast paced gameplay, and it really helps give it an identity all of its own. At the end of the day, Blast Radius is yet another great Psygnosis space combat game. I hate having to compare it to Colony Wars so often, but they are really so closely linked it's almost impossible not to. I don't think Blast Radius really matches the depth of the Colony Wars games, but it doesn't really have to. Blast Radius stands on its own as a great arcade style space combat game and probably serves as a better introduction to the genre on the PlayStation than the Colony Wars games thanks to the somewhat more simplified gameplay. I think when you boil it down to the overall quality of the missions, Blast Radius does unfortunately come out a little below in that regard. But it's still a fun, fast and frantic game with stellar visuals and a great soundtrack. If you're a fan of the Colony Wars series and Blast Radius flew under your radar, well then this one is a must try and if you've always wanted to dip your toes into the space combat genre on the PS1, well there are a few better games to start with than this one. will provide
last game this episode is Burst Trick Wakeboarding, which first released in Japan in the year 2000, before eventually making its way to the West in early 2001. As the name would imply, Burst Trick Wakeboarding is a wakeboarding game. Can't say I've played too many of these in my lifetime, and by many I mean exactly zero. But there is quite the handful of wakeboarding games out there, so there is a lot of choice for fans of the sports when it comes to video games. On the other hand, Burst Trick is the PS1's only wakeboarding game. So it's carrying the hopes of the whole fandom on its shoulders here. The game was developed by Metro Corporation, who have a pretty interesting catalogue of games under their name. The most famous of which is probably the much loved Buster Groove series on the PS1. They also developed Britney's Dance Beat, which I now suddenly have a strong urge to play after learning this info. So, given the developer's history, you might expect something unorthodox when it comes to their take on a wakeboarding game, of all things, and you'd be right. Burst Trick isn't really a sports simulator, it's actually more of a straight up arcade title, harkening back to something you might have seen from the likes of Sega in the early 90s. And while that might be disappointing the fans looking for a more true to life representation of wakeboarding, for somebody like myself who's a big fan of old school arcade games with bright colours and simple gameplay, well I gotta say my expectations for this game changed quite rapidly upon starting it up. So Burst Trick itself is split into two different game modes called Obstacle and Trick. These modes each offer a unique gameplay experience, but with that being said, I'm just gonna get it out of the way now. Trick mode sucks. This trash. The vast majority of the gameplay in this mode is based around moving from side to side and then entering a series of button inputs and then timing a final button press, and that's the whole thing. There are three total stages in this game mode and they are all the exact same and just not that fun at all. I played through it once, it took about 10 minutes, and I am very very happy not to play through it again. So that just leaves us with obstacle mode, which is thankfully where the real meat of the game lies. In this mode your goal is to earn a target quota of points across 3 laps of a course. The way you earn points in this game is quite simple. You can collect rings that are placed across the track, or you can hit ramps that allow you to perform different tricks for points. Of course while doing this you will also have to navigate around the track's various obstacles and hazards, so you don't bail into the ocean. Actually, hitting a hazard has no penalty, but it does slow you down, which is a big no-no when you're also dealing with a clock that's counting down in the background. And if the clock reaches zero, then you'll have to use one of your limited BT tokens to retry the stage. Run out of these tokens though, and you'll have to start over from the very first track. You can usually hit a few hazards per lap without it causing you too much trouble, but finishing a stage with some extra time on the clock also helps add to your total score, so it's worth trying to be that little bit extra careful on the track, which I rarely was. Thankfully the game's controls are decent enough, it is a very simple game to pick up and play. You use the d-pad to move left and right and you tap the x button to jump. You can also increase the acceleration of the boat that's pulling you along by pressing the l1 button. And honestly that's about all there is to it. The tricks that you pull off during the obstacle mode are actually all automatic. Whenever you go over one of the many ramps littered about each course you will pull off a trick and net some points. Which trick you perform and how many points you earn however are actually defined by the type of ramp that you hit. Hit a big green ramp for a low scoring trick, hit a medium blue ramp for an average scoring trick, and hit a small red ramp for a high scoring trick. The only skill involved in this is actually just hitting the ramp itself. Once you make it over, you get a little cinematic animation, and the points are yours. So yeah, when I said this was a pretty simple arcade game, I really wasn't messing. It is more or less a wakeboard auto-scroller. Move through the six levels, pull off some cool tricks, dodge some obstacles, hit B to light speed dash and collect all the rings and get the highest score you can. It's simple and it's rather shallow, but I would be lying if I said I didn't find it fun. Now, regardless of whether I found the gameplay fun or not, we gotta talk about a big issue that I'm sure you might have noticed by now. This game's performance is not good. Arcade titles are known for their buttery smooth gameplay, now of course not every home port of an arcade title features stellar performance, but when you've got a game with beautiful visuals and a great sense of speed, a decent frame rate is gonna do you wonders. Burst Trick Wakeboarding is a game that really could have benefited from having at minimum a nice stable 30 frames per second. If this game could have possibly hit 60 frames per second, then we'd really be hitting its full potential. But what we got is a widely inconsistent frame rate, fluctuating somewhere between 15 and 20 frames per second. And it just makes the game look and feel so choppy to play. It doesn't completely ruin the gameplay, but it is at the level where I would call it distractingly bad. And it also kind of hurts the visuals on offer too, which if I'm being honest, I actually quite like. 
I don't think they're up to the standards of some other PS1 games released in the 2000s, but these are honestly some of the most colourful graphics I've seen on the PS1, and I think they are a great match for the game's arcade style. It honestly looks like something Sega could have put out in the mid-90s. There are not that many tracks in the game, but only 6 in obstacle mode and 3 in trick mode, but what's here is nice, and there is enough visual differences between them all to make them all stand out from one another. Although they might have overdone it a little bit on the lighting in this game. While it is bright and colourful, it is also oftentimes a little too bright. The game really tends to overdo it on the sun glare and it can be more than a little distracting when it's at its very worst. As for the characters, well you've got 5 characters unlocked from the start with one additional secret character to unlock. Don't ask me how you do this though because I have tried and failed and nowhere on the internet seems to have the answer. So there you go, that's a mystery one of you can solve. So the characters that we do have here, they don't really play any differently from one another. You pick a character, select from a variety of different boards, and then once you're in-game, there's really no major difference outside of your stance and the automatic tricks that they pull off. So character choice is really just personal preference at the end of the day, but I do suppose the character models look nice at least, so there you go, that's something. Of course, we can't finish up without talking about the game's sound, and while the announcer voices and sound effects are suitably fun and arcadey, the game's music is really one of its biggest highlights. There were times while playing this game that I really thought this could have been music from a Jet Set Radio game. And if you know Jet Set Radio, you know that that is the highest praise one can bestow a game soundtrack. Although given the developer's rhythm game pedigree, I suppose the excellent soundtrack isn't too surprising. But regardless, if you like high tempo electronic music from Japan, this game's soundtrack is definitely worth checking out. Look, first trick wakeboarding, it's got a lot of problems from the visual and performance issues to the boring trick mode and overly simple gameplay, but honestly for what it is, I had a good time with it. Sometimes all a game needs to be is a quick 30-40 minutes of arcade fun, and if you can put up with the game's frame rate, I think you will definitely find that here. It's a shame that this game was made ground up for the PlayStation, because if this actually had an arcade version that ran at 60 frames per second, well it really could have been something cool. They really just should have made this for the Dreamcast instead. Imagine. So yeah, that's uh, Burst Trick Wakeboarding. Not a great game, but kind of a guilty pleasure. If you can pick it up cheap, why not give it a try? It is the only wakeboarding game on the PS1 anyway, so it's not like you can do much worse. I made a mistake. Our first game for Volume 6 is One, first released in November 1997 and developed by the team at Visual Concepts Entertainment. As far as publishers go, well, depending on where you are in the world, your results may vary. Although it is interesting seeing Capcom take over and give this game the cool box art treatment in Japan. 
One is the recipient of probably the most unlucky game title on the PlayStation, because as you can imagine, being a game called One on the PlayStation One, well, that's not going to do you many favors when it comes to search algorithms. Seriously, just try search for this game on eBay and see how long it takes for you to find. So, unfortunate name aside, what is One all about? Well, the setup here is simple. You wake up in an apartment with no memory and find that a gun has been grafted onto your body. Before you even get a chance to take in what's happening though, helicopters are firing missiles through your window. And from there, you're straight into the game, outrunning that very same helicopter. I really love the minimalist approach here. This is not a story heavy game by any means, but the simple setup here keeps both you and the character in the dark in regards what's going on. And before you even have a chance to process anything or ask any questions, you're pretty much just running for your life. Once you get past the cool opening, one is actually a very by the books run and gun, maybe one of the purest examples of the genre I've seen on the console from a gameplay perspective. If you played Contra Legacy of War in 1996 and were disappointed by how bad they ruined one of your childhood favourites, well don't worry, one is here to show you how to do the genre justice in 3D. Well, for the most part. One has a lot of arcadey elements, but it also opts to try do things with a little more cinematic flair. For one, the game features a dynamic camera system which tries to strike a balance of showing you as much action on screen as possible while also giving the player a good angle to play the game well. It's, uh, it's inconsistent to say the least, but when it works well, it is done very well. The game control itself is decent enough too. Movement is what you'd come to expect with the standard options like strafing and dodge rolls. You can fire your weapon while moving or you can also plant yourself on the spot if you need a bit more precision in your aiming. You thankfully also have some access to melee attacks for close range, which definitely come in very handy in this game. And finally, rounding out your abilities, you have a jump and double jump for platforming. Don't worry, we'll get to the platforming. As far as item pickups go, you've got two options. So weapons which are very strong but don't pop up too often, which is a shame because setting people on fire never gets old. And there's also one-ups, which are very, very useful. You get one of these for every 100 enemies that you kill, but really you can never have enough of them in this game, so make sure to grab them whenever you see them. Other than that, there is nothing else. No weapon power-ups, bombs, not even health pickups, which may seem a little odd. But thankfully that's not a problem, as this game cleverly ties your health and weapon strength into a feature exclusive to this game, which is called being the angriest fucker alive. So as you can imagine, our main character here, not the happiest guy, woke up with a gun on his arm, now the whole world seems to be trying to kill him. Well he's pretty mad about it, and this here directly ties into the game's main component, rage. Rage represents your health and your firepower. If you get hit by enemy attacks, your rage goes down and your weapon power decreases. Run out of rage and you lose a life. On the other hand, if you kill enemies, your rage increases. If you blow up environmental objects, your rage increases. If your rage increases, you get more powerful. The more powerful you are, the more you kill. The more you kill, the higher your rage goes. I'm a really big fan of this feature because this is a running gun that rewards you for running and gunning. Never stop moving, never stop shooting, blow up everything you can, and you'll just keep getting stronger. This game is quite literally about a man who is so angry, he can't die. And I love that for him. There's four levels to rage, green, yellow, red, and white. This little pulsing icon represents your rage, so it's easy to keep track of. Each level increases your rate of fire, but it also buffs your melee attack. You can also gain some new abilities too, like a charge melee attack at red, and a screen clearing bomb when you're white hot. Although be aware that using the bomb bumps you back down to red, and I'm not gonna lie, I had a hard time getting rid of the white gun cause it fires at an almost comical rate. Rage also ties into your ranking at the end of each level. Your ranking is calculated based on the number of enemies and objects you destroy, and to get the true ending, you will need to get max rank in all six levels. So long story short, in this game, violence is always the answer. Now you may think that having a system where killing enemies grants you health and strength might make it a bit easy, and believe me, this is far from the truth. I found that not getting shot in this game is almost impossible at some parts. Whether I run, jump, strafe, or dive, enemies could always shoot me no problem. Now the damage does balance out by killing people, but it's not exactly nice to just take damage that feels beyond your control. The dynamic camera angles can also make this a little bit tricky as you can get shot off screen, and the game just has so many enemies, it's almost impossible to deal with all of them at once. It is annoying, but even then, I only think I died once or twice due to regular enemies in this game. The game's real difficulty comes from something you wouldn't expect in a run and gun. Platforming. One's platforming, to put it lightly, is not great. It is certainly functional, but it's not great. 
It's partly due to the camera, it's partly due to the weird double jump physics, and it's partly due to me being kinda bad. But platforming is your real enemy in this game, because falling to your death is an instant lost life. And remember when I said earlier you should collect as many lives as you can? Well that's for the platforming. You'll realise this in the second level, which is probably the game's biggest difficulty spike. Tons of tricky platforming, enemies shooting at you from everywhere, the ground just falling from below you. I would probably say that level 2 is the game's hardest level. Now there is tricky platforming after this, including a level dedicated almost entirely to platforming, which I do not want to talk about, but at least by then you'll be proficient at it. This level is the roadblock, if you can beat this you can beat the game, but having a difficulty spike like this so early really throws off the game's flow and runs the risk of turning off those who are easily frustrated. The game has boss battles too, which are fine. Most actually require you to use the environment to damage them which is pretty interesting, but for every good one there is one that is either painfully simple or just plain boring to fight. Enjoyable overall, but I would say they're far from the game's highlight. I suppose outside of the platforming, the game's biggest issue is the performance. Now, considering this came out towards the tail end of 1997, one is a very nice looking game. I really like the visual style, there is a ton of flashy effects, dense environments, loads of enemies on screen, and a ridiculous amount of explosions. But all of this comes at a cost, as the game's frame rate fluctuates wildly throughout the experience. At its best, it's a relatively stable 30 frames, and at its worst, it can barely push above 10 frames. I can appreciate that they just went overboard with the effects to really create a true over-the-top action game, but the engine really does struggle rather often because of it. On the other hand, I think the sound design in this game is excellent. All the weapons and explosions sound punchy, the music is cinematic and gives the game a big budget feel, and something that I really like is the way that you can hear the enemies communicating over radio while they try to hunt you down. It's just a nice little touch that really adds to the game's overall atmosphere. Overall, one isn't just a game with an unlucky name, it's also a pretty good one, although it does have some issues that hold it back from greatness. The dynamic camera is cool, but oftentimes can cause you a lot of hassle, the early difficulty spikes and frequent frustrating platforming sections will absolutely turn a few people off, and the game's performance, well, it certainly leaves a little something to be desired, plus it's single player only, so there's no running and gunning with a pal. But assuming you can live with all that, one is probably one of the most action-packed games on the console. It's got a great sense of style, a simple but intriguing plotline, and frankly, a ridiculous amount of explosions. Never has being so angry felt so good. It's quite short with its six levels taking roughly under an hour to beat, but if you want to go for that true ending, you'll probably be playing through it a few times anyway. This game's closest comparison on the platform is the 99 release Apocalypse, which if I had to choose I would still say is on the whole the superior game, but if you're a fan of that game or are just craving a good 3D run and gun, well this is one of your best options on the console, assuming you can find it on eBay first. Seriously, good luck with that. will provide Next up we have Burning Road making its way to the PlayStation in late 1996 courtesy of French developer Toka. No relation to the Toka games by the way, just in case you were wondering. Burning Road is an arcade racer, one that takes heavy inspiration from some of Sega's classic racers, most notably Sega Rally and Daytona USA. During the PlayStation's early years, your best choice when it came to arcade racing games on the console was really just Ridge Racer, or Ridge Racer Revolution. 
Over on the Saturn, games like Daytona USA and Sega Rally were system sellers, and at least over here in Europe anyway, racing games were consistently some of the biggest hits in the chart, a trend that continues even to this day. Games like Wipeout, Destruction Derby, and of course Ridge Racer proved that the genre had legs on the PS1. So it's not a surprise to see a game like Burning Road show up, one that tries to fill the void for PlayStation owners, craving something a little more, well, Sega in style. Being a relatively early release on the console, the game is rather light on content as you would expect. The game features four different vehicles, two cars, a drag car, and a monster truck. There's three tracks, well, six if you count racing them backwards as an additional track. And yeah, that's, that's your game. You can use the practice mode to try out any of the selectable tracks one at a time, or you can play the championship mode and try beating all six of them in a row across various difficulties. There is multiplayer, albeit only via system link. I'm sure playing the game this way is probably very cool, but I can imagine very few human beings out there have ever had the chance to try it. We're waiting for new challenges to come. The game itself though, I gotta say, is quite impressive for the era, at least on the visual front. Burning Road really does capture the look and feel of the arcade racers of the time and successfully transitions the experience over to the PlayStation. Environments and cars are bright and colourful and even though the game only runs at 30 frames per second, the performance is absolutely rock solid throughout. And look, even though we aren't talking pure 60 frames per second Daytona arcade goodness, the sense of speed in this game is excellent. When you go fast in Burning Road, it feels like you are going fast, environments fly by you, cars shoot in and out of you, and the performance is just flawless throughout the entire thing. You really get an appreciation for it during the game's replays, which, manic camera cuts aside, also look really impressive. On the flip side, you might notice that a penalty of going so damn fast is that the track itself can barely keep up with you, resulting in a whole lot of popping. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, this game is full of pop-in. I get why, if you want the game to run like this, there's gotta be some compromises. It is far from ideal, but I will say it was never bad enough to actually hinder my performance in a race. It's just one of those things that you're gonna have to learn to live with. Of the three track styles available, I think all of them are generally pretty good. The beginner track is, as always, the most traditional, taking place mostly on the road with some nice green hills and some rocky mountains in the distance. The intermediate track is the one I actually found the hardest. It does a cool environmental switch halfway through, going from a dry, dusty canyon into a snowy mountain range. It has a lot of difficult turns though, so you will need to be on point throughout this track. The expert track takes place in a city and is also the longest track in the game. This one is considered difficult just due to its length and the fact that it is raining at night, I guess, but it is nowhere near as tough as the intermediate track. It's probably my favorite track in the game, actually. Although, to be fair, I have a bias for cities at night, so maybe don't trust me. So when it comes to burning roads, so far, so good. But now let's talk about the game's control. And when I first started this game, I hated the way this game controls. It wasn't so much the general moment to moment driving, this actually felt quite good. It's just the way you take turns in this game. I could just never gel with it. Your car enters into a drift when you take corners at speed, and without fail, I would always go off the tracker into a wall. Now, I've played a lot of arcade racing games in my time, but the drifting here just felt unlike anything I had ever played before, and since it's pretty integral to get this motion down, I was having a pretty awful time during my first few races. Plus, it doesn't really help that the AI is also super aggressive, and some of the time limits can be pretty tough to beat too. So your early days with this game, they'll likely be a bit of a struggle. I tried out all the different vehicles, and I eventually settled with the monster truck, which I'm gonna consider the beginner option since it's the slowest, but has excellent turning, which more or less made the game playable for me from here on out. After beating the game with the truck though, I was adamant to try get this game's drifting down, which in the end, I kinda did. You gotta turn like, full on sideways into turns in this game, but with real precise control on the acceleration. The issue I had is that you kinda need to overturn more than you would in most racing games. I always had this feeling I was about to spin out by going too far, but no, that's actually what I'm meant to do. Although, if you turn too much, you will still spin out. When everything works, it looks and feels good, but even when I kinda knew what I needed to do, the execution can still be quite tough. I imagine this might catch you off guard if you're trying this game for the first time, but it is something you can certainly learn. Or just use the monster truck, it's much easier. And since we're talking about the vehicles, I kind of love and hate the designs in this game. They all kind of look like exaggerated versions of real vehicles, which gives them a kind of charming blocky look. I'm not going to say it's very good, but it's, uh, it's charming. They also show some vehicle damage from time to time, which is nice. If you like a wobbly wheel, that is. 
Of course, we can't finish up without talking about the sound, and as you'd expect, you can't have a 90s arcade racing game without a wacky announcer, and this game does not just give you one. Please select your car. It gives you two. Please select your car. Alright, so I believe this only exists in the US version of the game, but if you go into the options menu, you can choose between the classic European music and announcer, or the new US music and announcer. The good news here is that both are excellent. The US announcer has a bit more toot and does Jim Carrey impressions for some reason. Oh, you can expect a lot of cheesy mid-90s hard rock on the US soundtrack, and really, the music for each track here is pretty good across the board. But of course, nothing can compare to the original EU soundtrack, and you know it's going to be good as soon as you hear the opening. Burning Road. Burning Road. The original soundtrack feels like something you'd actually hear in Daytona. It's cheesy, it's got people singing the game's title. Is it a patch on the Daytona soundtrack? No, not even close, but if you like cheesy Euro pop and Euro rock, this game certainly does a great job at capturing that era of arcade music, and frankly, even if it's not up to Daytona levels, it's still excellent. All in all, even after a rocky start trying to get to grips with the game's controls, I quite liked my time at Burning Road. It really does feel like a B-tier home port of a Sega arcade racer, but really over on the PlayStation, the more of that we can get, the better. It is far from the best arcade racer, both in terms of quality and content, but if you're willing to take the time to pick up the game's controls, there is a great classic arcade racer here, and considering this game was seemingly made by a team of just four people, well, the end result here is actually quite impressive. This game would see a follow-up roughly one year later called Explosive Racing, which I can only assume improves upon everything here. Maybe one day the wheel will spit that out too and we can find out for ourselves. Which one should you pick up? I'll let you decide, but do keep in mind that Burning Road is the only one that has this. Burning Road. Burning Road. So clearly, it's the best. will provide Coming up next, we have Dreams to Reality, or according to the game's box, just Dreams. This 1999 PAL exclusive is both published and developed by Cryo Interactive, a French studio that almost exclusively seems to pump out games that will probably show up in this series sooner rather than later. I've not played many myself, but they have a reputation for being pretty weird and also not very good. So before we talk about Dreams on the PS1, we first need to talk about the PC version, which was released in 1997. Dreams to Reality, which was also developed by Cryo Entertainment, is a mess of a game, but at least it's a somewhat ambitious mess. It's a sprawling platform adventure title full of strange environments and a story that could only be written by somebody who spent a little bit too much time with the L funky mushrooms. It was also notorious for running like dirt on most computers available at the time. Now imagine if you will, this big open platformer with massive levels that can topple even the most noble of voodoo graphics card. This game is also slated to be ported to our humble pal, the PlayStation. Surely that's not possible, right? Well, of course, the answer to that question is no, it's not. Instead, the PlayStation got a brand new version of Dreams built from the ground up, exclusive to the console. And Dreams on the PS1? It's, uh, well, it's something. 
and that's putting it kindly. What we have here is a more traditional platforming game. Gone are the open, story, objective-based worlds of the PC version, and instead we get small, individual levels played one after another in a linear fashion. The gameplay in Dreams tends to flip-flop around quite often. Some levels will have you platforming in an open 3D space, while other levels might swap to a 2.5D perspective, with the game then playing like any old 2D platformer. Weirder still is that some parts of the game control differently from others as well. Some 3D levels might have pretty good character movement, while the others might use tank controls out of nowhere for no explicable reason. You never really know what you're going to get from level to level with Dreams, but the one absolute is that the game somehow always finds a way to get worse. Dreams has a pretty confusing start, where it kind of just plops you into a level and within a second you're in combat with an enemy. The opening level is a good place to get the grips with the game's controls and gimmicks cause they are rather unusual but also pretty important to master. So unlike PC Dreams, this version of Dreams actually features three playable characters, the guy, the gal and the big blue one. Each of the characters have different abilities to help you throughout the game. This guy can glide and has medium strength, blue guy has high strength but no real movement options and the girl has the incredible OP ability to fly. So as you can imagine, we will be using her most of the time. You can swap characters during gameplay, but for whatever reason, only when an alarm goes off, which only happens every 90 or so seconds, this is very useful and not bad game design at all. No matter who you're playing as though, your combat options remain mostly the same. You've got a standard melee attack, which is janky as heck, but effective enough to get you through the game. There's also a ranged attack, which is quite powerful, but does use up some of your precious mana. Mana is the resource that's used for your ranged attacks, but it's also the thing that's used for gliding and flying, so really you'll want to limit your mana usage whenever possible. Although you can get a little mana back by collecting these scrolls, which do thankfully respawn after a short period of time. The goal in most of the open levels is usually to navigate around collecting a set number of items until an exit door opens up. You have the choice of doing this the hard way by jumping over numerous identical platforms, or you can opt to fly, mana permitting. What I will give the game is that the control, while not great, is serviceable. Platforming in this game isn't terribly difficult and while it does take a little while to get the flying controls down, it's certainly manageable and far from the worst thing I've ever seen. The thing is though is that there's about 6 or 7 open levels like this in the game and they are pretty much all fundamentally the exact same. I even think you have to play one of them 3 times for some reason. And of course none of them are even really that good. If you fly they're too easy, if you decide the platform it's just really janky and boring. You could collect points but they don't seem to do anything. You could try combat but I found early on that there's generally very little reason to engage in combat at all as you just run the risk of wasting mana or maybe even losing a life so it's better just to go around it if you can. And if you do lose a life, which believe me, you will, you usually respawn on the spot with full health and mana, and if you lose all 3 lives it boots you back to the main menu. But don't worry, you can select continue to start from the last level that you left off. Honestly, if it wasn't for the fact that you could just continue from where you left off, I likely never would have made it through this game. In fact, I thought I was going to be stuck forever at the game's first boss, which is also conveniently the game's first 2.5D level. The gameplay remains the same in 2D, only now you no longer have your ability to fly, but you can still glide, if needs be. Let's just say that it took me a long time to figure out how to hit this boss. A long, long time. It wasn't so much knowing what I needed to do, more so how the hell I could target the boss for an attack. It turns out I needed to hold down the square button while I was holding L1 to glide in the air. It's the only time I needed to do this in the game, by the way. As for the rest of the 2.5D levels, well, imagine a really bad, really boring version of Pandemonium, and that's pretty much the rest of the game. You've got levels where you run to the right across stage design that is copy and pasted ad nauseum, and you've also got levels that involve you running up a series of repeating platforms until you reach the top. And guys, let me tell you, I've never been closer to falling asleep midway through playing a game than some of these levels. There is no challenge, no variety, it is just long, long, long stretches of boredom. One 2.5D level even caught me off guard because while every other level just required me to get to the end to finish it, one level here needed me to either collect something or kill every enemy which forced me to run up and down the tower multiple times for nearly 15 minutes. It was dreadful. Other than that, all that's really left to talk about on the gameplay front is the bosses and outside of the annoying boss we talked about earlier, every other boss in this game can be killed quite literally in seconds. Seriously, here's every boss in the game.
Dreams is special in the fact that it just somehow always manages to get progressively worse as the game goes on. It becomes more unstable, things start to break, levels begin to last for mere seconds, and then just kind of ends. I suppose I should talk to you about the game's story, but really calling whatever this is a story is being way too generous. Peppered throughout the game are various different cutscenes, which I believe are taken from the PC version of the game, and not a single one of these makes any sense whatsoever. It seems like these are just chucked in almost out of sequence and have no relation to anything that takes place within this game. It's like the ramblings of a madman in 90s video game cutscene form. It is truly something to behold. Who's that guy? Ask him where we are. <laughs> you got it. And what might your little name be? Who are those guys? Out of here, Looney! <laughs> You are with us now. Mission terminated. What the hell is that? I guess the only positive thing I can say about Dreams is that some of the music is good. Doesn't make the game any more fun to play, but it did keep me awake during some of the more arduous parts, which was nice. So yeah, that's Dreams. Um, do not play this game. I get the feeling Cryo had the genuine belief that they could port PC Dreams to the PS1 and after the reality set in that that would never be a possibility, they quickly hobbled this game together on the fly to save face and well, look at it now. Banished to the Shadow Realm of PS1 Eurojank. I'll be honest, I wanted to stop playing this game about halfway in, but I knew there wasn't actually that much footage available online for the game, especially past the first few levels, so I wanted to at least do my part and let folks actually experience a slice of the full game. And now that I've returned to tell the tale, let ye be warned, Dreams is not very good. It's janky, it's ugly, the gameplay is all over the place, and worst of all, for a game that's trying to be as weird as this one is, it commits the biggest sin of all. It's just plain boring. Avoid this one at all costs. Provide. Our final game and first ever viewer selection is Cyberdeck. This game was added to the wheel by Jade Costello. Thanks Emil for your contribution and congrats on being the wheels chosen. Also a special shout out to Game System who selected Dreams as their choice for the wheel. You also kinda won by default. And also how dare you. So Cyberdeck launched in the west in the good year of 1998 courtesy of our old pals over at Cygnosis and as far as Cygnosis games on the PlayStation goes, Cyberdeck is probably one of their most obscure and experimental releases. It also happens to be a massive advert for Vans and I mean go on Cygnosis get that bag I don't blame you. So on the surface you might wonder what kind of game is Cyberdeck, is it an extreme sports game, is it a racing game, is it a platformer, maybe even an action game. Well, the answer to all of those questions is yes. The best way I can describe Cyberdeck is that it is a hodgepodge of different ideas. It's a game that tries to be a whole lot of things at once, and let me tell you, it has a hard time being any of them. When you start the game, you're greeted to an opening cutscene where you and your pals are enjoying a nice sunny day at the Vans Hoverboard Skate Park, when suddenly a blue devil comes from out of nowhere and sends like half of the kids into the Shadow Realm. Luckily though, two of the kids were off pulling a 900 or something and managed to avoid capture. It's now up to these two kids, Zacco and Mia, to get their friends back from the weird devil world. 
As far as the story goes, that's about it. Pick either Zako or Mia as your character and go save your friends from the devil. That's as good a motivation for a game as any. Interestingly, Cyberdeck's structure is probably most similar to a 3D platformer. You've got a main hub that connects you to one of four different hub worlds, each with their own theme. Within these hub worlds, there's nine levels that you need to be, and beating the nine levels in the world will then unlock the next. As you can see, it's very platforming. It doesn't stop there either. A good chunk of these game's levels are what you would consider platforming levels. There's enemies to fight, items to collect, and tons of dangerous jumps and challenges to overcome. It's just on top of this, there's also plenty of racing stages, a whole host of different minigame styles, and even fully fledged boss fights. And in Cyberdeck, you do all of this while on a hoverboard. And that right there is the reason why the game just falls apart. Cyberdeck's gimmick is that it tries to be a sort of hoverboard variety platformer. It's a pretty interesting and unique idea for the time, but you gotta keep in mind, for whatever reason, they decided the best way to control your character in this game was if it was like a car. Have you ever played a racing game before? Well, that's how Cyberdeck controls. It's a platformer where your character controls like a car. But not only that, this car has some of the most sensitive controls around. It took me a very long time to get comfortable with the movement in this game, and even when I eventually did, I could never really say the game felt good to play. There was always this anxiety that I could oversteer or mistime a jump at pretty much any time, and some of the levels in this game demand absolute precision when it comes to some of the obstacles that you'll face. You might be punished for going too fast, you might be punished for going too slow, you might need to completely stop from time to time to carefully manage jumps. It's just such an odd game to play, and I mean, if you could imagine the difficulty of some of the jumps and gaps you need to make in Tony Hawk games, well, just imagine that, but with vastly worse player movement and adding levels that are like literal mazes, fetch quests, and any other annoying platformer gimmick you can think of, and well, yeah, you might see why things aren't great. And regardless of the controls, the game is also surprisingly hard too. You have a health system similar to Sonic where as long as you hold at least one star, you can take a hit. And if you get hit without any stars, you lose a life. Of course, actually navigating around to simply pick up a star isn't the easiest thing in the world. And would you believe falling to your death is also an instant life loss too. And believe me, you'll want to avoid dying at all costs because seeing the game over screen might actually curse you for life. <laughs> And look, while you can save in between levels, lives in this game aren't all that common at all. So unless you're willing to carefully go out of your way to nab every extra life you see or aim to get 100 stars for a bonus life, you're going to have a very, very bad time. So the platforming levels, they're not great, but they do only make up a part of the full package. Other levels might feature one of the variety of different minigames on offer. Some will have you operating like a turret to take out penguins, others will see you wakeboarding using some nature-friendly beaver power. These were a nice little break from the platforming gameplay to be honest, but I wouldn't necessarily say that the minigames were all that good either. Similar to the main game, they take a pretty big difficulty spike towards the end, so at best they're kinda meh, and at worst they are pretty damn frustrating. Okay, so the platforming and minigames aren't all that great. Well, how about the racing levels? Well, every third and seventh level in a world is a racing level where you take on one of the two world bosses. It's a simple tree lap race with your only goal being to beat the boss. All of the existent movement problems are present here, although I will say out of all of the game styles attempted here, Cyberdeck does feel most suited to being a racing game, even though it's not a very good one. The game has roughly four different tracks, although they are all variants of the one course, and each take place in this one location, so you'll barely even notice changes from track to track, other than the later levels having way more bullshit obstacles. Races kind of flip-flop from being very hard to very easy. Some races you might end up miles ahead of the enemy, and other times you might struggle to even just squeeze by your opponent on the track. Also, the enemies can leave traps and stun you whenever they're touched, so yeah, it's not ideal. Whenever you beat a race, the next level will then be a boss fight against the very same opponent. There's eight of these total, and surprisingly, some of these I found to be the most fun I had in the game. Yes, all the previous issues are still present, but at least there are some fun ideas with the bosses, and each one usually requires you to try a new tactic to defeat them. When you beat a boss, you also rescue one of your friends and get treated to a fun little cutscene as a reward. Each time you rescue a friend, you also get access to a new trick. You might be wondering why I haven't talked about the tricks yet, and that is because tricks in this game are almost entirely useless. So here's the deal, you've played Tony Hawk, you want to move up the halfpipe and do a cool trick. Well, in Cyberdeck, things do not work like that. To pull off a trick in Cyberdeck, you have to hold down the L1 button to activate the trick wheel. Depending on how long you hold it down, when you next jump, a trick will come out. To land these tricks, you need big air, and half pipes, 
They don't give you that air. Jumping on land also doesn't give you enough air. The only ones that do give you enough air are dangerous jumps that you're too busy trying not to die on to even worry about doing tricks. The benefit of doing tricks, you might ask, is that they seem to let off different attacks. Now, they do look cool, but there is pretty much never a good time to use these, and the risk-reward factor it's just non-existent. I pretty much never did tricks in this game. There was never any reason to. I wanted to, but doing so might meant I lose a life. Imagine an extreme sports game where you're afraid to do tricks. It is a crying shame. The only reason I knew you could even do them at all is because I messed about in the tiny van skate park in the hub world. There's a ramp here that seems specifically designed to test them out, and it is a good thing that I did because surprise surprise, tricks are the only way to damage the last boss. Honestly, the boss battle, not even that bad, but the tricks are just a terribly designed and underutilized mechanic. So I think it's safe to say Cyberdeck is kind of a mess, and I guess you could also say that about the visual style too. It's certainly bright and colorful in parts, and I do like some of the character designs, but the game seems to be going for a kind of psychedelic style, and it just feels a little too basic for my taste. It's an okay looking game, and it runs well enough, but for a Psygnosis game, it's all just a bit underwhelming really. Even the music, which you would imagine with Psygnosis being evolved would be a surefire hit, but it's unfortunately just kind of meh. It's a mixture of original tracks and some licensed commercial music, but outside of one or two standouts, none of it is really all that impressive or memorable. Not that it would have saved the game, but it's a shame nonetheless. <laughs> So yeah, that's Cyberdeck, and look, credit to Psygnosis for trying something a little bit different by melding such an eclectic mixture of genres together. But really, what's the point if you can't even get a single one right? The root of Cyberdeck's problem lies with the game's incredibly twitchy controls, but even if you eventually manage to get to grips with them, the game's punishing difficulty and extreme jankiness will certainly wear you down before you reach the end. Definitely an interesting curiosity that I'm glad we got to check out, but only pick this one up if you're a fan of bad platforming, topped off with a general feeling of anxiety and dread. Everybody else, eh, you can safely avoid this one. Starting out Volume 7, we have Motorhead, which, thanks to the lack of an umlaut, is legally distinct from another slightly more well-known Motorhead. Launching in the summer of 1998, this game was the product of Swedish developer Digital Illusions. They go by the name DICE nowadays, you uh, might have heard of them. Well, before DICE's EA days and the never-ending train of Battlefield games, Digital Illusions were mostly known for their work in two different genres, racing games and pinball games. And unfortunately for the pinball fans out there, today is not the day we talk about true pinball. Please use desired function. Tables. High scores. Tables. Instead, we're going to talk about Motorhead, Digital Illusion's first racer to appear on the PS1. 
It also made its way to PC too, but that's not what this show is about. What we have here is a semi-futuristic arcade racer. I guess an easy way to describe it is that it's kind of like a cross between Wipeout and Ridge Racer. Traditional fast-paced arcade road racing blended in with some banging techno music and a cool Y2K aesthetic. You love to see it. We'll get into the game and its modes momentarily, but upon starting the game, I came across something quite interesting. When digging around the options menu, I stumbled across a very unusual toggle for a PS1 game, the ability to swap between 30 frames per second and 60 frames per second gameplay. Now you have to understand, not only is a toggle like this incredibly rare and forward thinking for a PS1 game, the fact a full 3D racer is playable in 60 frames per second on the PS1 is in itself really rare to see. I could probably count on one hand the number of 3D PS1 racers that I know are playable in 60 frames and they are uh, quite the bunch. We got Rapid Racer, also known as Turbo Prop Racer in North America. It's not very good. There's Crime Killer, which isn't really a racing game, but it doesn't matter because you can't see shit anyway. Running Wild runs at 60 frames per second for some reason. This game, of all things. I probably missed out on some of them, but the most famous one I'm aware of is Ridge Racer Turbo Edition. This was included for free on a Namco promo disc packaged alongside Ridge Racer Type 4. Namco essentially experimented with the idea of making a 60 frames per second Ridge Racer title, but found it way too difficult to maintain the high quality of the visuals without negatively impacting the gameplay. But as a bonus, we got to see some of their efforts in the form of the original Ridge Racer now running at 60 frames per second albeit with a limit of only two cars on the track at the same time. Motorhead has a similar compromise where at 30 frames per second you race with six cars on a track, and at 60 frames per second you race with only three cars on a track. So not only is there one extra car over Ridge Racer, we're also talking about the whole game playable at 60 frames per second, and a rock solid 60 frames at that. This isn't exactly the most graphically impressive PS1 racer out there, but the fact it looks as good as it does while running as fast and smooth as it does makes it kind of a technical marvel for the time. And really, other than the drop in car count, I couldn't notice any real difference in graphical quality between the two toggles either. Here's a side-by-side -side of 60 frames and 30 frames gameplay so you can judge for yourself. Alright, so now that we know about that, I'll let you know that I decided to play this game almost exclusively in the 60 frames mode, and while the drop in car count is a little disappointing, it ends up kind of being a benefit in its own way too. I'll explain what I mean shortly. So Motorhead has all the standard modes that you'd expect from an arcade racer. Single race, time trials, split screen multiplayer, all the good stuff. The game has a total of 8 different tracks, well 16 if you count racing them backwards, and also a grand total of 10 different cars to choose from. Of course, we don't just start with everything from the get-go, we gotta unlock most of the content by playing through the game's main single-player content, the League Mode. In this mode, you unsurprisingly race across a series of different tracks competing for points so you can top a racing league, the Transatlantic Speed League, to be precise. When you start, you'll only have access to three different cars and two tracks to race on. Once you beat the two-track league, you'll then unlock another two tracks and even more cars to drive in. Then when you boot back up the league again, you'll now have to compete in four races back to back. Complete this league and then more tracks and cars get added to the league and so on and so on. The league setup in this game means you will be racing through some of the early tracks multiple times throughout your playthrough before you eventually reach the later tracks. But really this is a good thing because Motorhead is pretty damn fun to play. But it's also really, really hard. We'll get into the difficulty in a moment, but first let's talk about the overall driving experience. It's like butter. It's like butter, baby. It's like butter. It's like butter, baby. It's fucking good. As we already mentioned, Motorhead is an arcade racer. You go very, very fast, but also handle really, really well. Although the racing here isn't so much hyper drifting and taking every corner at speed, you will be braking and slowing down quite a bit, especially during some of the game's trickier tracks, but whether you're making quick maneuvers at breakneck speed or just carefully navigating some pillars in a parking lot, the driving in this game is spot on throughout. Although even with some buttery smooth controls, Motorhead is no cakewalk. Oh no, Motorhead is a brutal racing game, and that is thanks to two things, the opponent AI and the game's track design. 
We'll start with the track design since it kind of ties in with the AI difficulty as well. The tracks in Motorhead are in a word, cramped. Road space is limited across the game. Tracks feel tight and claustrophobic, and when you combine that in with the fast speed of the vehicles, even the tiniest misjudgment in steering or speed can spell disaster. You've got to be focused and on point at all times, but it's not just about good reactions. These tracks also require an element of memorization. Tracks oftentimes have what I'd call a uh, trap segments, where if you forget something is coming up on the track, you can easily crash right into it, and these parts are particularly devastating and time-wasting, to the point where simply hitting one can easily cost you the whole race. It meant that my first run on almost every track was a complete and total disaster. You gotta learn when to brake for each sharp turn, when to stick to the left or right to avoid certain obstacles. If there is a lapse in concentration, you're donezo, plain and simple. Now take all of this into consideration, but also add some god-tier AI that, even on the easiest difficulty, will absolutely leave you in the dust. Beating these guys once again requires absolute precision with your driving. These guys race almost flawlessly and leave you with a scant few opportunities to overtake them. And even if you do manage to overtake them, they will oftentimes be breathing down your neck, a single mistake, and you're donezo. Now this is where the 60 frames per second toggle actually comes in handy because instead of dealing with five god tier AI cars on a cramped little racetrack, you only gotta deal with two. This also happens to make it easier to win in leagues as well, because even if you lose a race, you still get a decent chunk of points for coming in third. It's still by no means easy, but it is definitely more manageable this way. Plus, it also comes with the added perk of doubling your frame rate. Now look, me saying Motorhead is difficult definitely isn't a criticism. On the contrary, I actually think the difficulty is one of its biggest strengths. Motorhead is a very visceral game, it demands a lot out of you, but the feeling of perfecting a track and conquering the devil AI in this game is some rush. And while the AI itself can feel a little, uh, unbalanced at times, winning a race is almost always within your control, and you can rest easy knowing that if you bollocks it up, well at least it's not down to the game's handling. Except for the final race, where you gotta be a supercar one-on-one -on -one over a series of 10 laps, and this guy is just plain busted. In fact, the only reason I even won this race is because the AI car just totaled itself out of nowhere, which was pretty funny. Although even after that happened, the car still managed to get right behind me at the end of the race. It was terrifying. But yeah, other than that, the game overall, it's like the Czech police. Stern. Stern but fair. Another big plus to the game is its atmosphere and visual design. I really like the near future aesthetic that they went for, although I would have liked to see them push it maybe a little bit further with some zanier stuff, but it does strike a nice balance of strange and familiar while offering up some decent visual variety across the various track locales. The graphics overall are nice and detailed. It can be a little dark at times, but I think that gives the game a kind of sinister overtone as well, almost like the game's fog is pollution or smog in the sky. And look, speaking of the fog and draw distance, I mean, it's not ideal, but I think it is at a completely acceptable level considering the performance and visual quality we're getting while racing. Unfortunately, I think the car designs on the whole are a little repetitive and uninteresting, but I think that's also a cost of prioritizing the frame rate, so yeah, you know, it is what it is. Of course, topping off the presentation, we gotta talk about the sound too. And look, while the sound effects while driving are excellent in their own right, one of the biggest stars in Motorhead is the excellent soundtrack. Each race track in the game has its own exclusive background music, and there ain't a bad one in this game at all. They run the gambit from techno bangers, ambient, trance, and even some more sinister industrial tracks. It's a high tempo soundtrack for a high tempo racer, and it's one that you'll be keeping at max volume the whole way through it.
So that's Motorhead. And look, while it isn't as content rich as other racers released around this time, and the difficulty certainly won't be for everybody, as far as arcade racers on the PlayStation go, few offer up the intensity and edge that Motorhead does. It's a punishing but rewarding game, and if you're up for the challenge, what we have here is one of the PlayStation's most technically impressive and fun racing games, and really is worthy of being in any fan's racing collection. Do not sleep on this one. will provide Next up, we have Hebereke's Popoido, which first launched in Japan in the summer of 1995 before making its way to the West as a PAL exclusive in the spring of 1996. This game was both published and developed by Sunsoft in collaboration with success, and for those unaware, this little penguin fella is Hebereke. He was kind of Sunsoft's mascot for a period during the early to mid 90s. Hebereke also roughly translates as drunk in Japanese, so there you go, little drunk penguin. Him and his pals appeared in a bunch of games in Japan, spanning a whole host of different genres. We even got a few of them here in Europe, the most famous of which is probably the NES version of the original Famicom game, which was known as Euphoria over here. It's one of the holy grails of PAL NES collecting, and being that it's a late-release Sunsoft game, you know the music is ridiculously good. The remaining two Hebereke games we got here are a little different though. The first was Hebereke's Popone, which was a puzzle game on the Super Nintendo, and the other game is called Hebereke's Popoido, which is also a puzzle game on the Super Nintendo. And also the Saturn and the PlayStation. So Hebereke's Popoido is a very traditional puzzle game. In fact, you should be able to notice the influence of two other puzzle titles almost immediately. Puyo Puyo and a little Dr. Mario. And honestly, yeah, that's pretty much the game. It's a cross between Puyo Puyo and Dr. Mario. But does that mean it's any good? Well, let's find out. After we boot the game up and get greeted by our fun little penguin friend here, we see the various options available to us. And from the get-go, there are not very many. We have a one-player mode and also two different competitive multiplayer modes. We might as well start with the one-player mode. Here we travel across a cute little world map to battle 8 different opponents in some puzzle action. Here we get some brief scenes before and after each stage, which introduces you to the various different Hebereke characters like Catboy, Cool Ghost, and Jennifer. The most I can say about these scenes is that they exist? There's some light conversation between the characters, but you can tell they had no budget when it came to the translation. All the dialogue here is very literal and devoid of almost any personality, which is very disappointing for a game that features character designs like this. Anyway, that stuff isn't really important, so let's talk about the gameplay. Now, in spite of the fact that you are technically battling somebody, the one-player mode only features a solo playing field. You don't have to worry about any AI throwing junk onto your fields or messing up any of your carefully laid plans, which is a good thing because I am very, very bad at this game. So, as I already mentioned, Hebereke's Popoido is more or less Poyo Poyo crossed with Dr. Mario. The goal is to match coloured Poyo pieces to matching enemy pieces. If you connect four or more of the same colour together, the blocks will disappear and you'll net some points. The goal in each stage is to get rid of all the enemy pieces, so as you can see, it is quite literally Dr. Poyo. Now, while the gameplay itself is quite simple in theory, there's a few additions to the formula unique to Hebereke which give it a little extra edge. For one, the enemy pieces have a habit of moving around the playing field. Some of these are static, but others will move around in set patterns that can be both beneficial, allowing you to connect big combos, or detrimental and completely ruin your entire run. Another thing that caught me off guard is how the pieces themselves connect. Unlike Puyo games, the pieces only react to each other if they are stacked horizontally or vertically. 
So you could have maybe 10 pieces of the same color connected to one another, but they will only activate if there are four or more connected horizontally or vertically in a line. And only those will activate, not any of the additional same colored pieces that are connected. So between moving enemy pieces and the strict match requirements to actually delete them, I had an awful time with this game. I don't think I've ever played a puzzle game where I failed the first stage so easily and then failed it again right after. A lot of this game's rules and how it plays just felt really alien to me, like you have some sort of expectations in your head on how a puzzle game usually plays, but this one just throws you for a loop almost right out the gate. If you stack one colour under another colour, it is extremely difficult to clear that bottom coloured piece. You have to very carefully and quickly decide the optimal position to drop blocks because your goal is to clear all the enemy pieces, but a single mistake could set that goal back significantly while you try to figure out how to rectify that mistake. And if you make more mistakes while you're doing it, you become even more overwhelmed. Now remember, pieces only react to four colors that match horizontally and vertically only. And with multiple multicolored pieces and the speed that this game goes at, it is less than forgiving. You know, I kind of see what they were going for with this. You can tell there is a very high skill ceiling for this game and the potential to pull off big chains and combos is massive, especially when you take into consideration the timing of the moving blocks. But my God, playing this thing, it was just such an unenjoyable experience for me. I fought my way through this game. I tried to figure it out and I tried to get better, but the spike in difficulty was just way too much for me. It just kind of overly complicated the Puyo and Dr. Mario formula and just creates a worse version of each in my opinion. Now look, I'll admit, I'm not the best puzzle game player in the world and I can appreciate the skill cap that the game has, but it's rare that I don't enjoy a puzzle game and I think the gameplay here on the whole, it's just more frustrating than fun. Plus, even if I did bow out on stage five, that's still over half the game's eight stages. And from what I can tell, if you're, you know, good at video games, you should be able to finish them all in about half an hour, which isn't very long. Now, I wouldn't say that's a problem normally if the game had literally any other single player content. The two competitive multiplayer modes here are only playable with a second player. Why this game does not have AI battles, I do not know, but it is an auto mission to say the least. And it's especially annoying because one of the two player modes lets you play in the style of the previous Hebereke puzzle game, which is actually a lot more enjoyable in my opinion, but if you ain't got a friend, then fuck you. So yeah, the package on the whole, uh, not my favourite to say the least, but on the bright side, it is still a Sunsoft game, so the presentation's pretty good. Since this originally launched in 95 in Japan, this is a pretty early 2D game on the console, and as such, kind of looks more like an enhanced 16-bit game than a true next-gen 2D title. But regardless, I still really like the visuals on offer. There's plenty of rich colours, fun character designs, and the puzzle fields themselves look pleasant and are easily readable. And the music, as you'd expect, is pretty great too. Too, although it is definitely one of the stranger Sunsoft soundtracks I've heard. I believe this PS1 version has a unique soundtrack too, different than the Saturn and Super Nintendo versions. So if you're looking for some of the weirder cuts from Sunsoft's music library, this is one well worth checking out. I guess my final opinion on Hebereke's Papuido is a mixed one. I really like the presentation, the looks, the music. It's all very nice. The gameplay, on the other hand, it is just not for me. There is definitely a functional and competent puzzle game here, but for those who play puzzle titles a little more casually, I think the package as a whole just offers up more frustration than fun. Although, as we already know, I'm also just really bad at video games, so if this looks like your kind of jam, well, it might still be worth a look. Everybody else, though, just play Euphoria instead. It's the only Hebereke game you will ever need. Trust me. Finally, on the Saturn, Hebereke Popoido, which is Japanese for Why are Dave and Rick wearing shades in the middle of winter? Hebereke's Popoido? Huh? What on earth is going on? It's basically your, your Hebereke's Popoon on the SNES, but on the Saturn. Mean Bean Machine, Pack Attack, Puzzle Bobble, they've all become very popular lately. All these 
more graphic-y, Tetris-y type games. That's exactly what Hebereki's Kapoito is. Trouble is, it's absolutely bonkers. There's just too much going on on screen to actually make a puzzle game work. Puzzle games should put you into a calm state and let you relax, let you get into it gradually. But Heparaki's Popoito throws everything at you at once and you end up getting hit from a thousand angles. The wheel will provide. game today is Critical Depth, making its way to the PlayStation in late 1997. This game was developed by Single Track Entertainment Technologies, who were responsible for some of the earliest hits on the platform, games like Warhawk, Jet Moto, and most notably the first two Twisted Metal titles, which were more or less responsible for kickstarting the brief rise of the vehicular combat genre. As the Twisted Metal franchise continued on without Single Track from the third game onwards, you might wonder what direction Single Track were going to go in next. Well, the answer to that question is down. Deep down into the ocean. Critical Depth is essentially twisted metal, but underwater. Replace cars, ice cream trucks, and giant wheels with pirate ships, submarines, and a scuba diver. And look, I suppose if anybody was to attempt to mix up the twisted metal formula by bringing it into a new setting, it might as well come from the developers that know vehicular combat. Plus, it says that right in the box, so who am I to disagree? So in Critical Depth, we have three different modes that, similarly to Twisted Metal, can both be played solo or in split screen with a friend. You've got your standard depth match mode, where you select the sub and map of your choice and just go to town on some enemies trying to rack up as many kills as you can. And there's the battle mode, which veers more into capture the flag style gameplay. The goal here is to collect five different pods and escape through a warp gate. Each of the pods you pick up also increases your vehicle stats, granting buffs to things like armor and weapon strength. The final mode available is Missions Mode, which is where the game's most significant content lies. This is essentially the game's story mode, where you choose from one of the game's 12 characters and make your way through a series of battles. One thing I always appreciated about the Twisted Metal series that's also present here is the amount of effort they put into their characters' backstories and lore. Each of the characters have their own little info section to browse through, and even a full story unique to each of the 12 different characters. Now while these are mostly told only through text briefings between missions, there's a surprising amount to these and they can be engaging and funny too. It's rare that I would read through every single text scene in a game like this, but there is enough character and personality here to make it worth your while. When you get into the game and start playing, you'll find that the game's controls are almost one-to-one -one with Twisted Metal. From the way you accelerate to weapon buttons, sub-weapon toggles, and even the quick turn that's always mapped to the X button. Now, of course, being underwater, there is a few key differences, most notably the fact that you're now able to move in pretty much any direction you like, and really, the underwater movement in this game far exceeded my expectations. I was a little worried it might be a bit awkward and cumbersome for a game like this, but it's actually really smooth and allows for a great degree of control around the various maps. It's definitely quite simple not letting you do anything too wild in terms of rotations or crazy maneuvers, but I think simplicity probably works in its favor, with the only major differences in control coming down to the actual character that you choose to use. The boost feature also makes its way over the critical depth, but now the meter is shared with a new shield feature as well, which comes in very handy allowing you to defend yourself from enemy attacks. Since these are both pretty important functions, having them share the one meter offers up a nice bit of strategy when choosing which to utilize in different situations. As for weapons, well the game's standard machine guns have been swapped over to a simple torpedo setup. 
And for sub weapons, you can expect the usual array of missiles, homing shots, and freeze weaponry, but all switched up to suit the underwater theme. Ever wanted to shoot piranhas at your enemies? Well, finally, there's a game that allows it. Each character also has their own unique special weapon as well. Some of these function like enhanced versions of normal weapons, but there's also some cool ones too, like being able to grapple onto enemies or even lift them up and shake them around. On the whole, I think the gameplay successfully captures what's good about the Twisted Metal games while making it work in this new style. But even with that bit of praise, my first time playing this game did not go very well. So interestingly, the mission mode in this game favours the game's battle mode over the traditional deathmatch mode. So when I went into the game and immediately gunned for my enemies, well, I found out that is a very, very quick way to lose. Instead, to beat a level as mentioned earlier, you need to collect all five of the power pods that drop into the map shortly after the level starts. Doesn't matter if you kill a single enemy, as long as you reach the portal while holding all five pods, you've beaten the stage. Now the thing is, while I appreciate the attempt to spice up the gameplay somewhat with this new game mode, I'm not all that sure it's very good. The problem I have is that the game gives you these big elaborate maps with hidden nooks and crannies, cool little secrets and fun places to just essentially chase your enemies through. But the game always kind of devolves into every player just piling on top of one another desperately gunning for whoever has the most pods. And it just becomes a big messy fight that kind of lingers in one part of the map and one part only. It's not necessarily that it's bad, there is some fun to it, it's just that I personally prefer the straight up death matches as it kind of promotes more interesting combat across the whole entire map. And my problem is that death matches are only available in death match mode, not the story mode, which is pretty much exclusively battle mode and capturing the five pods. Once again, it's not terrible. I just would have liked to see death match at least included in the mission mode to add some variety. At least there's some boss stages which kind of play like a death match, but also add on some fun gimmicks too, like trying to blow up a glowing orb with radio controlled torpedoes. There's not many of these, but they are fun whenever they do pop up. Outside of all of this though, I'd say the game's biggest issue, or at least for me, was just how difficult the damn thing is. When starting this game on normal, I would be lucky to make it past the second or third stage. Anytime I'd engage in combat with somebody, I would almost always come out taking a crazy amount of damage. It did get better as I learned to use the shield more, but it just never felt like I could get control of these battles. The AI just really, really wanted me dead. I eventually dropped the game down to easy and started having a much better time while getting used to everything, but alas, this is one of those games that gates off the last few levels of the game unless you're playing on normal or hard. So eventually I just had to bite the bullet and plow through on normal, and I pretty much always got obliterated. Yeah, I don't know, the difficulty kind of just felt overly hard in this game. It could just be another case of me being really bad, but I think this one kind of does veer over to the bullshit side of difficulty from time to time. On the bright side, I do really dig the presentation. As mentioned, I love the variety of different characters and just the sheer amount of them on offer. Plus, the vehicle designs are pretty cool too, even if they aren't as memorable as some of the twisted metal designs. The maps themselves I quite like too. There's some big ones and smaller arena-style levels, and you can even jump out of the water to see the land if you like. Of course, being stuck underwater, the levels can sometimes feel a little samey. They are all just blue after all, but there is still enough unique visual identifiers to at least give the maps a look and feel of their own. The music is also surprisingly good, like really, really good. I always remembered the Twisted Metal games having good soundtracks and thankfully that seems to have carried over here too. The music has an almost cinematic edge and definitely makes use of all the great video game water music tropes, giving us tracks ranging from dark, ambient and atmospheric all the way over to some guitar driven bangers. They really went all out with this one and created quite the sleeper hit of a PS1 soundtrack. And Critical Depth is quite an interesting beast. I think as an underwater translation of the Twisted Metal formula, it's actually quite a success. The gameplay is as fun as ever, and the new environments and movement is a nice shakeup from the old Road Blast and Raw used to. The problems, in my opinion, come from the reliance on the Capture the Pod gameplay, which while still fun, just isn't a match for the traditional deathmatch gameplay in my opinion. Plus the AI difficulty in this game is just some of the most difficult I've ever seen in a game like this, to the point that I call it more of a game problem than a player problem. 
but in spite of that, the game still has quite a lot going for it. There's clearly been a lot of effort put into it. It's got a ton of content with plenty of hidden unlockables for longevity, and I've no doubt playing through this game either cooperatively or versus with a friend is where the game will definitely shine the most. It is far from the best vehicular combat game on the console, but if you are a fan of the genre and are craving a little more twisted metal from the original team who started it all, well then maybe it's worth taking a dive into the critical depths and checking this one out. The final game and viewer choice for this volume is Blaze and Blade Eternal Quest. This game was actually nominated by two people, so give it up for Brandon Yurios Degui and Dishonored Knight. A big congrats on being the wheels chosen. So what we have here is an action RPG from a developer called T and Esoft, who are also the developers behind the Hydalite series. Don't worry, this game is better than Hydalite. Blaze and Blade Eternal Quest first made its way to Japanese shells in early 1998 before making its way to the West as another PAL exclusive in the summer of 1999. It's a pretty traditional action RPG. If you like exploring dungeons, finding treasure and slaying monsters, well, you will not be disappointed here. Although the big thing that makes Blaze and Blade stand out on the platform is the fact that it's a co-op focused action RPG, allowing four players to play simultaneously through a multi-tap or link cable. Now, co-op action RPGs are kind of a rare sight on the console as it is. There's Diablo, which is really good, but locked to only two players. And I suppose there's also Gauntlet Legends, which criminally is also limited to just two players for the PS1 version. But here, on the other hand, we've got a genuine, full-fat, long-ass RPG for four players. So T and Esoft, you've got my attention. Although, let's pull the brakes here real quick. You might remember a time where I found it hard to get somebody to play a masterpiece like The Curling with me, so you know I have no chance of getting two people together to play this game, let alone four. So my experience today will be from the point of a solo player, which thankfully is a completely valid way to play this game. But is it a good way? Well, let's find out. So when you start up Blaze and Blade, the first thing you've got to do is create a party of up to four characters from a selection of eight different classes. We've got Warrior, Fairy, Dwarf, Elf, Hunter, Sorcerer, Rogue, Caitlyn, Noah, Sasha, Morgan, and Priest, with both a male and female variant available for each giving us a grand total of 16 different selectable characters. In terms of visual customization, you're basically locked in with the default design of your character, but you can alter the color choices for each if you like. As far as the class selection goes, 8 is a pretty generous offering, covering pretty much all of the basic archetypes from tanky melee characters to ranged DPS and more support focused options. Some classes can even access special locations in the game, like a dwarf that can clear rocks that block your path. For my party, I tried to keep it simple, so I went for a warrior named Todd, a dwarf named Sally, a ranger named Carl, and a fairy named Cleo. Before you head off though, you also need to assign some points to your character's stats. Obviously, each class has stats that benefit it the most, but you are free here to kind of do what you like. It's also worth noting that the game seems to award you a random amount of bonus points when creating a character, so if you care about min-maxing, you could likely be hanging around here for quite a while until you roll the perfect little dwarf. Alright, now that that's out of the way, let's get into the game. 
When you start, your party shows up at the roadside inn, which acts sort of like the game's hub area. Here you can chat to NPCs, pick up quests, store your items, and also inspect new items that you found out on the field. In terms of story and character interactions, everything here in Blade and Blaze is a uh, paper thin to say the least. The story here is a tale as old as time. You must collect a set number of MacGuffins that are protected by various monsters across the land, so you can then use their collected power to summon and defeat the one true evil. Look, it's nothing new, but as far as excuses to go do some dungeon crawl and go, this is a pretty good one. Although beyond that, do not expect anything interesting out of the NPCs or story interactions here. While the translation is pretty good, nobody really has anything very interesting or worthwhile to say. It becomes quite apparent the focus here is on the gameplay above all else. So let's get into that. Once you leave the Woodside Inn, you then get brought to the game's map screen, which is where you'll access the game's various areas. When you start, you'll only have one location to visit, but as the game goes on, you'll unlock plenty more and even get the choice to tackle them in the order of your choosing. Although, beware if you enter a high level area, you will notice it very, very quickly. The first thing I noticed in this game was just how large the overall playing maps were. Even from the first area, it can be a little overwhelming with the number of directions that you can go, although thankfully the game does give you a useful compass, as well as a full map that's available in the menus, which I highly advise you check often, as getting lost in this game is a definite possibility if you're not leaving markers and remembering important landmarks. Now of course, if you were playing this multiplayer, each of the four characters will be operating individually from one another. But here in solo mode, your characters tend to stick to a neat line of four, with you choosing any one of the four characters to be the leader. Gameplay for the most part is very simple. You've got the occasional bit of platforming, the odd puzzle to solve, but more often than not, you'll just be exploring and going to town on every enemy you see. Characters like the ranger can attack from range with their bow and use special herbs to buff and heal the party. The fairy can cast various buffs and debuffs, as well as attack with a magic wand. And the warrior and dwarf can pretty much just attack and block, but... Eh, at least they do it in stock. Is this the tightest and most satisfying combo I've ever seen in an action RPG? Absolutely not, but it does do the job. I had a nice time just repeatedly slashing enemies over and over for hours on end, which I think is the hallmark of all fun action RPGs, so yeah, it's good enough. As for the AI, well, it attempts to attack from time to time, which is helpful, but you'll never be able to rely on them for anything. Nor can they use any magic or items, so yeah, they're mostly just useless. When you kill enemies in this game, they drop these pink XP crystals and also these little blue things which act as the game's currency. We'll get to those in a little while, but XP? Boy, does this game love giving you XP. Your party is leveling up almost every few minutes. It's crazy, I was nearly level 50 after getting just one of the game's stones. And these level ups don't just reward your brain with a nice little hit of dopamine, they also fully heal your character, so healing for the most part kind of just sorts itself out during the game, which is nice. You can of course use items to heal your character, but why waste them when you can drag your friends around on 1 HP, desperately hoping for a level up? This happened to me quite a bit because if your allies die, thankfully the only penalty is that they're out until you move to a new screen, where they'll pop back up on 1 HP, and you better believe I was as stingy as possible with those level up heals. These guys would be dying for days. Really you want to save your items for the area bosses, which offer a significantly higher challenge than the regular enemies. Plus you can guarantee it will wipe out your three additional party members almost immediately. But that's not a problem because nothing can beat a dwarf with a shield. <laughs> See? Not even close. Really, as an action RPG, the core gameplay here ticked all the right boxes for me. This is a big game with plenty of locations, items, and secrets, and it definitely doesn't skimp out on some of the heavier RPG elements too, considering the fact that it is a four-player game. Now, unfortunately, on the visual front, I wouldn't really say that this is the most impressive game I've ever played. Uh, at all. And believe me, the PAL aspect ratio and frame rate ain't doing this game any favours either. Everything just looks very muddled. You can zoom and rotate the camera to get a better view of your surroundings, but really I found this game super hard to play on almost anything but the most zoomed out view. Although it's not like zooming up close helps anything, but fully zoomed out, it can be extra rough on the eyes. The music and sound effects are nice though, I wouldn't say it's the most memorable RPG soundtrack you'll hear on the PlayStation, but the music never grows old, even in some of the longer dungeons, and when it is good, it can be very, very good.
This is usually about the time where I'd wrap things up and give you some final thoughts on the game. And look, up until this point, even as a solo player, this seems like a relatively fun, if simple, action RPG. But the thing is, it's not. So allow me to quickly turn heel on Blazing Blade for a little bit real quick. This game has a major problem, one that's baked into the game at a design level that just makes it one of the most cumbersome games I have ever played. I'm talking about trying to set up a game of Four Swords or Crystal Chronicles on the GameCube cumbersome. Well, actually, no, it's, it's not that bad. But look, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So when you create a character in this game, the character saves to the player's memory card. Now, this is three blocks per character. So if you wanted to create a party of four characters, it would take up an entire PlayStation memory card to do so. Now, thankfully, this wasn't a problem for me, but if you want to play this game with four characters solo or with friends, you're going to need a whole memory card worth of space for this game. But it gets worse. Every time you want to save in this game, you need to save the game four times, once for each character. And these are long ass saves too. So this can take a little while, especially if you're like me and love saving all the goddamn time. But wait, it gets worse. When you pick up an item in this game, it goes into the active character's inventory. Now, not every item can be used by every class and some items you'll just naturally want to hand down to your other characters just to buff their stats. Well, guess what? Players can't trade items in this game. To exchange items in Blazing Blade, it needs to be done through the auction menu, which requires you to boot to the game's main menu, load each of the characters into an auction slot, and then buy the items from one another using the currency that enemies drop in game. Also, money only goes to your active character, so if you are not using a character, they ain't buying shit. So here's the thing, I kinda get what they were going for here. Your friends, they can come on over with their characters on the memory cards and you can load them up into your game and swap items and stuff, but like, what if you just wanna play with four people in the same room? You're gonna be saving four times, loading four times, saving whenever you put items away, booting to the main menu to exchange items, loading four times again, and it's not just awkward as heck, it's also incredibly time-wasting too. And worse yet, if you're playing solo, you still gotta do all this. It's just the worst. So look, if you wanna try this game, please be aware you're gonna have to deal with some very awkward and unfriendly game design. It didn't ruin the game for me as this stuff only really rears its head between questing, but it is still frequent enough to be a big mark on the game as a whole. But still, in spite of that, I had a good time with this one. I played it a lot, actually. I didn't finish it, but I played it a lot. As a solo player, it's really just kind of middle of the road as far as action RPGs go, but you can definitely have a good time with it. But it is very, very clear that this game is built for co-op. And look, if you can get four players, heck, even just two or three together, then you can really tap into this game's potential. While the game has certainly aged much worse than some of its peers, this definitely strikes me as the kind of game you could have played for dozens of hours with friends back in the day, and I've no doubt anybody that did would have a really special place in their heart for this one, because like I said, in spite of its simplicity, this is still a long-ass, full-fat action RPG for four players, and on the PlayStation, there are not many games offering up what this has, even if it's a, a cumbersome, janky mess as well. And while this game never made it to North America on the PlayStation, the game did also see a PC release one year later, which did make it to North America. So if you want to try that, maybe it's better. I don't know. It also had a PS1 follow-up a short while later called Blaze and Blade Busters, which is on the same engine, but just seems to streamline all the cumbersome parts. But uh, that never left Japan, nor is it translated. So yeah, we're out of luck. But hey, at least we did get the original Blaze and Blade. And while it may be a tougher sell for people nowadays, if you've got an empty memory card, four controllers, a multi-tap, some friends, and 30 or so hours to kill, well, then here's a good way to pass the time. We need a driver. We've heard a lot about you. You any good. Get in.
wheel will provide. Squeegee up that oil! It's time for the main of us! Oh yeah! Look at him go! Ooh, that new red rocker must have a handsome crappy! <laughs> Don't you think that blue, baby? Yeah, and his face will look a lot more like yours once stakeout is done with him. Rock'em, suck'em, robots are in! First up, we have Rock'em Sock'em Robots Arena, making its way to the PlayStation in December 2000 as a North American exclusive. I think it's fair to say Rock'em Sock'em Robots is one of the most iconic toys ever made. The concept is simple, you've got a red robot and you've got a blue robot, and you've got to box the heads off one another until uh, you literally box the head off of one of them. My block is knocked off! Top tier entertainment. Now my familiarity with this toy actually comes from its many, many appearances and references throughout various different forms of media. The actual toy itself, I have never seen in the flesh. Not at a friend's house when I was a kid, not at toy shops. As far as I can tell, at least from the early 90s onwards, Rock'em Sock'em Robots just wasn't a thing here in Ireland. You knocked his black off! Come with me. We did have karate fighters though. That's kind of the same thing, right? So needless to say, without any sense of Rock'em Sock'em nostalgia clouding my judgement, I had no real expectations coming into this PS1 release, a fighting game loosely based off the toys. You generally assume it's gonna be bad because it's a fighting game based off a boomer toy from the 1960s, but upon starting the game, I came across something that instantly gave me a glimmer of hope. Rock'em Sock'em Robots Arena was developed by Paradox Developments, a team responsible for four other fighting games released on the PlayStation, all of which are actually pretty good. We have Trill Kill, the four-player arena fighter that was deemed so violent it never actually seen an official release. Wu-Tang Shaolin Style, a reskinned version of Trill Kill that is notably less violent, but has the Wu-Tang Clan this time around, which I feel is a pretty good compromise. And there's the two X-Men Mutant Academy games, which I took a look at on the channel previously and found to be two genuinely good fighters. Plus mentioning the games gives me an excuse to show this clip again, which for obvious reasons I will continue to use whenever possible. So with Paradox, we've got a developer with a proven track record in both traditional and arena style fighting gameplay, and that's a good thing because Rock'em Sock'em Robots Arena is a game that kinda utilizes both styles. One minute it's a traditional fighting game, the next you're running around an arena dodging projectiles or trying to get power-ups. It's an interesting mix of styles, but nowhere near as interesting as the robot fighters themselves. Now as for the Rock'em Sock'em branding, of course you'll see familiar favourites like Red Robot and uh, Blue Robot, and no doubt you'll be bopping a few heads off from time to time. But outside of that, the game itself really could just exist as its own separate entity called Big Robot Fighting Game. This isn't a simple game about trying to take your opponent's heads, it's a game about building up a robot by using a selection of different parts and weapons, and then using that big robot to smash up other robots and take their parts so you can do it all over again. The game features a few of the usual fighting game modes like your training, your 1v1 battles, but the meat of the game lies within the career mode. In this mode, you choose from a selection of different robots and aim to fight your way to the top of the illustrious robot fighting league. This involves you fighting through a ladder of different opponents one by one until you eventually take on the champion and aim to get promoted to the next league. These battles are simple 1v1 fights, but winning doesn't just bump you up the rankings, it also nets you some cash. Whenever you beat a robot, its parts will then appear in the store, which you can buy to essentially give your robot the moves of your opponents. If one guy is pissing you off with a move, beat him up and then use the same move to piss off the next guy. The store isn't the only way to acquire parts though. During battles, if enough damage gets dealt to a single section of a robot, the part might break off, rendering it unusable for the rest of the match. And if it was an enemy robot that lost that part, you also get rewarded with the part at the end of the fight. There's a lot of different parts to collect, and better yet, as you move through the career mode, you begin to unlock upgraded versions of each part as well, which give you even more moves and ways to damage your opponent. 
Honestly, this is actually really, really cool. It's a surprisingly experimental fighting game as it allows you to kind of build your own fighter that suits your specific fighting style. And between all the different parts, there is a huge amount of flexibility and choice available. It is genuinely impressive. But the thing is, while this game is full of great ideas and concepts, the experimentation doesn't really mean a thing if the fighting system itself isn't up to the task. And in this case, it's uh, not very good. So the way combat in this game works is both very simple and incredibly confusing. Each of the four face buttons represent one of the four parts on your body. Square and triangle are your left and right arms, X is your legs, and circle is your torso. The torso is the only part that is specific to each individual character, otherwise you can connect any combination of legs and arms that you like. Now the thing is, every single move in this game is different depending on the parts you use. Now I'm not just talking about special moves, I'm talking mids, lows, highs, jabs, low kicks, everything is specific to the part. Now while the idea itself is really interesting in theory, the execution is where the problems lie. Each different part has only like 4 or 5 moves total. Special moves, combos, even just a simple kick. Yeah, roughly 4 or 5 per part, sometimes even less. This means, while there's a lot of customization available, every part feels like it's kind of missing something. Now I'm not expecting a Tekken 7 moves list here, but this game would have significantly less attacks per character than the likes of Tekken 1. And since the goal of this game is kind of similar to Tekken in that you want to find moves that string together to allow you to pull off combos and juggle your opponent, the lack of moves actually make the fighting feel really, really limited. I did manage to find a set of parts that I liked after some experimentation, but even when I felt like I had a grasp on the capabilities of my character, it never felt like I could execute more than two or three moves in a string. My tactics worked and I could win fights confidently and easily, but it just never really felt satisfying, just kind of stiff and clunky. Another issue that kind of hampered my ability to experiment was the lack of an in-game moves list. Other Paradox games have this, so I'm not sure why it isn't present here. GameFAQ doesn't even have a moves list for this game, so in this case we had to go old school and consult the manual to actually learn how to use each part. Thankfully the move lists are really simple and oftentimes copied from part to part, but having to reference a manual every time I wanted to try something different actually made me turn off trying new parts and instead maybe stick to learning a smaller number of parts and just trying to refine my skills with those abilities instead. The game also drops the ball with the battle arenas I feel, there's like 4 arenas total not including the training arena, which visually don't differ a whole bunch from one another. The arenas themselves kind of feel like a missed opportunity as a whole because the gimmick of being able to run around them freely like an arena fighter is pretty much only ever needed to reach these health zones, which give your robot a portion of your life back. I personally would have loved to see some Robot Wars style traps and pitfalls unique to each arena to make the locales and fights a little more dynamic but, eh, maybe that's just me. At least the engine Paradox has been using since Trill Kill seems to be holding up pretty well. It is definitely starting to show its age at this stage, but the robots look nice and detailed and the game runs really smoothly too. Music wise we have a surprisingly dancey techno soundtrack as well, although I'll probably get some flack for this but outside of a few select tracks the music here is really kind of generic and forgettable for the most part. Fine for background music but nothing I'll be listening to in my spare time that's for sure. My whole time playing Rock'em Sock'em Robots Arena, one thought just kept going through my head. Wow, this is such a cool idea for a fighting game. I just wish it was better. It's clear Paradox put in the effort and tried to make something a cut above the usual licensed video game. The robot designs and parts are really cool, it's got a bunch of unlockable boss robots that promote multiple playthroughs of the career mode, there's some cool cutscenes and CG dotted throughout the game, and also some of the special moves and grab animations look really really good, it never gets old. But the fighting gameplay is unfortunately just so clunky, limiting and 
kind of boring that the game just crumbles beneath all these interesting ideas. Despite there being a huge amount of customization with the different moves assigned to each part, even the best robot setup here doesn't feel as good or fleshed out as a fighting game character that's being designed with a singular defined moveset and playstyle. Don't get me wrong, the more I played this game, the more I did warm up to it. There's always going to be something satisfying about two big robots smacking each other around, especially when one of them is a samurai and the other is a dinosaur. But it'll never be a fighting game that you'll play for the combat itself, and without good combat, there's nothing to really keep you sticking around for more than just an hour or two of curiosity. It's a shame because if I was to rank all five of Paradox's PS1 fighting games, this one I'd unfortunately have to put at the bottom. And while I initially expected this to be the worst of the bunch, what I didn't expect is for this game to actually have some of the boldest and most experimental ideas of any fighting game on the system which makes its failings all the more disappointing. The wheel will provide. Next up, we're going to take a look at Hybrid, a game with a pretty interesting history. Hybrid comes from a development studio called Motive Time. Now, as far as I can tell, these guys were based in the UK, and the only game of theirs that I'm familiar with is a pretty odd 3 game called Virtuoso. It's a third-person shooter where you play as this dog the bounty hunter looking dude. I've never played it myself, but believe me, I've seen tons of videos on it, and the general consensus is that it's surprisingly pretty good. Well, maybe just go by 3DO standards, I don't know. Anyway, using the engine made for Virtuoso, Motive Time's next project would end up being a game for the PlayStation called Hybrid. Although instead of being in third person, Hybrid would fall back on the more tried and tested first person shooter formula, bringing the PS1 another Doom style FPS. Although, here's where things get a little bit confusing. So, Mode of Time finished up Hybrid in 1997, and the game made its official release on the PlayStation. Although, for whatever reason, only in Japan. You would imagine this UK-made PlayStation-exclusive FPS would at the very least see a release in its home region, but down to what I can only imagine was a lack of a publisher deal or some other publishing-related issue, it just never did. Although in a weird twist of fate, Hybrid did somehow eventually manage to snag itself a release in the PAL region, only five years later, in 2002, and through the infamous Midas Gold series of budget PS1 titles. Now, as we've already mentioned on this channel, every now and then companies like Midas would opt to bring over low-budget Japanese titles to the West, usually as long as the localization efforts were pretty easy. Well, in this case, Midas have managed to import a UK-made FPS from Japan, so that it's now actually playable in its home country for the first time ever. Sure, maybe it's five years too late and they gave it some of the laziest box art you'll ever see, but yeah, it's here. Now we have to keep in mind, Hybrid was originally a 1997 release for the console. So as a game, it is a very 1997 experience. Shoot the enemies, collect the keys, press the switches, rinse and repeat until you finish the level. But does Hybrid offer any interesting ideas of its own? Well, let's find out. So Hybrid does have a story. Well, as long as you can read the game's incredibly fast text scrolling. Basically, the US government were experimenting with creating human-alien hybrids, with the government supposedly exchanging human bodies to other species in return for advanced technology. Yeah, that sounds believable to be fair. Well, as you'd imagine, that didn't go very well. So, fast forward into the future, where we're now part of a resistance fighting against hybrid alien-human fascists called the International Purity League. Yeah, let's just go with it. Now interestingly, Hybrid gives you not one, but four playable characters, all of which sporting this 
delightful deviant art-esque artwork. To give the game some variety, each of the characters have their own unique strengths and weaknesses. You can play as the cyborg George McKenzie, who can target enemies using this cool Robocop style green reticule. An ally alien, that's just named Alien. This guy is a little slower than the other characters, but he has more resistances as well. He also has this useless melee attack, but at least the starting weapon is pretty good. Brad Chesterfield is kind of your vanilla character, no real notable strengths or weaknesses, but he does gain access to some of the better weapons a little earlier in the game. And finally there's Akiko Tyler, the token anime character. She is by far my favourite character in the game, she starts with probably the worst gun in the whole game, but to make up for it she's the quickest, has the highest health and can also shoot a powerful fireball that uses a tiny bit of health as ammo. Well worth it in my opinion. Plus you can also get a good gun for her pretty much immediately into the first level by opening up the secret door located right behind you. So yeah, Akiko's the best. Each character also gets their own story segments before each mission with more amazing artwork which is very much appreciated. Text is still too damn fast though. Now as for the gameplay, well I'm sure this all looks pretty familiar to you. It's very much that classic Doom style boomer shooter gameplay but the game does opt for a blend of 2D and polygonal 3D graphics throughout. Your weapons, items and the HUD are all rendered as 2D sprites while the environments are all made using polygons. The enemies in the game are actually a mixture of 2D sprites and 3D models, but more often than not the enemies you'll be fighting will be big 3D boys. Some much bigger than others mind you. The game uses the default early 90s first person shooter control scheme. D-pad controls your forward and back movement as well as rotations, L1 and R1 lets you strafe left and right, and all your other commands including jumping, shooting and interacting are all on the face buttons. You can also look up and down while holding R2, but thankfully the game does automatically adjust your height when aiming, even if it looks a little bit wonky while doing it. Honestly the game itself, as long as you're down with old school FPS control schemes on console, it doesn't control too bad. I'm not going to say it's very good as it does feel a little stiffer than some console FPS games. The turning in particular is much too slow for my liking. It can make lining up shots on quicker enemies a bit of a nightmare. But look when you've got yourself some good weapons, some big targets and tons of ammo, shooting things does feel good and some of the weapons here have a really nice punch to them as well. The game's weapons once again stick very closely to that Doom formula. You've got five different ammo types that are usable with a pretty big roster of weapons. They all mostly fit that pistol, shotgun, machine gun, plasma, rocket launcher mold, but there's usually a few different variations of each type of weapon, giving the game more options than your usual FPS. It is a shame that they don't often feel that much different from one another, but the added variety is nice. My personal favourite weapon is the Arasako DF2 Fletchet Launcher, which I'm going to say is this game's version of the Super Shotgun. It kills standard enemies with one hit, knocks them back and makes even most of the robot enemies explode on impact. Very, very nice. So look, so far so good for Hybrid, right? Well, in what I'm sure is a surprise to no one, Hybrid does in fact have some pretty big issues. For one on the visual front, Hybrid has a whole host of problems. It's a very, very dark game. Hybrid knows this and it has a whole item dedicated to helping you brighten up rooms a little bit. I don't know if the idea here was to show off some cool lighting effects as you and your enemies gunshots can light up rooms and there's plenty of light switches all around. But for the majority of the game, the vision is very, very limited. Beyond what you'd expect from normal draw distance limitations, it's more so just dark by design. Although a reason for this might be the hide this game's incredibly bland environments. This might be one of the most uninspired FPS games I've played in terms of environmental design. It doesn't matter what level you're on, it is guaranteed to be very, 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 very grey. For every cool or unique part of the level that you'll find, the remaining 95% is gonna be grey. Hybrid, putting it simply, isn't a very good looking game. But hey, maybe it runs well at least. Well, uh, I mean you're seeing emotion, what do you think? Now, in fairness to Hybrid, we're looking at a 3D FPS from 1997, but also now in the PAL format. So the game itself actually isn't running too unlike comparable FPS games from the era, but still you'll be looking at a cool 15 to 17 frames per second on average during your playthrough. Although credit where credit is due, the game did remain smooth and stable throughout the majority of my playtime. Now look, the visuals and performance are something that I can take or leave as long as the game itself is fun, 
But unfortunately, in spite of Hybrid's somewhat decent shooting gameplay and controls, the game has a few more roadblocks in your way. Enemies in this game are fine for the most part. You'll of course come across your standard robot grunts, a few tricky hybrid enemies, and some more dangerous elite enemies from time to time. All of these are fine, but unfortunately the most annoying enemy in this game is also the most common. These little things are known as spheres. These guys on their own are really nothing more than a nuisance. They don't really do much damage, they die quickly. What's the problem? Well, they move very very erratically, which in a game with good aiming wouldn't be an issue. But in a game with very slow turning on the d-pad, they are a nightmare to kill. You will waste so much ammo trying to kill these guys that you end up despising them within the first hour of gameplay. And every new level in the game is delighted to start packing more and more of these into big arenas for you to deal with. You'll be fighting deadly enemies with about 20 of these other things zooming by you, tricking your auto aim into going up, down and all over the place. It is a nightmare. Did I also mention they add in big machines that spawn them infinitely until they are destroyed? It can become a mess. Also, it's one of those games where if you die, you start the level with no weapons, and honestly, some of these levels begin with so many of these sphere enemies at the start that it can feel impossible to even get your footing. Difficulty is another interesting topic, as the game starts off pretty easy, but by the fourth level or so, the game's difficulty curve just goes through the roof. I actually had to quit and try change the game to easy, but it turns out the default difficulty actually was easy. So there you go. Although my main issue with this game, and the one that turns me off more than anything, is actually just a personal problem. This game is low budget PS1 Hexen. Now I'm sure some of you are familiar with Hexen, it was basically Doom in the Dark Ages, it came from Raven Software, and also received a port on the PlayStation. Hexen shares a few things in common with Hybrid. For example, Hybrid's character system seems to be a take on the same one featured in Hexen, allowing you to choose from three different styles of gameplay. Now this feature I quite like in both games, but the reason I dislike Hexen is because its levels are giant maze-like maps filled with an obnoxious amount of switches and keys to find. It is a game about being lost, wandering endlessly through the same areas over and over again, praying that you find a key or a switch that you missed the first four or five times true. Well, Hybrid is also like this. The game has massive maps full of different keys and switches to find. One switch might open a door halfway across the map. Then that door will give you another switch and then that door will give you another switch. And this can go on for about 40 to 50 minutes until the level just eventually ends. It is a good thing that this game has a decent auto mapper, otherwise I would have been lost forever in some of these levels. Now I get that this isn't technically bad game design, some people may like big maps and the pixel hunting that goes involved with them, but I really, really do not, and at least in Hexen you can save anywhere. If you die 35 minutes into a level of hybrid, well you're back to the beginning with no weapons, so it is a nightmare. So yeah, Hybrid, it's kind of a mixed bag to say the least. It's a pretty competent PS1 FPS with some fun gameplay, less than stellar visuals, annoying enemies and some design choices that, let's just say, aren't my cup of tea. Although at least one thing I can fault in the game is the sound. Each of the levels have their own unique music tracks and considering how long some of these levels are, I never found myself getting sick of any of them throughout. The soundtrack is nothing groundbreaking by any means, but it's very catchy and suits the atmosphere of the game really well. I liked it a lot. Each of the characters also have these goofy voice lines that they spout out all the time. I'd say these are certainly an acquired taste, but I honestly never got sick of hearing these whenever they popped up. Come and get it. Great! <laughs> Excellent. Toys for the boys. 
I suppose for those curious, we might as well take a quick look at the Japanese version as well. Other than the text scroll being the correct speed this time around, the game itself is completely unchanged from its PAL counterpart content-wise. Of course, this version sees a bump in the frame rate to around 17 to 19 frames per second on average, which does make the game smoother, but not by a whole lot. Although, I did notice that this version had more severe slowdown in some of the more densely populated areas, so maybe the PAL version is actually the more stable of the two? Who knows? This version does also have the English voice lines though, which is pretty funny. Oh, toys for the boys. So yeah, that's Hybrid, a very obscure and interesting tale of how a UK FPS eventually made a home. But as for the game itself, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's a budget Doom clone that mostly copies ideas from other games to various degrees of success. The gameplay itself can be fun and entertaining for a while, and I'm unironically a big fan of the characters and story artwork, but there's a few annoying design choices that I think let the game down and really prevent it from being anything more than an interesting curiosity for fans of console boomer shooters. Still, if you want to check it out, the PAL version does usually go for pennies these days, probably due to the box art looking like this, I guess. Either way, you could certainly do a whole lot worse. will provide. The next game in today's lineup is Aeronauts, making its way to the PlayStation in 1999 and I hope you're not sick of that PAL frame rate cause this time we've got a PAL exclusive on our hands. Hardcore fans of the channel might remember me trying a demo of this game during one of my live streams. Opinions on the game were mixed, but let's just say I was intrigued enough to want to try the full thing someday. And I guess the wheel was listening because here we are a short while later full thing in hand. Thanks wheel. On development duty this time around, we got the team at Red Lemon Studios, a Scottish studio made up of ex-Gremlin Interactive staff who mostly seem to focus on licensed movie tie-ins across the PC and PS1 for the duration of their relatively short life as a studio. Of course, Aeronauts here is the outlier, being their one and only original IP, as well as their debut game as a studio. So let's see if that initial intrigue from the demo was warranted and find out if it's actually any good. I suppose a good place to start would be explaining what Aeronauts is, because as you may have noticed by now, this game is kind of, uh, odd. The game takes place in some sort of steampunk dystopian future where prisoners are randomly selected to take part in some sort of, uh, flying blood sport. Once selected, these prisoners become what's known as Aeronauts, and using their weird jet-propelled, uh, hang glider things, you're gonna complete challenges across many of the world's most treacherous prisons which have also conveniently been converted into tightly packed arenas suited to just such an event. Quite the concept, I've gotta say, but the people watching at home, they seem to enjoy it, so at least you can't argue with the ratings. But as far as the story content goes, this opening here is about all that you're gonna get. Now, initially, I thought this game was gonna be some sort of flying twisted metal. You've got weird characters, guns, and battle arenas. Seems like a no-brainer, right? Well, surprisingly, Aeronauts turned out to be something quite different. What we have here is actually Pilot Wings, but with guns. Well, it's also a little like Twisted Metal, but Pilot Wings is for sure this game's main inspiration. Once you learn how to fly in the game's training mode, which I actually only discovered for the first time after I'd already beaten the game, well, you're ready to dive right in. 
So Aeronauts begins with you selecting from one of eight different characters. Each character has variants of the same weapons, a reliable rapid fire shot, your ever dominant homing missiles, and there's also a bunch of special weapons you can pick up that give you things like shields, big lasers, and crazy buffs to your machine guns. Now while the weapons are generally the same across each character, the stats on the other hand can vary widely in terms of speed, maneuverability, armor and overall damage. Maybe you want a fast flyer or somebody with lots of armor. Maybe you just want to play as Honk the Clown. I don't mind. You do you. Once you're into the game, you'll see this big old grid going all the way down the screen. This grid represents each individual challenge in the game and we've got a grand total of 50 to conquer if we want to make it to the illustrious grand final. These events come in a number of different shapes and sizes. You've got non-combat orientated challenges like races, stunt ring challenges and switch hunting. But if you like blowing stuff up, there's plenty for you here too with the likes of mine detonation, drone hunting and protection missions. During each stage of the campaign, you'll travel to a new arena and are then tasked with beating four different challenges that you can complete in any order. The challenges themselves are kind of bite-sized, usually taking anywhere from a couple of seconds to three or four minutes at most. Once you beat all four of the challenges in an arena, you then get to enter a one-on-one -on -one fight with the Lord of the Arena, and if you can conquer them, you get to move on to the next arena and the next set of challenges. Another fun addition to this game is its upgrade system. Throughout the different challenges, you can collect these wing icons from enemies, item boxes, and just doing well during the challenges. Once you clear all of the challenges in a section, you can then use your accumulated wings to upgrade one of four different things. Lives, armor, speed, and weapons. Armor, speed, and weapons are pretty self-explanatory, but lives... Yeah, this game also has lives. If you fail a challenge or get destroyed mid-level, you lose a life, lose all of your lives, and then you're back to the very beginning, or your last save point at least. These upgrades become pretty important as the game goes on, offering significant buffs to your character, so you'll want to earn lots of these and spend them wisely. So I guess you can probably see why this game comes across as pilot wings with guns. It's mostly just a collection of bite-sized flying challenges, and while there is plenty of shooting involved, really the main focus of this game is to test your flying skills. You see, the arenas in this game are actually quite small. You could easily fly from one end to the other in just a matter of seconds, but what the arenas lack in circumference, they make up for in sheer verticality, incorporating lots of little nooks and crannies hidden across multiple levels of the arenas, giving them more depth than what you'd think. It's actually quite clever because you have big potential for interesting flight patterns and enemy layouts while also keeping the play area itself quite small, allowing there to be more on screen at once with practically zero draw distance limitations whatsoever. Now when you're starting out the game, you're going to play through the first four arenas. These opening arenas I'm going to say are like the training levels of the game. I know I just said earlier I accidentally skipped the training, but they did actually feel like a nice introduction to the game and its maps. Although I was thinking that they were maybe a little too easy for their own good, but thankfully it turns out the first four stages of the competition is the game's normal mode, with the final six stages seeing you replaying the previous four areas again with new, harder challenges, and then unlocking two more extra difficult arenas to take on. Once the game entered hard mode, this is where I really started to enjoy it. Challenges were much longer, the maps were littered with enemies, and now you have an AI rival chasing you and harassing you across the entire map. It never felt overly tough, but whether you were flying through rings or taking out drones, the events were always challenging and engaging. Plus the arenas that you previously played through now have this ominous dark skybox to emphasize that extra danger. Now even though you've got 50 different challenges in the game, you will see a lot of the challenges begin to repeat themselves throughout. It doesn't help that many of the challenges are just slight variations on the same thing, like hunting and shooting barrels or hunting and shooting drones. But I think the main reason I enjoyed this game as much as I did came down to one thing and one thing only. The flying itself. Aeronauts uses a pretty simple arcade style flying model where you can boost by pressing square or slow down by using the circle button. Plus you can use the L1 and R1 buttons to take sharper turns or do loop-de-loops and barrel rolls if you like. That's about all there is to it. Nothing complex or fancy here, but credit to Red Lemon on this one. The control is just so responsive and easy to master that it makes flying a dream. And in a game that is all about flying challenges, to have flying be the star of the show, that's what you love to see. Flying through rings? Great. Searching out little nooks and crannies? Great. If you need to make a precise maneuver or quickly change direction? No problem, the aeronauts have got you. Obviously this maneuverability does vary from character to character and it has been 
eclipsed by newer games in the years since, but for the PS1, this is some of the best flight control I've seen on the console. It's the one thing this game needed to nail, and it absolutely did it with style. Now look, so far it's been mostly glowing praise for this game, but let's reduce the altitude a little bit and take things back down to earth, because for all this game does right, it does have some notable problems too. For one, the game visually is just all over the place. Gameplay here is super hectic and busy. There is oftentimes so much on screen that it can be a nightmare trying to make things out. And the ever reliable 16 to 17 frames per second PAL frame rate really ain't making things any better. Now look, the game itself, it does look decent on the graphics and technical end and the frame rate, as rough as it is on the eyes, is stable at the very least. It's just during the gameplay, it can feel like it's a bit much on the eyes sometimes. Also, I am sorry, but these character designs, I can appreciate the style and aesthetic they were going for with these guys, but they are not my cup of tea at all. Even Honk the Clown. Sorry Honk fans, I'm just more of a doink guy, what can I say? Although I do like this health bar at the very least, because I mean, look at it. Just make sure not to lose any health though, because then things start going south pretty fast. Look, I think Aeronauts is a technically competent game that is pretty at times, but also very ugly, if that makes any sense. Also, while I generally enjoyed each and every one of the challenge levels present in the game, the 1v1 battles on the other hand are very, very bad. The problem here comes down to the opponent's AI. You see, the AI in this game is both too good and mind-numbingly stupid. Ideally, in a dogfight, you'd want to maneuver around your opponent and chase them from behind, right? Well, the AI in this game, it just won't let you do that. It will circle you forever and just begin to chase you from behind no matter what. Any traditional attempts to fight these guys will be met with severe frustration, so I don't recommend doing that. Instead, you can beat every opponent in this game by just hovering slowly in one position and rotating around to shoot the enemy. For whatever reason, the AI just shits the bed whenever you begin to do this. It has no idea how to counter somebody sitting still, so no matter what point you are at the game, this will work 100% of the time, every time. Now this may seem cheap and lazy, but believe me, if you did these fights properly, you'd probably end up quitting the game before the end. They are that bad. On the flip side though, if you beat all of the game's challenges, you get to take part in the game's only good combat challenge, an 8 person free for all inside a football stadium. Surprisingly, adding more opponents into the mix actually alleviates the issues of 1v1 fights, as the AI then tries to focus on other pilots and it now just becomes hectic, stupid fun. It is a crying shame that this is the only point in the game that you can fight like this, but it is a fun and stupid way to close out the main game. Also, we haven't talked about the music in this game yet, but since it is a European game, you better believe the music is great. It's a very of the era electronic soundtrack with a bit of rock thrown in as well, but there is not a bad track in this whole game. I bring this up now because the final stage called Alcajaz has by far one of the best tracks in the game club PlayStation level contender over here. Seriously, this soundtrack is a nice hidden gem on the console. You know if the videos on YouTube have less than a thousand views and the only comment is from me, you've struck gold. It's also worth mentioning the game's announcer as well, who you're gonna either love or hate, but he is very, very strange. I personally couldn't get enough. Just cool ice. What can I say? Overall, I had a good time with this one. It starts out a bit slow, but by the time you make it to the hard levels, the game really begins to shine. I don't think it will be everybody's cup of tea, but if you like skill-based flying games and bite-sized challenges, well then I think you'll dig it. As mentioned, it's not a strong game visually, um, at all, and the 1v1 battles are definitely a low point, even if you can cheese them in no time. It's also not great for replayability either, you've got 50 total challenges and one big final battle to play through, but doing that only takes a little over 2 hours, and guess what? Outside of the training mode, this is the only mode in the game. No free battles, time trials, not even any multiplayer. This is strictly bite-sized skill-based challenges only. And maybe worst of all, there's seemingly nothing to unlock either. No characters, no arenas, outside of trying a new character, that's about all there is to it. 
definitely not the most content rich experience. But if you can overcome all of that, Aeronauts offers up some fun and challenging arcade flight action, great music, some of the butteriest flight controls on the system, and of course, our boy, the man, the myth, the legend, Honk the Clown. See, it's more good than bad. Why? Detonator. Get a move on. will provide Our final game and viewer selection for Volume 8 is The Raven Project, another PAL exclusive making its way to the PlayStation in late 1996. This game was added to the wheel by Doma, so big congrats on being the wheel's chosen. Well, I wonder what kind of game Doma has in store for me today. Oh no. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Cryo again, and not just any Cryo PlayStation game. I believe this is their very first of come out on the console. To be honest, I didn't expect to see a cryo game again so soon after Dreams and the Odyssey that was Pax Corpus, but at least regardless of quality, we're probably in for something interesting at the very least, so let's get right into it. Now, similarly to Dreams, The Raven Project was first released on home computers, coming out a whole year before the PlayStation version. There's actually not a lot of footage online for this PC version of The Raven Project from what I can tell, but as you can see, the game seems to be a mixture of 3D space shooter with some FMV rail shooter segments. The gameplay actually seems to be very similar to the Star Wars Rebel Assault series of games. I don't know if The Raven Project took much influence here, but it was definitely the first thing that popped into my mind. Now, unlike Star Wars Rebel Assault 2, which also saw a PS1 port that's pretty faithful to the PC original, the PS1 version of the Raven Project pulled a Dreams again, where on the PS1, we seem to have a totally different game built from the ground up, but still uses the cutscenes and music from the PC original. What we have here is more of a traditional spaceflight sim on the PS1. You fly one of many different spacecraft around the 3D environment, shooting at various different 3D enemies. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you may even get to pilot a land-based vehicle like a walker or a mech. It's a tried and tested formula that's been done to great success on the PS1, as we've already seen with the likes of Blast Radius and Colony Wars. But you gotta keep in mind, the Raven Project is both a pretty early release in the PlayStation's lifecycle, and it's also a cryo game. So Colony Wars, this is not. Hell, it ain't even Warhawk. The Raven Project is a whole other beast altogether. Now, as you'd imagine, this is a single player only affair, with our goal being to play through the game's 28 different missions across five chapters. There is a story here, but don't you worry, we'll get to that. Missions in this game are usually broken up into one or two categories, kill every enemy on the map or fly to every objective on the map. These missions can sometimes be mixed up by adding things like having to defend an ally ship or instead of flying to a satellite, you could be flying to a ring instead. But fundamentally, the mission variety here is very, very limited. Missions can take anywhere from about 5 minutes to 30 seconds, and the amount of repetition throughout this game's runtime is mind-blowing. You could play three different missions in the same location with the same objectives three times in a row, to the point where you start thinking that you've restarted the previous mission by mistake. Now, to the game's credit, it does mix things up on rare occasion, with two of the missions seeing you need to move slowly through some enemy bases, and one mission where you need to fly through a series of rings in order. Jesus, big episode for rings, isn't it? 
But even with the odd change from the usual mission dynamic, not one of these 28 missions would I consider good. Of course, that's not down to the mission design alone. Frankly, that is the least of this game's worries. You see, the Raven Project plays like absolute dirt. Never have I played a game where the mission begins and you're immediately going at full speed crashing into an asteroid. So the controls themselves are actually really straightforward and simple. D-pad controls your movement, R1 and R2 control your speed, X to fire, and there you go, that's about all there is to it. No extra movement controls, no rotations, no flips. Nice and simple is the aim of the game here. Although the thing is, every single vehicle in this game has two speeds, really slow, and way too fucking fast. When I first started this game, I was going all over the place, and a few missions in, nothing really changed. I found it really hard to ever get your speed in the right place to actually approach enemies. I'd usually fly right by them or just crash right into them, and rarely did I ever even get a chance to react thanks to the game's abysmal draw distance. This is present across pretty much every vehicle in the game, and there's maybe five or six in total, but whether you're walking on land or you're up in space dogfighting, the control is just all over the place. Now, as the game went on, I did eventually get used to it. By the final few missions, I actually had a pretty good mastery over the controls as a whole and was able to breeze through the final missions, but I could never hold my hand on my heart and say that it's good. It's really, really bad. But the movement is only half the battle. The shooting is actually my biggest pet peeve with this game. For whatever reason, this game relies on a weird lock-on system that's activated by pressing the circle button. Every time you press it, the target rotates clockwise through every enemy on the field. It points you in the direction and then highlights them making for an easy kill. Or so you would think. The first problem is your weapons will only fire in the direction of the locked on enemy. So for example, if you're facing one enemy directly ahead of you and you've locked onto an enemy on your left, the bullets will shoot off to the left towards the targeted enemy, missing both enemies completely. Now you might just say, well, why don't you target the enemy in front of you? Well, you see, there's no way to target your nearest enemy. You just have to go through every single one, one by one, until you target the enemy you want. By then, you've already likely flown by onto a new enemy. But Sean, I hear you say, why don't you just not use the target lock and try aim freehand with your shots? Well, unfortunately, I can't. Once the target lock is up, there's no way to get rid of it. And if you manage to somehow not have a target lock, simply shooting any enemy, automatically brings it back up, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mess. Of course, compounding this already frustrating design choice, the lock-on doesn't even work that well. I swear, the only way you can hit enemies in this game is if you are directly in front of them or directly behind them. It doesn't matter if you are circling, above, below, to the sides, whatever, you will probably just miss. It doesn't matter if your target reticule is on them, the bullets will just go wherever the hell they want to go. Maybe your bullets will just cross over one another, because that was the style at the time. Now, if you can get used to the game's controls, its frustrating combat and lock-on system, and also the fact that it's almost impossible to play the game outside of the first-person view due to them not giving you a target reticule in third person, well then you can probably get through the game just fine. Except for the fact that all of its missions are also terrible. Okay, so we are being a bit hard on the Raven project here. Let's talk about a few things that I did like about the game. I actually quite dig the very mid-90s UI we got going on here. The pre-mission briefings have these fun mini-map effects, and the transitions from screen to screen I found charming in a weird way. Also, the weapon system is kind of interesting, letting you choose from a variety of different types prior to every mission, and also letting you customize the arsenal to your liking, assuming you only use up the crafts allotted space. It's a shame that only about two of these weapons are actually useful, but yeah, you know, it's a nice effort at least. As for the presentation, it's uh, well, the music is kind of good. Probably the least interesting soundtrack I've heard in a cryo game so far, but there are some catchy songs here and some really, really odd ones too. The rest of the sound, however, 
whoever decided to pack this game full of alarms and make it so that you can hear your ally ships whenever it gets damaged well thank you for the pounding headache i really really appreciate it and the visuals i mean look all these maps are fundamentally the same as one another if it's on the surface the draw distance is beyond abysmal and whatever geometry is there well it's let's just say it's not looking so hot space on the other hand is well it's space it's not a very attractive take on space but it's space the positive here is that the draw distance is a little bit better a little they also added asteroids for a level or two at the very end to mix things up so you know that was an attempt the ship and enemy models are also not very nice but they aren't the worst that i've ever seen probably the thing they put the most effort into really so yeah that's a little positive i guess you could say and as for performance well we're sitting in 15 to 25 frames per second pal territory with many a bout of slowdown throughout although oddly in the space section sometimes the frame rate fluctuates wildly upwards to 50 frames per second when there's no enemies on screen and you can tell very quickly that the game was not designed to run at this speed it looks like i'm speeding up the gameplay here but no this just actually happens from time to time so yeah as a game the raven project Probably the worst PS1 game of its style that I've played on the console. I really wasn't expecting much to be fair, but this time around we don't even get to experience some of that charming cryo weirdness that makes even their worst games still offer up some entertainment value. But hold up, there's still some hope. You see the Raven Project actually comes on two discs, believe it or not. And if your game has more than one disc, you better believe the game is packed with some serious FMV. And what if I told you that the Raven Project doesn't just contain a whole bunch of FMV, but it also contains live action cutscene. Maybe there's still hope for this game after all, but it turns out no, not really. So the live action scenes. As you probably know by now, I am a sucker for anything live action in my 90s video games. I can literally not get enough of it. And when I first started this game, I knew I was in for a treat. I mean, the game literally shows you this guy within the first few seconds of the game. How could you not be intrigued? This stuff right here is why I decided to beat the game. Every boring mission, every frustrating section, I knew I needed all of this that I could get. And you know what? Even this stuff is kind of boring too. How do you make this boring? Granted, there are still some absolute gems from time to time, but the majority of the live action scenes meet this midpoint of mildly competent acting and really uninteresting script that is neither entertaining or funny. Really the only interesting parts are the antagonists, and there is unfortunately not enough of them. Too many of the scenes are just boring military jargon between your allies, and it's just so, so dull. I honestly didn't even really get where the story was going. I believe aliens rule the earth and you're part of a resistance trying to take them down while the aliens and pro-alien humans are trying to take you down. Frankly, the plot is all over the place and many of the plot lines don't even match up with the missions. It's clear these are here to lead you into the PC versions levels, but here it's just a totally unrelated mission altogether. Sometimes the cutscenes cut out before they're even finished and the subtitles can also be cut off from the left of the screen. It's just not good. Worse yet, the majority of the FMV in this game are actually just CGI scenes of your ship. And my god, I have never seen so many different clips of the same thing framed in different ways. Here's you taking off. Here's you landing. Here's you taking off. Here's you landing. You're flying over here. You're flying over there. Rarely does anything ever happen in any of these scenes. No dialogue, no action. I promise you the majority of the space on these two discs are clips of you taking off and landing from different angles. It is insane. All right, so I bet you're probably wondering what the end of a game like this could be. I kept thinking to myself, maybe the ending would be worth the pain. So I powered through. The game only takes about two hours to beat anyway, but it is a long, long two hours. But sure look, here's the ending. Military genius is something one is born with, Ishtul. It cannot be learned. Yes, Lord. This is my destiny.
okay? No. I have won a great victory. Yeah, so the uh, the ending froze. I tried it again and froze again. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up. The Raven Project is not good. Don't let the two discs fool you. This is a shallow game devoid of content and substance. Aggressively unfun from start to finish and possibly one of the worst games I have ever played to completion and I didn't even get to see the goddamn ending. What's annoying is that the PC version of this game actually got some decent reviews back in the day. I really don't understand why Cryo didn't attempt to properly bring over the PC version to the PS1 because LucasArts show that it can be done with Rebel Assault 2. Instead, what we got was Cryo's first failed experiment for the PS1, and for my money, probably the worst one that they've ever created. So bad, even actors in Halloween masks can't save it, and that is a damn shame. Oh, well that is a shame. We'll all miss you, Jeff. There's something I must do first. <laughs> job. I ride the bus, roll up my sleeves with the hoi polloi. But at night, I live a life of exhilaration. Of missed heartbeats and adrenaline. And, if the truth be known, a life of dubious virtue. I won't deny I've been engaged in violence, even indulged in it. I have assailed adversaries, and not merely in self-defence. I've exhibited disregard for life, limb, and property savoured every moment. You may not think it to look at me. But I have commanded armies. And conquered worlds. And though in achieving these things, I have set morality aside. I have no regrets. For though I've led a double life, at least I can say, I have lived. The wheel will provide. First up, we have everybody's favourite French-speaking cowboy, it's Lucky Luke, making his debut on the PlayStation in November of the year 1998, courtesy of Ocean and Infogrames. For those unaware, Lucky Luke is a very popular European comic book character, created by the Belgian cartoonist Morris in 1946. The series is both an homage and parody of classic American westerns, and like other influential French language comics such as Tintin and Asterix and Obelix, the series was a massive success, going beyond its native France and Belgium, with the character seeing long-lasting international success all across the globe to this very day. That means beyond the comics, we have a ridiculous number of movies, both animated and live action, TV series, plenty of spin-offs, and of course, a bunch of video games too. And while the character's history in video games dates all the way back to Tiger electronic devices in the early 80s, some home computer releases, and even what might be one of the best Philips CDI exclusives, today we're going to be taking a look at the character's debut in 3D, and if the back of the box is anything to go by, the first 3D cowboy game, uh, ever. 
You know, oddly enough, I think they might actually be telling the truth about that one. I, for the life of me, can't think of a polygonal 3D cowboy game that's come out prior to this game. If anybody knows of one, please let me know. And no, Mad Dog McCree isn't 3D. And no, this isn't a thinly veiled excuse for me to play Mad Dog McCree clips. Now before we dig in, I should also mention that Lucky Luke was somebody's selection on the viewer wheel. So today, we've got the very rare and illustrious default winner. So come on everybody, give it up for triples. What are the odds? Probably quite low I'd imagine, but either way, congrats. Default, default, default. So what type of game is Lucky Luke? I guess the easy answer is that it's a 2.5D action platformer. You got your running, you got your gunning, you got your jumping, and you got your uh, punching. Although, truthfully, I feel a more apt term to describe Lucky Luke is that it's a variety platformer. While there are plenty of levels that follow a basic gameplay blueprint, the goals and mechanics oftentimes switch from level to level, and sometimes that blueprint also gets thrown out the window and it can feel like we're playing an entirely different game. And while it's certainly not uncommon for video game platformers especially to mix things up gameplay and objective wise level to level, Lucky Luke does this pretty much the whole way through the game, making for quite a varied experience. But does all this experimentation end up being a good thing? Well, let's find out. So Lucky Luke is pretty much your standard single player only experience. You play through a series of levels one by one until you reach the end of the game, all held together by a simple story, which boils down to bad guys escape from prison, so now it's up to you to catch them and send them back to prison. Outside of a few CGI cutscenes and some minor voiced in-game cutscenes, the story doesn't really aim to be anything more than a bit of fluff to keep the game moving from one scene to the next. As for the gameplay itself, well, as we mentioned, Lucky Luke tends to jump around from one style to the next quite regularly, but the majority of the time you will be playing the game in this traditional 2.5D style. The gameplay here is pretty much like any old platformer from the 80s and 90s. You've got a button to run, you can duck and jump, and you can also fire your six shooter in a variety of different directions around your character. Outside of that, you can also drop some dynamite, but these are limited and mostly are used to clear objects in your path and also gain access to bonus items. Speaking of items, the game does give you a variety of them to collect, the major one being these dollar signs, which can be used in a shop at the end of the level to either buy extra lives or you can spend a decent chunk to reveal a password so you can return later on. Oh yeah, this game doesn't have memory card saves by the way, so paying for the privilege of a password is the only option you've got. Or you could just check the internet, so plenty of lives it is. Rounding out the items, we have Sheriff Stars, which heal up Luke's health, denoted by the number of wooden boards behind the character's head in the top left. It was about half an hour into the game before I noticed this was the health bar, by the way. And finally, there's these bonus bees, which bring you to one of the game's three different bonus levels for the chance to earn even more money. But we'll get to those in a moment. Now, where Lucky Luke starts to get interesting is how it changes as the game goes on. The game's early levels often require nothing more than walking from left to right. You shoot a few enemies, you blow up a few objects, you do a bit of platforming. Nice and easy. But as the game goes on, you start noticing, hey, this level isn't letting me use my gun for some reason, or this level might be a giant maze full of different doors that spit you out somewhere completely new on the map, or it's now a big open level that requires you to find a certain number of items to progress. The platforming levels in Lucky Luke feel like a mishmash of various types of games from the 16-bit era. You've got your traditional linear platformer, your big maze-like platformer where you've got to hunt down a bunch of items, and sometimes it even feels a little bit like Sunset Riders as well, because why not? That game rules. But while these platforms platforming levels take up the majority of the game's runtime. In between, you've also got levels where you'll be riding on a horse, jumping over hazards, or maybe you'll take on a lumberjack in a series of strongman contests. How about a saloon-style fighting game, or even a Wild West rail shooter? No, not that one. The variety even extends over to the bonus games as well, with three in total ranging from even more shooting minigames to arm wrestling your horse or a game of cards. As you can see, Lucky Luke is very much a variety platformer, and at the very least, it's nice to be constantly getting these new gameplay elements to try out, whether it's changes to the structure of the platforming levels or just something brand new and out of left field. And while I think this is probably one of the game's strongest selling points, I think this is also where the game kinda drops the ball a little bit too. Lucky Luke is a game that I had a fun time with, but it's often a game of highs and lows. For every level that I enjoyed, there was often a level that I found kind of boring, confusing, or just might have outright given me brain damage. 
This might just be down to personal taste, but the more linear platforming levels I had a fun time with. Tricky platforming hazards enemies to react to, that's my jam. On the other hand, big levels where you have to hunt down items separated by a maze of doors and insta-kill pits, that is not my jam. This is also compounded by Luke being a rather stiff character to control. He's certainly functional, but it's the kind of game where your speed and timing can easily lead to quick, easy deaths, so longer levels that require a lot of exploring and backtracking can become a bit taxing. And as the game goes on, it also relies on these type of levels more often, and they end up just kind of becoming a bit of a drag, really. You know when you're hoping for a level to end, something ain't right. Although at the very least, once you beat a level, you're usually guaranteed a nice palette cleanser, but unfortunately, these also vary a bit in quality too. While the horse level is pretty fun, the fighting and shooter levels unfortunately feel a bit half-baked for me, just a little too simple and brainless for my liking, and the others usually just involve button bashing, which, you know, is button bashing, so your mileage may vary. Although, we gotta talk about this minecart level specifically. Now, minecart levels, they're no stranger to video games, often with a reputation for being difficult. But I gotta say, this is by far the hardest minecart level I have ever experienced in a game. Up until this point, I thought I was being cheeky with my big pile of 20 lives. Why would I need more than 20 lives, I asked myself. How could I possibly die 20 times? Well, the answer to that question is the fucking minecart level. It's not just that you need incredibly fast reaction times. It's not just that you're up against a strict timer. It's not just that you have to remember where the switches are located. And it's not just that you need almost pixel perfect timing on some of these jumps. But you've got to dodge about 40 of these instant death hazards before you even see the first checkpoint for the level. Seriously, the combined difficulty of the entire rest of the game doesn't compare to this one level. It is wild. I should probably also mention these boss battles against the Dalton gang, but these are probably the least interesting part of the game really. But hey, they don't want to make you tear your hair out, so that's good. So yeah, Lucky Luke, kind of a mixed bag on the gameplay front, but how about the game's presentation? Well, as you can see, the game goes for a sort of 3D cel-shaded comic style for the characters and level geometry, but also mixes some flat 2D stuff for additional characters and objects as well. There doesn't seem to be much consistency to this, with enemies and characters jumping from 2D to 3D all the time, and while it certainly can look a bit rough and unpolished nowadays, I think it represents the source material quite well, and the bright colours used throughout the main game add a nice bit of charm. Although seriously, whoever thought it was a good idea to make the bullets and projectiles this tiny? How am I supposed to see these coming at me in environments? What is this, a bullet for ants? Speaking of the environments and locales, I quite like these as well. They cover pretty much all the western classics from saloons to mines and even getting high with some Native Americans in the desert. You love to see it. Unfortunately, what you don't love to see is the game's inconsistent performance. Lucky Luke isn't exactly what I'd call a smooth experience from start to finish. Even when the game maintains a pretty consistent frame rate, it can just feel a little bit I don't know, jittery I guess is the right word to say. I don't know how well it comes across on screen, but it's something you just feel while playing. Thankfully I didn't find that it impacted the gameplay too much, but it is definitely far from ideal. On the other hand though, we have the game's sound, which, well, sound effects wise is fine. Gunshots and general effects are nice, but lack the punchiness I would like from a Wild West game. And while the narrator's dialogue sounds good, all the in-game characters and enemies sound very very odd. Oh, well. As for the music, well, how you feel about it is really going to come down to your personal taste on country music and blues, but for what it's worth, I don't think they really could have given this game a more fitting soundtrack when all is said and done. It's got really high quality recordings of various acoustic and electric guitar tracks that are relaxing, catchy, and are pure Americana. Definitely one of the game's highlights for sure.
So when it all comes down to it, Lucky Luke's 11 levels won't take you much longer than two hours to beat. And after some highs and lows, once you eventually reach the credits, would I say it was worth it? Eh, uh, maybe. Truthfully for me, this is what I would consider a straight down the middle game. Equal parts bad and equal parts good. Although I think overall as a platformer on the console, it just doesn't play well enough nowadays to really make this one worth going out of your way to play, unless you just happen to really like western themed games or Lucky Luke. That being said though, this isn't the only Lucky Luke game on the console, as a PAL exclusive follow up titled Lucky Luke Western Fever did launch on the console in 2001, so maybe if the wheel is feeling lucky, we might get to check this one out down the line at some point too. Until then, at least I'll continue to have this game's catchy guitar tune stuck in my head for a few more weeks at least, and that minecart level will probably haunt my nightmares for years to come, so that's nice. Next, we got NGen Racing making its way to the PlayStation in the summer of the year 2000. And the NGen isn't just a fun pun on engine, it is also an abbreviation of the game's full title, which is Next Generation Racing. Now, we've covered a lot of racing games on the channel so far, and even some flying based games, but I think this is the first time we've covered an aerial racing game. Now, of course, aerial racing games aren't all that uncommon, whether you're doing a bit of flying and Diddy Kong racing, or maybe playing a little bit of Freaky Flyers. It's certainly not an unusual path for a racing game to take. Hell, even Banjo got his own flying kart racer on the GBA, which is actually kind of weird when you think about it. But in the pantheon of aerial racers, I can't say I've played one before that featured a focus on jet planes. And considering how fast these things go, it's quite impressive somebody tried to tackle this on the PS1 of all things. Now, if you're wondering how a game like this might work, well, I guess the easiest way to explain it is imagine Wipeout meets Ace Combat, and well, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And I'm not just mentioning Wipeout because it's a very fast racer on the PS1. It turns out this game was the debut release from British studio Curly Monsters, a team made up of ex Signosis developers who had previously worked on the Wipeout series. Now, unfortunately, Curly Monsters would only ever make two games before shutting down, NGen Racing, of course, being their first, and their second was the Xbox exclusive Quantum Redshift, which definitely isn't just Wipeout on the Xbox. But let's ignore that for now, because it's time to see how Curly Monsters first effort fares all these years later. Now, normally when I talk about racing games, I usually run through the various modes first, but honestly, this game has a surprisingly large amount of content, so it's probably just better to start with the flying and racing itself so we know what's happening. In Engine Racing, you will pilot one of a variety of different jet planes, from stealth bombers to fighter jets. If it's up in the air and it goes fast, well, you can probably fly it in this game. The races see you competing against up to five AI opponents in what feels like a pretty traditional racing track layout, 
but with the added caveat of being in the air, which definitely adds an extra dimension to things. You still hold X to propel yourself forward and square to brake like many other racing games, but the rest of the controls feel more similar to your standard flight game, with the ability to control your pitch, yaw and roll. It's something that may take a little while to get used to, but if you're familiar with flight games, it should come to you quite naturally. The remaining buttons are for boosting and weapons. Boosting is relatively straightforward, you'll see these rings on the track while flying. The orange ones fill your boost meter, which allows you to boost by pressing the circle button. And the green rings, these restore your health, which is very handy if you crash into mountains a lot like I do, or tend to get hit by missiles quite often. Speaking of missiles, each plane also comes equipped with four different weapons, all of which are accessible from the very start of the race. You got your infinite machine gun, and there's also limited weapons like rockets, homing missiles, and defensive flares, which if equipped, automatically launch if your jet is in danger. And as you can see, if you're ever in first place, these are very, very useful. So gameplay wise, it's kind of what you'd come to expect from both a racing game and flight game of the time. But of course, combining these two elements together and making it work, well, you'd need the control to be snappy and responsive, and the good news is that they've pretty much nailed it. So when you start the game, you have access to a brief tutorial which explains all of the game's controls and mechanics to you. Although, interestingly, the game gives you the option of two different control schemes, Arcade Mode and Pro Mode. Now, Arcade Mode is pretty much the option you want to go for if you're either a beginner or you just want to pick up and play the game. Turning functions like most racing games, and you can also use the rudders on the shoulder buttons to take tight turns, almost like a sky drift. It feels very nice, it's user-friendly, and most importantly of all, it's fun to control. Now, the Pro Mode, on the other hand, eh, uh, well, let's just say the name is quite appropriate. This mode drastically changes how you're playing controls, and while I wouldn't exactly call it a simulation-style mode, it's definitely closer to the real thing than Arcade, most notably allowing you the ability to fully control your plane's roles. Now, if you're wondering why somebody might pick the Pro Mode controls over the more simple Arcade method, well, outside of wanting to have a more realistic flight experience, there's also bonus mechanics that you can only do in Pro Mode, the most notable of which is flying through health and boost rings upside down to gain double the amount. This means if you're serious about the game and want to be as fast as you possibly can be, this is the way to play. Now, I tried to learn pro mode, but holy shit, I was bad at it. Races I could destroy in arcade mode were a massive struggle in pro mode, so just for clarity, most of the gameplay you'll see today will be me using the arcade mode, which to its credit, didn't feel like an easy mode, nor did it feel like it limited me when I was winning any races, so either option is completely valid. It all just comes down to personal preference. And speaking of personal preference, the game also features four different viewpoints, two external views, and also a first-person view with or without the cockpit. And truthfully, all four of the views I found worked quite well. There's definite benefits to each, and once again, it all comes down to personal preference, but thankfully, no matter how you like to fly, the game delivers the goods. Also, I suppose you may have noticed these lights across the game's environments, and as you may have guessed, these essentially represent the game's track layout. Make sure to stick inside these things, and you really can't go wrong. But if you do fly out of them though, the game begins a 3 second countdown, and if this runs out, your plane enters an autopilot mode, which thankfully resets you back on the track, but quite slowly. So naturally, you'd want to avoid this whenever possible. Throughout the tracks, you'll also come across these checkpoints too, which are arguably the most important aspect of the races, because if you miss two of these checkpoints, you immediately get disqualified, which as you can imagine, is very bad. Now you see, what actually makes this game kinda cool, and is in my opinion the game's strongest aspect, is how you can kinda play with the game's rules to create shortcuts and optimize your racing. You see, if you leave the track, you get that 3 second countdown, right? But let's say you leave the track and re-enter a different part of the track in 2.9 seconds. Well then, nothing bad happens, and if you want, you can essentially abuse this to skip chunks of the race, saving you tons of time. Of course, what you can do is limited by how fast your plane can go, where do you have boost, and if there's a checkpoint coming up that you can't skip. But in many ways, it gives each track a huge amount of possible shortcuts that all feel very dynamic, making experimentation not only highly recommended, but really rewarding when you figure something out. Long story short, this game's pretty cool. So now that we've run through all of the core gameplay mechanics, now let's talk about the modes. So when you start the game, you'll have two different options on the menu, Arcade Mode 
and N-Gen mode. Arcade mode is where you can access things like two-player split-screen modes and the traditional championship mode that you'd expect from most racers. You select the championship, you do four races, and when you win, you unlock the next one. Now these four championships, Trainer, Fighter, S-Fighter, and X-Fighter, also represent the game's four speed classes. The higher you go, the faster your planes will go. Although interestingly, the Trainer class also prevents you from using weapons, which I think is a nice way to get people familiar with the flying controls, since using weapons while flying at high speeds definitely takes a bit more getting used to compared to other racing games. Also, to balance out the increased speed, each class ups the number of laps you'll need to complete on each track. Trainer is 3 laps, Fighter is 5 laps, S Fighter is 7, and X Fighter is 9. This may seem like a lot, but I really need to stress, you go very, very fast, so it really is for balancing more than anything. Now while the arcade mode has a lot to do and acts as a nice introduction to the game and its tracks, beating it fully uh, unlocks nothing, so you can almost entirely skip it if you want. This brings us to the game's major single player component, N-Gen mode. Now remember when I said this game has a lot of content? This mode is pretty much what I'm talking about. Here you're tasked with buying your own plane from a huge selection, entering it into races and championships, earning more cash so you can buy various upgrades and cosmetic changes so you can win more races, so you can then afford planes of a better class, which will then allow you to enter into more difficult and valuable races, and you basically just do this until you are filthy rich and nobody can stop you. And not only are there legitimately like 50 planes that you can purchase and upgrade here, the game has permit races similar to Gran Turismo's license challenges, it's got a bunch of time trials, reverse night versions of tracks that you can unlock, doubling the game's total track count from 14 to 28, and if you beat all the championships in a specific class, you then unlock these ultra hard challenge races, which pretty much require you to abuse as many shortcuts as you can to win. It's legitimately one of the most content rich racers on the console, not quite Gran Turismo of course, but surprisingly close. I mean, look at this achievement list for N-Gen mode, there is so much stuff to do. So when you break it all down, N-Gen racing isn't just a very unique racing game concept that's executed surprisingly well, it's also swimming with content. Now this leads us to maybe my only real problem with the game, and that's the presentation. You may have noticed the tracks in this game look a little, uh, well they're a little rough. Unfortunately I think given the nature of this title, the way you have to design tracks to cater to flight as well as the high speeds that you're traveling at, well the environmental design certainly suffers because of this. Truthfully, between the game's 28 tracks, it is very hard to tell any of them apart from one another based on visuals alone. Almost everything is a different color mountain range, either during the day or at night. It's a strange case where I actually remember each of the tracks based on specific turns and track elements rather than what it looks like, and I don't think I've played a racing game before where that's a thing that's happened to me. It's also not too uncommon to lose track of the track, I guess you could say, on the faster speeds. But this usually comes down to track knowledge more than anything, but there are times where I wish the track layout was a little bit more defined. Now, I'm not saying this game is ugly by any means, I actually think a lot of the graphical elements are quite good. This is a 2000 release after all, and it definitely has some of the hallmarks of later PS1 releases in terms of texture quality, how good the play models look, some of the lighting and particle effects are also really great too. It's just a case where I think the hardware itself is limiting to this game's concept. I think the devs did the best they could given the power of the console, but like, if this was a PS2 game for example, I think this could have blown people's minds. All being said though, the devs still managed to hit a rock solid 30 FPS throughout the gameplay, so there's not a single stutter to be found the whole way through, which you love to see. Now I bet you're wondering about the game's music since we have a European high speed racer with X wipeout devs making it, so I get the feeling you probably already know what it sounds like.
NGEN's OST has club bangers across the board, but not a weak track to be found. It's telling that my only complaint about the music is that I wish there was more. The game only has about eight tracks which don't randomize as well as I'd like, meaning that you can oftentimes hear the same track two races in a row, but really it's a minor complaint for an overall great sounding game. Also, I just need to give a special shout out to the music that plays when you win a race. When you come second in the race. And also, when you win a championship. Oh, that's the stuff. Look, I'm not gonna lie, this is a genuine hidden gem on the console. It's certainly an odd and probably very niche racing game, but sometimes you feel games are almost made to cater to you personally, and engine racing is very much one of those games. It's a high-speed jet racer full of banging tunes and loaded with content. It's one of those games along the lines of F-Zero or Wipeout, where you can enter such hyper-focus, where the music and gameplay just blend together in your mind, and you don't even really know what you're playing. You're in the zone, so to speak, and this game definitely lets you enter your zone, that's for sure. And on top of that, it's just a really interesting and unique concept that rewards experimentation and skilled gameplay, but most importantly of all, it's just really fun. If you're in the camp that happens to enjoy both Wipeout and Ace Combat, you need to go out of your way to try this as soon as possible, and as for everybody else, if you're looking for a cool and unique take on a racing game, Definitely consider trying this one out. Accused of necromancy, witchcraft in its darkest form. How do you plead? The mask of the accused. May the mask of the accused protect your soul from the evil which consumes you. Let your journey to salvation begin. Kicking off the second half of Volume 9's selection, we got Warriors of Might and Magic, which first made its way to the PS1 in December of the year 2000. So if the name didn't give it away, this game is part of the long-running Might and Magic series, a very popular and influential series of role-playing games, which first appeared on computers all the way back in 1986. Now, in spite of the series' long list of games, most of which stick to the traditional RPG format of the original, the only two I have ever played are actually spin-offs of the main series. 
Them being the wonderful arcane classic Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, aka Fun Kicking Simulator 2006, and this really addictive DS puzzle title called Might and Magic Clash of Heroes. You can get this on the PC too, but trust me, the DS is the place to play it. But today we're going to be trying a brand new Might and Magic game, and you guessed it, it's another spin-off, and a pretty interesting one at that. So you remember 3DO, right? The company founded in 1991 by EA founder Trip Hawkins. They released a console that cost a lot of money and it uh, didn't do very well. Well, similarly to Sega, once 3DO called it quits in the hardware business, they actually stuck around as both a publishing and development house, mostly releasing games over on the PC, but developing and publishing quite a number of games on consoles as well. Some of these were ports of old 3DO exclusives and others almost feel like they were created with the goal of being forgotten about as quickly as possible, but they did have successes here and there, most notably with their Army Men series of games, a series which somehow got like 10 entries on the PS1 in the space of 2 or 3 years, but those games are a topic for another day. Undoubtedly though, the 3DO company's best decision during their post-console era was to purchase the developers behind the Might and Magic series, New World Computing, thus obtaining a reliable PC development team and in turn, also the rights to the Might and Magic series. So from 1996 to 2003, all Might and Magic games actually came from 3DO, which is kind of weird when you think about it, but sure look, here we are. So today's game, Warriors of Might and Magic, isn't just a spin-off of the core Might and Magic series. It's actually part of an entire spin-off series known by fans as the Arden series. This series is comprised of three games, Crusaders of Might and Magic, Warriors of Might and Magic, and the final entry, just called Shifters. Now, interestingly, there exists multiple versions of many of these games, and almost every single one is its own unique game. The first in the series, Crusaders, has a PC version and also a different PS1 version. The follow-up, Warriors of Might and Magic, has a PS2 version, a PS1 version, and also a Game Boy Color version. And check out this Game Boy music, by the way. The final game in the series, Shifters, on the other hand, only seen a release on the PS2 and also lets you morph into a genie, which is kind of fun. So why am I even telling you all this? Well, I spent a lot of time reading about it, so here's Warriors of Might and Magic on the PS1. Now, just for clarity, it is unfortunate that we're skipping over the first game in the series, especially since Crusaders is actually floating about in the viewer wheel, so... Maybe it will show up next, you never know. But the good news is Crusaders of Might and Magic didn't sell very well, so that means the original plan to make Crusaders of Might and Magic 2 was scrapped and a new game called Warriors of Might and Magic was whipped up instead, featuring a whole new story with brand new characters but set in the same universe, so thankfully we ain't missing much. The story of this game centers on a character called Alaron, who has wrongfully been accused of being a necromancer. Of course, back in those days, people could just gang up on you for the crack, so there's nothing you can really do about that now, can you? As punishment for his crimes, he is branded with a weird living mask of shame that attaches itself to our hero, and he's dropped into a big pit, which you'd expect would kill him, but thankfully he lands on a box and is in fact completely fine. So the rest of the game is pretty much you trying to fight your way out of this dungeon that you find yourself in and also trying to get rid of this mask and maybe even save the world, who knows. There's some nice cutscenes and voiced in-game segments throughout the game, but truthfully I'd say the story plays a minor role in the grand scheme of things. It takes up maybe 5 or 10 minutes of the runtime total and is full of weird plot twists and inconsistencies that both make it seem very rushed and a little nonsensical at times, although the voice acting is pretty funny, so it's probably worth keeping up with these all the same. It's a disaster for me. It's time I took matters into my own hands. But how? What Warriors of Might and Magic is really all about is the gameplay itself, where we take our hero Alaron through 11 levels of dungeons, magic, fierce beasts, and also a bunch of platforming, because why not? Each level is broken up into different locations, usually with the goal of making it from point A to point B, with a little time to explore off the beaten path for secrets and also plenty of combat. Control-wise, your character actually has full analog movement, so getting around feels pretty good. Although, let's take a moment to appreciate this guy's run cycle. Now this is a guy who's got some place to be, let me tell you. 
As for your character's moveset, well, things are kept relatively simple. You've got a button for jumping, a button to lock onto enemies, which also highlights the selected enemy's health, a basic tree hit combo, the only combo in the game actually, and also a button to use magic. Now, throughout the game, you will get a variety of different weapons and magic, and those can be cycled through while using the L1 and R1 buttons. You get a total of three hand-to-hand -hand weapons, either a sword, axe, or hammer, that seem to get new upgrades almost every single level. So throughout the game, you'll likely just cycle from weapon to weapon each time you get a new upgrade. It's the same tree hit combo either way, so it doesn't really matter. Magic, on the other hand, is a bit more interesting. You'll collect various spells throughout the game, either through natural progression or as rewards for exploring or finding chests. Each time you find a magic spell, it starts off on level one, but each time you find another copy of that spell, you can then upgrade it to a maximum of level four. Spells include a crossbow, fireballs, lightning, freeze circle, holy circle, healing, shield. There's quite a lot. And while some are definitely more useful than others, seeing how OP some of these spells can be at their max level, it definitely makes exploring off the beaten path very, very much worth your while. Rounding out the controls, we also got the game's camera, which is mapped to the L2 and R2 button, allowing you to easily circle the camera around your character. Now, I could see some people finding this camera a little bit awkward, but as somebody who's played way too many games with this camera setup recently, I thought this thing was actually pretty decent. Certainly not perfect, but decent. It also lets you do this though, so yeah, 10 out of 10. And last but not least, you can also press both buttons together to aim in first person, which you'll definitely need for a few enemies and puzzles. So as you can see, it's definitely more of an action-heavy title than an RPG-heavy title. There's no menus or stats. The only real RPG elements come from leveling up and collecting new gear, but this stuff just happens naturally by progressing in the game, so you barely even notice it. Truthfully, the combat actually feels very brawlery. Is that a word? Brawlery? Well, anyway, if somebody was to tell me this was a 3D Golden Axe game, I would believe them. Combat magic is very simple, but it is simple and satisfying. Whack bad guy with hammer, hit bad guy with chain lightning, you lock on, tap a few buttons, and you're having a good time. Now, is the combat a little repetitive? Truthfully, yeah, but the enemy variety changes often, you're constantly getting new weapons and magic each and every new level. The gameplay itself rarely changes, but getting new abilities and seeing the visual updates to your character makes you feel like you're always accomplishing something and getting stronger. A nice, pleasant gameplay loop, if you will. Although while I enjoy the combat, there is some notable issues that are worth highlighting, most clearly the lack of a dodge or block button, meaning combat always boils down to one tactic, hit the enemy to stun lock them, and if that doesn't work, wait for them to attack, run away, and then come back and attack. This works on every enemy, every boss, throw in a bit of magic here and there, and that's the majority of the game. I would try a different tactic, but the game doesn't really allow anything but this, and while I can forgive the basic enemies for this simple gameplay, almost every boss, with the exception of a few highlights, boil down to using the same tactic too, which is quite the shame. Although, there is more to this game than just combat. You'll spend a lot of time exploring dungeons, fortresses, monasteries, all that medieval good stuff. The game has a dark, almost claustrophobic design to everything. It actually reminded me a lot of Quake, a much smaller, more narrow Quake, but haunting and oppressive all the same. I quite like it. While the levels do have a few branching paths and secrets to find, they are generally very linear affairs, mostly a series of corridors and connecting rooms, and if one path is blocked, the other path is usually the only way you can go. While exploring, you may also find some items laying about. Now, we've already mentioned weapons and magic, but you can also find health and mana pickups, which unexpectedly refill your health and mana bars. But there's also these other items, each of which are used to progress throughout the level. Gems, which let you open doors. Orbs, which let you use teleporters. And keys, which are used for opening chests. These can spawn from enemies, environmental objects, chests, pretty much anything really. As long as you're killing, smashing, and opening everything that you find, you should never find yourself lacking in weird collectibles. The only thing left to cover, really, is the platforming, which, thanks to the game's nice analog movement, is actually pretty decent. All you've got is a single jump, and the majority of the platforming in this game is both rather easy and quite forgiving. But even when the tougher stuff and instant death pits begin to show up, it's, uh, yeah, it's honestly not that bad. So, for gameplay, I think we've covered all we need to know on that front, which means now it's time to talk about the presentation, and this is where things get a bit interesting. Now, you might have noticed the game's performance is a bit, uh... 
Well, it's it's a bit rough. Now, full disclosure, I'm playing these games using an emulator, Duck Station to be exact. Now, this is due to personal circumstances and also convenience, truthfully. But while I try to present these games without any enhancements, so they're at least a close representation of what you get on your very own PlayStation at home, in some very rare cases, PS1 games just don't play nice with emulators. One such example is the game Monkey Hero. I don't know if anybody really wants to play this, but emulating it is a bad, bad time. And as luck would have it, two other games that have this issue are Warriors of Might and Magic and its predecessor, Crusaders of Might and Magic. Now, these games share the same engine, and for whatever reason, this engine brings emulators to its knees. The game has these sharp bouts of extreme slowdown that render the game almost unplayable on most emulators. It even happens if you pop the games into a PS3, so... Even Sony's own emulator can't hack it. Now, thankfully, while Duck Station does experience slowdown, it is significantly less than other emulators, and the game is still very playable. But please note, on an actual PlayStation, this game runs at a pretty stable 30 FPS with the odd drop to the 20s. What you see here? This is much worse. I am sorry that I can't present the real deal, but hey, it's better than nothing. Now, is the game so graphically impressive that it warrants this lag? Uh, no, not really, but it is a pretty nice looking game in my opinion. Sure, some of the models can look a little bit goofy, especially up close, but the textures are really nice, the enemy models can be pretty fun, and in spite of the game's very muted color palette, I think it helps give the game that dark, oppressive vibe that blends well with the cramped level design. At least the weapons and magic effects add a nice dash of color to the game and even show off some nice lighting effects too. All in all, a nice looking game, as you'd expect from a late release on the system. The CGI is also pretty nice too, a little goofy at times, as is most CGI from this era, but it is a good effort and well put together for what it is. The music and sound on the other hand, I don't think I've played a game where I could say the music is both simultaneously really good and terrible at the same time. For the good, well, the levels in this game either feature no music or very subtle atmospheric tracks. Once again, reminding me of some of Quake's quieter and more tense moments. It's surprisingly good. On the other hand though, the rest of the music and sound effects in this game were clearly taken from a random sample CD of generic movie and TV sound effects, which are not only really low quality, but tonally very out of place and oftentimes unintentionally hilarious. So yeah, that's the PS1 version of Warriors of Might and Magic, a deceptively simple title that's both a pretty easy game and not all that long, taking roughly 3-4 to four hours to be. But truthfully, I played through this whole game in one sitting and I had a pretty good time from start to finish. It wasn't going to set the world on fire in the year 2000 and it's certainly not going to set the world on fire now. But if you're a Might and Magic fan or enjoy 3D action platformers, this is actually a pretty decent option on the console. If anything, it really made me want to try the rest of the games in the series, and after trying a little bit of Crusaders, I can already tell there's some significant differences to these games, but I'm sure we'll get to that some other time. For now at least, if you want to play a PlayStation game about a masked man who's always got some place to be, Warriors of Might and Magic is the way to go. Whoa! Thanks! I owe you! Okay, bird. Help me get this mask off. Not this bird! You'll need to visit the Monastery of Enroth! What the...? Colin said he'd help! Not that he'd do it! Fine, so how do I get to this Monastery, Carlin? You wanna take this path through the C-A-N-Y-O-N! Canyon? Why do you say it like that? It's filled with blood-sucking B-A-T-S's! Bats? I hate bats. It's better than taking the SWAMP path! How so? Blood sucking pythons! There wouldn't be a third, safer path, would there? Nope! I'd recommend the canyon! Hurry! It's getting dark! And bats love the dark! Bats? Why did it have to be bats? 
you will provide. So uh, here's our viewer selection for this episode, a little game called Tunguska Legend of Faith. And if you know how the viewer selection on this series usually goes, you won't be surprised to find out it's a PAL exclusive, which made its way to the PlayStation in the year 2000, courtesy of German developer Exordus Incorporated. This game was chosen for the wheel by Grim Zane. Grim, come on buddy, how could you do this to me? So, Tunguska is a game I've never played before, but it is a game I'm very well aware of. I've seen plenty of clips of this game in motion, and I don't think it takes a trained expert to know something is a little bit off with this thing. It also doesn't help that it often gets referenced as one of the worst PS1 games ever made, so as you can tell my viewers, they sure love to pick the classics. So we begin Tunguska with a cutscene highlighting a prisoner on death row who's being brought to an electric chair. Once the deed is done, we then see a prison guard morph into some sort of demon while our spirit leaves our body. We then get some flashbacks of a woman being murdered with what seems like a gun and there's also some religious imagery before we wander into a portal and then the game just kind of begins. There's no main menu, no options, you're pretty much straight into the game. Now you may wonder what all of that just was and from what I can gather, this is Jack, our player character. Jack was a member of a suicidal cult, a cult which he recently escaped from. But would you believe it, the cult ended up dying in a fire just after he left, killing all the members including Jack's wife. This has unfortunately led to Jack being accused of mass murder, hence why he's here on death row. Now as for the demons and everything else going on, this apparently might be the real killer and it somehow relates to Jack dealing with the demons inside his head. So. He's teleported to a location known as the Castle of the Order of Tunguska, where he has to solve the mystery of the castle so he can find out the truth about what really happened. So that's about it for the story. Now we will get to more of it later, and by later I mean the very, very end of the game, as there is no dialogue or text anywhere in between. Once we're in the game, well, Tunguska is quite an interesting beast, because while you can probably detect the whole tank control static background shtick from a mile off, Tunguska actually represents a very unique style of game. It's an adventure game crossed with a fighting game. If somebody was to say it's Mist meets Virtua Fighter, well, then they actually wouldn't be too far off. The goal is essentially to escape from this big medieval castle that you found yourself in. This will require you to wander around, collecting items, solving puzzles, all the adventure stuff you know and love, but in between all of that, you'll also have to engage in 1v1 fights against various opponents, all utilizing a different array of moves and weaponry. Truthfully on paper, I actually quite like what the game is going for with this. It's certainly a unique concept, but if it's done well, I could see it being a lot of fun. Of course, it's probably no surprise that the game doesn't do either of these things very well. In fact, you might say, They've both been done quite poorly. But before we get into those aspects of the game, we should probably start with the controls because they are certainly something. So walking around using the D-pad, it's your basic tank controls you know and love. Holding down the X button initiates a run, which you'll likely use all the time. And also, if you hold it down while standing still, you can run on the spot, which is kind of funny. If you hold down the circle button and press up on the D-pad, you can jump a very, very short distance. This had me worry that there might be platforming in the game, but good news, there isn't, and this jump button is entirely useless. That's pretty much it for basic movement, but combat is where things start to get really weird. So whenever you press square, you'll enter into a combat stance. This locks you onto your enemies, 
but it also changes how your movement works. Up and down on the D-pad moves you forward and back, but left and right on the D-pad now represent two different attacks. If you hold down the X button, the D-pad gets modified into four new attacks, and if you hold down the circle button, you now gain defensive abilities like sidestepping and blocking. The idea is to use a combination of D-pad inputs while holding down various buttons to unleash combos and different attacks on enemies. Now, admittedly, this is kind of terrible, right? But let's just say you've played another janky PAL exclusive PS1 game with tank controls, static backgrounds, and a D-pad orientated hand-to-hand -hand combat system. Well, in that case, you might actually get accustomed to Tunguska's combat quite quickly. And if I'm being honest, the combat here is significantly better than what I've seen in Men in Black. It's unusual, yes, it's awkward, yes, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Throughout the game, you can even acquire new weapons like some nunchucks made of bones or a samurai sword, each of which also include a new list of moves to perform. It's not half bad, honestly. The thing is though, the game is designed in such a way that even if you like this combat system, there is no way for you to actually enjoy it. Almost every enemy in this game will beat the crap out of you unless you are using cheap moves. Give it a bit too much space, try to use a cool 1-2 combo, you're gonna be punished for it. Repeat the same simple move over and over again or abuse their animations with lunge attacks, nobody in this game will give you any trouble. I wanted to try out cool stuff, but it just never works. The way the AI behaves promotes you being cheap. Anything else, you'll be punished quite quickly. Now, thankfully, in spite of the fact enemies can kill you in like one or two hits, dying in this game has pretty much no penalty whatsoever. When you die, you'll immediately respawn at the last door you came through, almost like a quick save. And since most enemies are right beside the entrance that you've just came through, Dying rarely loses you any time. Now this doesn't make up for the fights being really dumb and a case of who can stunlock the other first, but at the very least they're never rage inducing, just really dumb and boring. That goes for every fight in the game by the way, there are plenty of different enemies from humans to zombies to uh, whatever these things are, but outside of getting the new weapons, almost every enemy and fight in the game feels the exact same as the last, and when this is half of your game, well we're not off to a great start. And if you can believe it, the fighting is, in my opinion, the better half of this game because the exploration and puzzle solving is where things really get rough. As mentioned, this castle and its grounds are the only location in the game. It's a big mess of identical corridors and rooms that are very easy to get lost in initially. But at the same time, it's also surprisingly small when you eventually get your head around it. Since there's no dialogue or even text in this game, there's no lore or story to dig into. It's just explore, find items, try to use said items on different things, and then eventually get out of the castle. When it comes to puzzles, the game has only one. Drag item onto the thing, and if it works, good job. A lot of this is pretty self-explanatory. Try keys on locked doors, put marbles in a the marble shaped area. But there's also some real adventure game nonsense here too, where you seemingly put random items in random places and things just happen to work out for you. Seriously, you've got to try every item you've got just in case. It doesn't matter if it seems like it's the wrong item, try it anyway, you never know. There's even a part where you find a literal needle in a haystack at one point, so yeah, good luck with that. Now the adventure part of the game is quite bad and will take up most of your time, but what makes it even worse is also the game's very grainy visuals. Now the castle is okay, I do kinda like it in a way. Yes, there's a lot of copy-pasted hallways and rooms, but it's definitely got a vibe going on. I also quite like the way the screens transition from one to another, it's a nice little effect they've got going on. But the low resolution of the images both makes navigation very difficult, but also trying to interact with items in the background. Now there is a little yellow dot on your hood that lights up whenever you can interact with something, but look at the specific angle you need to be in for it to show up. It is very easy to just miss something in a room because you didn't check every last square inch, and the grainy visuals often make you second guess everything you see. It's arguably even worse when you do eventually interact with something. Seriously, can any of you guess the item you're meant to use on this thing? Yeah, it's the ring. Why wouldn't it be? So the core of this game is janky fights that you need to cheese and backtracking all over a castle in search of items. So, sounds fun, right? Well, get this, we haven't even got to the best part, the traps. So throughout the game, you're going to come across these traps that you need to dodge. Now, sometimes killing an enemy nearby disarms a trap, but other times you'll need to navigate by them. Now, the traps in this game, I'm going to say, 
they haven't been tuned properly. There are ones that require almost perfect timing, which is a bit rough, but hey, at least I can get by them eventually. But there's also traps that you literally can't avoid taking damage from. Now, I've watched speedruns of this game. Even they're getting hit all the time. The final type of trap, uh, I guess the devs just forgot to activate some of these. This happens quite frequently throughout the game, by the way, and it's very, very unusual. Let's just put it that way. Also, to make the game seem even more unfinished, there is no music in this game whatsoever. Just weird sound effects from enemies. Very, very weird sound effects. Well, I'm lying, there is one short music loop that plays whenever you do something of note, so naturally you'll hear it, and only it, about a hundred times during your playthrough. So that's about all there is to Tunguska. It's quite the mess, if I'm putting it lightly, and surprisingly, it's also rather short too. I'd say most people could fumble their way through this one on their first try in little over an hour, and the one thing that kept me motivated the entire way through was to find out how the story was going to end, keeping in mind we've had no story progression since the opening cutscene. So at the end of the game, as we finally begin to escape the castle, I was wondering if we'd fight a boss or anything cool, but Here's what happens. So you get to this gate, you open it, and you fight a skeleton. Then you reach another gate, you open it, and you fight a skeleton. Then you reach another gate, you open it, and fight a skeleton. Then you reach another gate, you open it, and fight a skeleton. Then you open another gate, you see this guy, and then the ending plays. Was that? This was truly one of the most perplexing gaming experiences I've ever had. Nobody on this planet knows what's happening in this. Is it an allegory for death or guilt or religion? I doubt even the devs truly know. So look, there's no denying Tunguska is a bad game, right? I mean, that's clear to see, but so much of this thing just doesn't make any sense, and I'm not talking about just the story, but the map layout, the broken traps, the lack of music, something must have happened, right? Well, as it turns out, like most janky PAL PS1 games, Tunguska is actually a port of a PC game that was originally released in 1998. Now, footage of this PC version is actually quite rare, but lucky for us, somebody uploaded a playthrough this year, and I gotta say, it looks significantly better than the PS1 version. The backgrounds look great, the traps seem to work properly, the game even has music now. Now, I'm not saying these things will fix a lot of the game's major issues, but this is clearly light years ahead of the PS1 version, and after doing a little research, it seems the PS1 version doesn't just feature a significant graphical downgrade, but alterations to the map to save space, meaning more identical locations, and yes, also traps that haven't been tuned for console play meaning they are much harder to dodge than they should be. So yeah, it turns out we were actually getting screwed all along. So jury's out on the PC version of Tunguska, but one thing is for sure, the PS1 port is very, very bad. I'd almost even say it's charmingly bad. There's practically nothing good about this game, but at the very least, it did make me laugh a lot. And with instant checkpoints and the ability to save wherever you like, it at least was never frustrating, just very weird and very dull. Personally, I wouldn't call it the worst game on the console. It's not even the worst game I've played on this series, if I'm being honest. But regardless, it's definitely a game I wouldn't recommend. And seeing as it's a game with bone nunchucks, that is truly quite the shame. <laughs> Look around you. 
you, you cannot see me. When I move, you will not hear me. Vigilance is futile. For when ninja strike, it will be silent, instant, and deadly. I will execute my mission at any cost. Tenchu Stealth Assassins, out now. You will provide. some elaborate game that will determine the fate of the world, is that it? Then which player is going to be fortunate enough to checkmate fate, I wonder? Starting out our viewer special, we've got Silent Bomber, which first launched in Japan in 1999 before making its way to the West in the year 2000. This game was chosen for the wheel by two lovely people, Red Fox and Terra Corrupt, and I say lovely people because they chose an absolute banger of a game to talk about today. So full disclosure, I've played this game a few times, in fact it's one of those obscure games that I just so happened to stumble upon as a kid. I used to rent games a lot when I was younger and when I came across this game in my local ExtraVision, RIP Sweet Prince, I knew just by looking at the box and the pictures on the back that I would really like this game and surprise surprise, I really like this game. That being said, in spite of owning a copy of this game for the past 15-ish years, I haven't played this game in about 15-ish years, and I don't know about you guys, but this whole being alive thing has made my memory kind of fuzzy, so playing it today will be a nice little refresher. But that begs the question, does Silent Bomber still hold up and is it as good as I remember? Well, let's find out. Now this game is developed by a little company called CyberConnect2. You may know them as the guys who pump out a lot of anime fighters and a lot might be a bit of an understatement, but I'm actually quite a fan of some of their other works as a studio, including the Dot Hack series of RPGs, the absolutely bonkers Asura's Wrath, and for the PS1 fans out there, they also made everybody's favourite furry platformer, Tail Concerto. And following on from Tail Concerto, we got Silent Bomber, a very different experience both in tone and gameplay. You see, in spite of the name, this isn't a very quiet game at all. In fact, it's a big dumb action game where you're constantly blowing stuff up. Robots, aliens, buildings, innocent civilians. <sighs> the, those are... But, but I thought there were soldiers in here. These people are ci civilians. Oh no, that got dark quick. So before we get into the gameplay, we might as well talk about the story. In Silent Bomber, we play as a character named Utah, like the state but with a silent J at the front. Utah is a genetically engineered man created by a military government for the purpose of covert military missions, spying, assassinations, all that good stuff. Interestingly, the game's tutorial acts as a sort of origin story with Utah going through a training mission for his government which sees him taking out a series of targets, ending up with him blowing up a base full of innocent civilians against his knowledge. It's a pretty harrowing scene honestly and I'm surprised to see a game pull a spec ops the line many years before it but uh yeah, hey, that's, that's tutorials for you. This whole experience leads to Utah having a severe mental breakdown and eventually becoming an emotionless drone only focused on completing his objectives, no matter the cost. Of course, fast forward a few years later and the military government that created Utah has collapsed and as such, Utah is now a prisoner due to uh, committing just 
a few war crimes. But when the planet Utah is imprisoned on is under threat from a giant space cruiser known as the Dante, he is given a shot at redemption by joining a ragtag group of criminals in a sort of suicide squad to take down the ship from within. The story itself is rather predictable, but it's the right mixture of hokiness and seriousness that you'd want from a PS1 sci-fi action title, and the game is fully voiced too, with some decent performances from the cast, well at least by 2000 standards. The story doesn't take up a huge chunk of the runtime really, but I always enjoyed the story segments whenever they did pop up, and the CGI scenes are also pretty nice too. They've definitely got that classic early 3D look to them, but they are very impressive all the same. Great stuff all round. Now while the story stuff is appreciated, where Silent Bomber really shines is in its gameplay, which to this day is still rather unique amongst other games. A simple way to describe it would be kinda like a gritty sci-fi Bomberman, or the game Bomberman Act Zero wishes it was. So our moveset for Utah is pretty straightforward. We can jump, climb, and perform a dash mid-air by tapping the jump button twice in quick succession, helpful for covering ground and also getting out of danger, which Generally speaking, you're going to be in quite a lot. And for your attacks, well, you've got bombs. You can drop a bomb on the spot, or if you hold down the bomb button, you can bring up a little targeting reticule that lets you lock on the enemies and instead plant bombs directly on them. Once you place the bomb, all you got to do is press the triangle button and then it detonates. Nice and simple, eh? Now, there are a few other techniques to take into consideration too. For one, you can increase the power and range of your bombs by stacking them on top of one another. Early on in the game, you start out with just two bombs, but you can work your way up to a total of eight consecutive bombs, and stacking bombs offers a significant boost in power, of course, with the trade-off being the increased time that they take the plant. But if you can make it work, the trade-off is nearly always worth it. On top of this, Utah also has access to three special bomb types, which, unlike your normal bombs, are limited and must be collected throughout the levels. These bombs include a napalm bomb, which continues to burn on the ground after detonation, great for sustained damage on bigger enemies, a stun bomb, which arcs out and locks mechanical enemies in place for a short period of time, and finally there's a gravity bomb, which sucks smaller enemies in and deals continuous damage to them over time. Needless to say, these special bombs are extremely powerful when used correctly, and they can even be stacked in a similar method to your normal bombs to increase their effect. Although one trade-off is that you can't use these bombs to lock on and place them on enemies, so you do got to be more precise when using them. There's also various pickups you can find throughout the levels as well. There's of course the aforementioned special bombs, as well as various health pickups, which unsurprisingly restore your health. But more importantly, you can also find these things called e-chips. Now, e-chips are important because these are used for leveling up Utah. You can increase the total number of bombs you can plant at a time, increase the range of your lock-on, and increase your shield, which reduces the damage you take by 10% per level. You get a chance to assign these E-chips at the end of each mission, but if you like, you can also pause mid-mission and just rearrange them any way you like at any time, which is a nice feature. Now, the flow of gameplay in Silent Bomber is quite linear. You move from level to level one by one, and the levels themselves are generally quite compact, usually taking anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes on average, with the occasional boss fight at the end. Levels might require you to get from point A to point B, destroy a set number of targets, or do something like protect a target, but generally, they're very straightforward and linear affairs, with good level design and plenty of UI elements to let you know what you should or shouldn't be bombing. Although, you can't really go wrong with bombing everything and anything in this game, let me tell you. You see, while your main goal is usually just to make it to the end of a level in one piece, the game also has a fun scoring and ranking system for players who like a bigger challenge. Blowing stuff up gets you points, but blowing stuff up in quick succession gives you a multiplier, and keep this multiplier going, and you get big points. You can chain this off enemies, environmental objects, bullets, pretty much anything really, and when you get to the end of a level, depending on how many points you've earned, how quick you made it there, and how much damage you took in the process, you'll get a rank from D to S. Now this ranking system is uh, pretty tough, and even though I feel like I played pretty well during my playthrough, I never got anything higher than a B, so this ranking system is no joke, but for replayability purposes, this is the kind of thing that you really love to see. And I suppose, speaking of difficulty, one of the things I remembered the most about this game was that it was very, very tough. And honestly, playing through the first few levels of this game, I thought maybe it was just me who was bad as a kid, because while this game was absolutely keeping me on my toes, I was still blasting through this game with relative ease. Although, from the midpoint onwards, the game's difficulty rapidly began to put me in my place, and some repressed memories 
quickly came rushing back to me. The alien boss, the elevator level, the protection mission at the end, and oh my god, the final boss. These are all brutally difficult, but at the same time, completely fair. It's a tough game, but at the end of the day, it's nothing a bit of skill and pattern recognition can't overcome. That may be a D rank, but I worked pretty hard for them, let me tell you. Now, playing this game from start to finish and getting through its 14 levels took me about two hours altogether. Not the longest campaign by any means, but truly, it's a game that's all killer, no filler. Well, it could have done without the protection mission, truthfully, but everything else was top notch. It doesn't outstay its welcome, and if anything, it actually makes you want to hop straight back in and try and get a better rank, and that is something you might want to do, because there's also another mode that we've got to talk about. Now, throughout the game, while searching for e-chips to upgrade your abilities, you may also come across these items called data chips. Now, at first, these don't seem to do anything, but if you return to the main menu, you'll see a mode called Vior Arena, which is a very cool addition to the game. This mode lets you both battle against and play as a bunch of the enemies and bosses featured throughout the main game, both in CPU and two-player battles with each character featuring its own unique moveset. And to unlock these characters, you guessed it, you gotta find the data chips hidden throughout the main game. Now, I managed to find all but one of these during my playthrough, but the final three characters you can only unlock by beating every level with a B, A, and S rank respectively. Which, as you can see, I uh, didn't have time to do. But hey, this mode is actually really fun all things considered. It turns the game into a fun little arena fighter and gives you a really nice incentive to actually earn those high ranks in single player. Definitely one of the cooler additions I've seen in a PS1 game, that's for sure. And with that, all that's left to really talk about is the presentation and sound, and really, Presentation wise, I think this game knocks it out of the park. Whether it's the effects, the character designs, the smaller enemies, the big boss mechs and aliens, or the many locations you'll visit across the Space Cruiser Dante. This game gives you so much variety in such a short period of time. You'd never even have guessed that this game takes place in just one single location. Well, outside of the tutorial mission, of course, but the less we speak about that, the better. There's a few locations in particular that are just framed so perfectly when you enter them, it's hard not to take a moment to admire them. And also, some of the visuals during the final boss in particular are incredible, if a little busy and distracting, but hey, you'll get used to them. It's just an expertly crafted, well-designed and clean-looking game that runs at a rock-solid 30 frames per second the whole way through. Visually, there is pretty much nothing to fault here. And as for the sound, well, all the sound effects and voices are great. As I said before, the voice acting is above average from what you'd expect from a game of its era, but that still means you can expect a little cheesiness from time to time, as is tradition, especially from the villains. You're telling me that Hornet Assault Teams got on board the ship? All right, go to alert level yellow. Eliminate the intruders immediately. <laughs> and when it comes to the music, it's, um, it's a bit of a weird one. I think it's really good, right? But in a way, I also kind of wish it was better. It's a tough one to explain because while I felt the compositions are catchy and they suit the action and pace of the game well, whenever I listen to them outside of the game, I'm just not really all that into them. I think it might have something to do with the recording quality or the tools or instruments used to create the music, but I don't know, I always felt like it could have been a bit stronger or punchier seeing as it's a CD based game. That being said, I still did really enjoy it while playing the game, which is the main thing really, but hey, have a listen and see for yourself.
So yeah, that's a look at Silent Bomber. And how does it hold up after all these years? Honestly, if anything, I think I like it even more now. It plays excellently, offers a great challenge, and the gameplay here still really hasn't ever been emulated since. It's an all-killer, no-filler action game with a silly story, cool sci-fi environments, and enough explosions to make Michael Bay jealous. I often consider this game to be the most popular obscure PS1 game, at least in my mind, because while not many people have played it, the people who have usually can't shut up about it. And look, that's for good reason. So if you've been sleeping on Silent Bomber all this time, there is absolutely no better time to wake up and play this absolute belter of a PS1 exclusive. provide Is it possible to stop the con-human violence organization which joined forces with human clones? Wave Rider. Cybernetics Link. Cloning. Ray Crisis. Next up, we're taking a look at Ray Crisis, which made its way to the PlayStation in the year 2000, courtesy of legendary arcade developer Taito. This game was chosen for the wheel by JetWolf68K, which is possibly one of the most badass usernames around. Lovely stuff. Now, as some of you may know, Taito, they like to dabble in the old shoot 'em up genre from time to time. Hell, they only went and laid the whole blueprint for it in 1978 with Space Invaders, but. Beyond that, Taito also worked on some other notable series, such as Darius, aka the Horizontal Fish one, and also the Ray series, aka the Vertical Cyber Virus one. Unsurprisingly, today's game is a part of the Ray series. Now, up until this point, despite being a relatively big shoot 'em up fan, I never played a game in the Ray series, or at least that's what I taught. You see, the series is made up of three games originally released in arcades. The first is a game called Ray Force, which was released in 1994 and is the only 2D game in the series. Following that up in 1996, we then got Ray Storm, which took the series into 3D for the first time. And then after that, in 1998, we got Ray Crisis, the final entry in the series, which actually acts as a prequel to the first game. Now, to my surprise, not only have I played the first game Ray Force, but I actually own it. Too. You see, when this game was ported to home consoles, due to licensing issues, it was ported under not just one, but two different names. In Japan, the home console version was known as Layer Section, and in the West, it was known as Galactic Attack. And like any self-respecting Saturn owner, most of my collection is made up of cheap Japanese games, and naturally, I just so happen to own a copy of Layer Section. So yeah, it turns out, unbeknownst to me, I've dabbled in this series many times, and also, in case you're wondering, there is another Ray game from Taito called Ray Tracers, which, as far as I know, isn't related to this series in any way, but does involve you fighting bosses by driving into them, so that's kind of rad. Anyway, we should probably move on to the game. So here's Ray Crisis, which on the PlayStation also has the new subtitle of Ray Crisis Series Termination. As we already mentioned, Ray Crisis is a 3D vertical shoot 'em up that plays on a 2D plane. Certainly nothing unusual for the genre. Move your ship around, dodge bullets, and blow up the enemy. It's about as bread and butter as it gets. The game utilizes a total of three buttons during gameplay, one for your standard projectile shot, which hits all enemies on the same plane as your ship. Another is to use your lock-on laser, which is kind of this series' main gimmick. You can paint targets using this little target reticule in front of your ship, 
and then tap the laser button to launch them all at once. This can target enemies on any plane by the way, so as you can imagine, you'll be using this quite a lot. And finally, there's also a button for your screen clearing bomb, which is known as the round divider. This unleashes a blast that makes you temporarily invincible, clears all bullets on the screen, kills all minor enemies and does massive damage to bigger enemies and bosses. It's not the flashiest looking bomb in the world, but hey, it gets the job done. You can only hold one of these at a time by the way, but you can recharge it by killing enemies or just by dying. And if you're like me, you'll probably be dying a lot in this game. So that's pretty much the basic fundamentals of gameplay, shoot, laser and bomb, but of course, there's much more to Ray Crisis than that. First off, we've got three different ships to choose from, each with the choice of four different colours, which is always a nice touch. Each ship has a different shot and laser type, which actually does change up the gameplay quite a bit. For example, our default ship adopts the series standard laser fire, while the next ship allows you to fire a lightning laser that can be guided around the screen for extra damage, while another has homing bullets and a lock-on shot that can be fired indefinitely, assuming you can tap the fire button quick enough, that is. The different weapon types feel unique enough to give each ship its own identity, with each offering up enough individual pros and cons that one doesn't seem overtly better than the other, and it really all just comes down to personal preference, and regardless, no matter what ship you pick, they all move at the same speed and die in one hit anyway, so yeah, just go with what you like. As for items, the red pickups power up your basic shot, the green items increase the number of lock-ons you can use, and these rare blue items power up boat, weapon, and laser tree levels, so definitely grab these if you can. Now you might be wondering about all this stuff on the hood, and yeah, this is something I had to look into after my first run through of the game, so uh, let's try break it all down for you. So at the bottom left, we got our lives, bomb gauge, and also our lock-on counter. Certain ships can have higher lock-on numbers than others, but if you ever want to check how many you've got, this gauge will let you know. And over on the right, we got our score, and also something called the encroachment gauge. Now the encroachment gauge is actually quite important. When you start the game, this gauge begins at 50%. Killing enemies brings the gauge down, and the lower the gauge is when you finish a mission, the more points you get. If the gauge gets up to 100% though, well then things are going very poorly, let's just uh, put it that way. Kill as many enemies as you can and take out the bosses quickly and you should be able to keep things in check no problem. If you manage to finish a level with 20% or less on the gauge, the next level will then spawn in a bunch of harder enemies that give you more points, although you do need to be pretty good to make this actually happen. And speaking of points, we might as well talk about the game's scoring system. So generally speaking, killing enemies with your laser gives you more points than your standard shot. So the goal is really to try and maximize the use of your laser over your shot whenever possible. Now chaining large lock-ons with your laser is the key to scoring big points. The more you lock on in one go, the bigger your chain will be. Although, when dealing with bigger enemies, there's also a technique you can utilize called Hyper Laser, where if you use all your lock-ons on a single target simultaneously, you unleash a powered up version called a Hyper Laser, and if you kill your enemy with this attack, you get a big score bonus, as you can see here in the top left. Now this only applies to ships with the standard lock-on. If you're playing with the WRO3, for example, this ship uses a completely different scoring system based on chaining as many shots as possible in a limited time frame and promotes a very different playstyle compared to the other ships and have done well can lead to some crazy scores. Now, needless to say, I did not do very well with it, so vanilla lock-on is fine for me. Thank you very much. So yeah, as you can see, while the game seems pretty straightforward on the surface, as with many shoot 'em ups once you dig into the systems and mechanics underneath, you begin to appreciate all of its unique traits that give each game their own personal flair. Talking about personal flair, we haven't even really talked about the levels yet, which are uh, pretty crazy. So there is actually a plot to Ray Crisis that revolves around a supercomputer gaining sentience, and your ship is a computer virus known as a Wave Rider that's trying to take it out from within. It's a little wild to be honest, but it definitely results in some really cool Y2K cyber aesthetics and imagery all throughout the game, which you absolutely love to see. Now interestingly, when you start the game, you actually get to choose the order of the levels that you play. Well, kinda. You always begin in the first area called Self, which is kinda like a little warm up for the main course. Then you get to choose three levels out of a total of five levels, named Emotion, Consciousness, Intelligence, Memory, or Consideration. You can choose these in any order, and if you like, you can even play the same level three times in a row. It's 
up to you. Once you beat these levels, you then take on the fifth and final level to round out the game. Now these levels are all generally quite short. The actual level part only takes about a minute or two in total, with the majority of each level actually being taken up by a boss battle at the end. Really, a full run through of this game from start to finish should take most people anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. It is very, very short. Of course, you can go back and try a few different levels to spice things up, but seeing every level this game has to offer and playing through it with each available ship, you're looking at about an hour at most really, which may be a good thing or bad thing depending on how long you like your shoot 'em ups to be. Of course, the main draw here is really playing the game multiple times so you can learn the patterns, find the best routes, perfect your techniques, and just not die if you can help it. And let me tell you, holy crap, this game is tough. I was not prepared for how punishing some of the bullet patterns in this game are. It does absolutely not hold your hand in the slightest. And while some levels and bosses are quite manageable, a few others would kill me multiple times within seconds of respawning. It is brutal. Of course, the more I played, the better I got. And also having infinite continues, that certainly helps too. But if you're not familiar with shoot 'em ups, just be prepared. This game is a uh, quite mean. Now keeping all that in mind, that's just the normal mode that we talked about. If you like, there's also a console specific special mode, which is actually my favorite way to play through the game. This mode tasks you with taking on every single level in a set order. Now, in this mode, your ship is constantly at max power, but the catch is you have no continues and start with no lives. And instead of collecting weapon power-ups, you collect points and extra lives as you progress through the game to help you last a little bit longer each time. This mode also features remix visuals and music and even an exclusive level variant not seen in the normal mode. And I dunno, maybe it was always being at max power, the longer runtime and the constant tension of getting a game over, but this felt like the best way to play the game in my opinion. I even managed to beat it eventually, granted it probably helped that I played through the normal mode about 5 or 6 times beforehand, but hey, it's a nice victory. I'll take it. Also to round out the fun additions to the console version, you can also unlock the Wave Riders from the previous Ray games by beating normal mode with all three default ships. They play pretty much like the other ships, but their bomb animations are much, much cooler in my opinion, so they are absolutely worth getting. Also there's an art gallery too, because why the hell not? And I suppose speaking of art, we should probably talk about the game's looks and presentation, and personally, I love the visuals and style that this game has. It pops with all that cool Y2K hacker cyber aesthetic across the menus and in the game's visuals. Now, there is often a lot going on which truthfully can be a bit much for your eyes during gameplay, but as a late release 3D shoot 'em up on the console, this one is top tier in the visual department. And not only that, it aims to run at 60 frames per second as well. Now, I say aim because it does dip pretty frequently when the action gets hectic, but even then, the game only ever really drops into the 50s, so while the odd stutter is noticeable, the game still runs at a blistering pace throughout. And even though I really like the visuals and the levels, as brief as they are, like most shoot 'em ups, the stars of the show are undoubtedly the bosses you'll fight throughout. Big, hulking, mechanical enemies with multiple parts to lock on and destroy. Even though these guys will wreck you, it's hard not to admire their designs while they're doing it. As for the sound, well, the game is chock full of lock on noises and laser sound effects, as you'd expect, all of which sound great, by the way. The music is also excellent. It's one of the more unusual soundtracks I've heard in a shoot 'em up. It's definitely full of bangers, but I'd actually liken it somewhat to Taito's other soundtracks from games like G Darius, and that it's a bit more experimental than your average game. And the tracks even get remixed as you move throughout a level, escalating the music more and more as you move towards the boss. It's a really nice touch and makes the music one of the most memorable aspects of the game for sure.
So that's Ray Crisis, and I'll be honest, it did actually take me a little while to warm up to this one. Early playthroughs left me focused on the difficulty and short runtime more than anything. But as usual, once I came to better understand the mechanics, find a preferred wave rider, and nail down some of the enemy patterns, I started having a really fun time with this one, especially in the trial mode, which is honestly where I think the game shines the brightest. It doesn't reinvent the wheel, but I think this is a game that will definitely appeal to shoot 'em up fans looking for an aesthetically striking game with solid fundamentals and challenging gameplay. But on the other hand, the high difficulty and very short runtime could turn off more casual players. And going by the price this game fetches online for a physical copy, unless you plan on trying it some other way, I think only the hardcore will be playing this one anyway. That being said, if you did want to pick this game up physically, the best way to do it, in my opinion, would be to get both it and its predecessor, Raystorm, in a duo pack released under the Simple series, volume number 75, the double shooting to be exact. Also, the Japanese version of this game includes a pocket station minigame called Pocket Ray, which is a really cool addition. So, if you have a pocket station and the ability to play Japanese discs, this is absolutely the way to go. So, if you have the means to play it, Ray Crisis Series Termination is another fine shoot 'em up from Taito and worthy of being added to any genre fan's collection. Plus, you know, it's got drum and bass too, so it was always going to get a pass from me. provide Kicking off our second half of volume numero 10, we've got Johnny Bazooka Tone, which made its way to the PlayStation in the beginning of 1996. This game was chosen for the wheel by Parka Monkey, not to be confused with the other Parka Monkey who was still trapped in Ikea to this very day. So Johnny Bazooka Tone. This is one of those games that I remember seeing a lot of when I was a kid and it might have also probably helped that it came out on pretty much all major consoles available at the time. It actually first launched on the 3DO and like, most major 3DO releases was quickly poured over to the PlayStation and Saturn, so you know they could actually make some money. The developers behind this game are a British studio called Arc Developments, who developed 442 Soccer, a football game nobody has ever heard of, and also Hurricanes, a football platformer on the Mega Drive that nobody has ever heard of. Coming up, watch it, watch the football, watch it, watch it, he's gonna move, watch the football, it's so wrong! Johnny Bazooka Tone, on the other hand, is not a football game, but it is a platformer, a 2D platformer, harkening back to the classics of the 16-bit era, but instead offering up some fancy 32-bit graphics and sound. Honestly, it was a bit of a risky move doing a 2D platformer back in 1996. This was the period where simply just making a 2D game was usually a death sentence, both critically and commercially. But hey, we're older and wiser now and don't judge games based on their graphics anymore, right? Right? Yeah, well, uh, let's see how Johnny Bazooka Tone holds up all these years later. Now, like most games named after a character, we play a said titular character, Johnny Bazooka Tone, the purple haired musician. The story here is that in the not too distant future of 2050, Johnny Bazooka Tone is essentially some sort of musical genius who's so good he can unite the entire world in peace. Now this makes El Diablo, the king of the underworld, very jealous. So he sets out to steal Johnny's precious guitar known as Anita for himself. 
He succeeds, but since he has no music in his soul and can't play the guitar very well at all, this enrages El Diablo so much that he decides to deprive the world of music altogether. So he kidnaps all of the world's biggest musical geniuses. We've got the rock god, the techno god, the jazz god, and the soul god. But our main man Johnny manages to evade capture and instead follows the devil to the gates of the underworld, guitar gun in hand, to free the legends of music and regain his one true love, Anita, his guitar. Honestly, for a throwaway story in a platformer, this is a pretty fun concept. Although outside of a few short cutscenes in between levels, we really don't have to worry too much about the story for the rest of the game. Also, I just want to take a moment to highlight how awful the North American box art is for this game. Like, I know the PAL box art is also kind of plain, but it's just so much more aesthetically pleasing to my eyes. Although, neither can really top the Japanese box art. I mean, look at this thing. The game's also just called Johnny Bazooka over there, which is a... Uh, Kind of funny. So onto the gameplay and yep, we got ourselves a pretty traditional platformer here. Jumping and shooting is the name of the game. Move from one level to the next, fight the occasional boss and then get a password when you beat an area. All that good stuff. There's a grand total of five areas to visit, each with their own kind of mini segments and levels within. Some of these areas are your basic linear affairs, where your main goal is to get all the way from the left of the screen to the right of the screen, but the majority are actually larger locations where you need to complete a few different objectives or find some specific items. I've mentioned this on the channel before, but European-made 2D platformers often have this specific style. There's usually an abundance of items to collect and level design that is a... Uh, somewhat unorthodox and almost everything in the game is out to kill you and Johnny Bazooka Tone is very much that style of game. Now before we get into the nitty gritty let's talk a little bit about Johnny's movement and abilities. Now we've got our standard jump button which uh, lets you jump. We've got a fire button that lets us fire Johnny's guitar which is automatic, has infinite ammo and can be aimed in a bunch of different directions. It's basically Earthworm Jim's blaster but in guitar form and you know what ain't nothing wrong with that. You can also do a powered up attack by holding down the triangle button, just uh, just give me a second, any moment now, alright there it is. There's also a button for sucking up items with your guitar and if you press it again you can spit them back out. Now the next few moves we're going to cover are probably the most important in the game. There is a melee attack that is activated by pressing the R1 button, it's a uh, sort of spinning hop attack that propels Johnny in the air a little bit. Now this move on its own isn't too exciting, but holding down this button is also how you make Johnny run. Now you're going to need this to cross more than a few gaps in the game, and you'll be doing it in tandem with the game's most important maneuver, which is the hover shot. Whenever you're in the air, if you point your gun down and hold the shoot button, you'll hover in the air. Now this move is heavily momentum based and truthfully also a little bit finicky, but I kind of love it. And that's pretty much it for Johnny's moves. There's no other weapons or power-ups, just little old Johnny and his trusty guitar gun. Uh, vacuum thing. As for items, well, the main collectible are music notes, which come in big and little varieties. Little ones give you one note, and big ones give you ten. And if you collect one thousand, you get an extra life. But a much easier way of getting an extra life is just collecting a Johnny head if you see him. There's also these stars, which restore Johnny's health. Now, you can have a maximum of five health points at a time, and the bronze stars give you one point back, silver give you two, and gold give you three. And finally, we got rainbow notes. Now, these are hidden throughout each stage, and collecting them all gives you big bonus bonus points, which are mostly just for show really, but if you collect all the notes in order, you get brought to a special bonus stage, which I never accomplished even once, so I'm afraid I have no footage of that to show you. So now that we've covered everything really, uh, let's talk about the game. It's very, very hard. Johnny Bazooka Tone is a game that's quite difficult by design, but also quite difficult because it is poorly designed on top of that. First things first, let's talk about the graphics. Now. The game opts for that digitized look that was oh so popular during the mid 90s and truthfully it's not all that bad really. I quite like a lot of the sprites and visual design seen throughout the game even if it opts for an overly dark color palette a lot of the time but the problem is that it's one of those games where not everything is very clear. Can I walk on this thing? Is this thing gonna hurt me? Can I fire through this thing? It's very very inconsistent and often leads to you falling through a lot of platforms and taking a lot of damage that you didn't expect and more importantly, it makes you move very cautiously and second guess almost everything that you do, which is really the last thing you want in a platformer. Plus it doesn't help that pretty much everything is out to get you as well. 
Now these issues are also compounded by a few other things, namely some floaty movement and uh, asshole enemies. So Johnny's default speed, it's kind of slow. Johnny's run speed on the other hand, kind of fast. If you run, you're probably gonna run into an enemy. But even if you want to run, you can't do that without first doing this little hop, and that little hop will often propel you into stuff or off platforms. Truthfully, it's not the worst control you'll ever see in a 2D platformer, but there's a lot of things about it that make it not great. Manageable, but not great. And speaking of manageable, but not great, the enemies in this game, mostly assholes. A lot of them are very small and difficult to nail down, and even more of them are inexplicably invincible for short periods of time, meaning you gotta time your shots to damage them during certain windows, which they will almost always use to damage you back in some way too. These ball enemies that split into multiple little balls are absolutely the worst offenders, and how often they pack like two of them into a single room is downright criminal. Honestly, if it wasn't for the very generous invincibility period that you get after getting damage, I would have died so many more times in this game than I already did. It got to the point that it was just easier to kind of edge forward and get enemies into my field of view so I could take them out with a charged attack ahead of time, but that also meant waiting for the charge attack, so, you know, it was a lose-lose situation, really. Bosses, at the very least, weren't all that difficult to take out, although pretty much all of them, bar the surgeon and final boss, have really boring patterns. But hey, I'll take that over being frustrated any day of the week. Now, truthfully, all that stuff I can actually live with, but the thing that really bothered me the most about this game is that the levels are just so damn confusing. It's not even about knowing where to go, it's just wondering what to do. The first level in the penitentiary is pretty straightforward, save for some weird platforming towards the end, but pretty much every level beyond that will have you scratching your head more than a few times. The hotel is a massive vertical level that requires you to move suitcases around and travel through portals, suck up some soap to kill one specific enemy who lets you fix some elevators to move more suitcases to get a ticket to pass a bouncer, Oh, I don't want to talk about how long it took me to do all this. The next level has a kitchen segment where you gotta push eggs and flour dotted across the level into a cauldron to blast out of there. It was, uh, not fun. The next level after that sees you traveling back and forth, collecting viruses in a weird vehicle that's stuck in some pipes. It's not like it's even tough, it's just the whole thing is so odd and confusing. Also, every time you transition from a screen, you get a prolonged loading screen, of which you'll probably spend 30% in this level looking at. And the final level is quite literally a single screen that lasts about 30 seconds before you fight El Diablo. It's, uh, quite the ride. Also, check out this cutscene when you beat the final boss and get your guitar back. It's, uh, it's something. I don't know about you guys, but Johnny might be having sex with this guitar. At least, that's what the cutscene seems to be implying anyway. Also, if you happen to notice that sick solo in the background there, we should probably talk about the definitive highlight of Johnny Bazooka Tone. The music is absolutely amazing. Now, you'd expect the music in a game all about a musical legend and his kidnapped musical friends to be pretty good, and you'd be right, but I was kind of taken aback by how good it actually is. It's got elements of rock and roll, funk, jazz, soul, trip-hop, techno, and it is, without a doubt, the best part of this game. It can make even the worst levels bearable.
Also, special shout out to the end credits theme, which doesn't seem to be on YouTube anywhere, but is absolutely one of the best tracks in the whole game. That being said though, I'm still not exactly sure what's up with the weird chicken song that's in the third level that features bottles clinking and cows mooing during the song. Well, that's Johnny Bazooka Tone. It's not a very long game, taking about 9 or so minutes to be, and you know what? It's absolutely not the worst game in the world. It's enjoyable in parts, has some fun mechanics and interesting visuals, but really most of the time, it's just not very fun to play. It's a game that feels like a relic from a bygone era. You know, all those annoying platformers that came out during the 16-bit era, your Bubsies and your, I don't know, uh, Wayne's World, where you just never really feel comfortable playing it. You're always kind of on edge for one reason or another, or just downright confused too. I feel like this type of platformer was already outdated well before this game came out and all these years later, a lot of its issues are even more glaring, especially when comparing it to its contemporaries on the platform, although if we're looking at it from the perspective of a 3DO game, it's kinda good for a 3DO platformer, I guess. So yeah, not the worst thing I've ever played, but I would have a really hard time recommending it to anybody, I'd imagine most people would probably tap out by the second level, and it is a shame since you'd be missing out on the excellent soundtrack hidden away within, but fret not, some versions of the game actually come with the soundtrack on CD, and honestly, if you can get that cheap, it might be worth buying just for that alone. You get a mediocre game alongside some great music, and you know what? That's a pretty good deal in my book. Provide. Once upon a time, a blue-eyed boy from the Old West learned one of life's cruelest lessons, that evil was bigger than his gun. So he followed the footsteps of a mysterious master to the Far East, where he learned the secrets of the sword and came back home with the heart of a gunman and the soul of a samurai. Being the biggest hero round There wouldn't be an enemy That he could not put down With a gun well, Then one day Johnny met his match And turned his world around He changed his name and learned the Shogun Way of land of the rising sun
Hotel, the Samurai Gundam. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for our final game in this volume, Rising Zam, the Samurai Gunman, which first made its way to the PlayStation in March of 1999 in Japan, before seeing a Western release in September of the very same year. This game was chosen for the wheel by Paul Durst, who I'm going to imagine is Fred Durst's son, and is in fact doing this all for the Nookie. Appreciate your contribution, Mr. Durst. So out of all the games we've played today, this is the one I knew the least about, other than the fact it's a game about a samurai gunman, which you think would have made me check this out sooner, but alas, sometimes when you see something cool, it's better to just leave it as a total surprise until someday it's chosen via wheel, via somebody else's selection for said wheel, and well, here we are. Now something else that caught me by surprise was the developer behind this game, a little company called Universal Entertainment Planning Systems, or UEP Systems for short. These guys are the developers behind the Cool Borders series of games, and as far as I knew, that was the only series they ever worked on, except for one lone standout, Rising Zan, The Samurai Gunman, an action title that is a love letter to both classic Wild West and Samurai media, and also perhaps one of the most insane games ever released on the PlayStation. But as we all know, an insane game doesn't always make a good game. So let's see what Rising Zan has in store for us all these years later. So this is Johnny, the fastest and best shooter in all the West, and a man obsessed with being a hero. A man who thought he was untouchable until one day he was, uh, touched, I guess. This led Johnny to travel to the land of the Rising Sun to study under a Shogun master where he learned the ways of the blade, changed his name and became Rising Zan, the Samurai Gunman. And he is now returned to defeat evil once and for all. And really, as cool as that all sounds, it doesn't even come close to preparing you for what this game has in store. Because while I was expecting a somewhat generic and janky third person action game, what I didn't expect was cat baseball, giant hands poking people until they explode, slot machines, and some of the wackiest quick time events I have ever seen in a game. There's also something called hustle mode, which is a, uh, well, see for yourself. <laughs> So yeah, pretty early into this game, it becomes quite apparent that this thing is like the blueprint for crazy character-driven action games like God Hand, Devil May Cry, and No More Heroes. Just imagine those games, but in super janky PS1 form, and that's pretty much Rising Zan. Now, I'm not saying this game was a direct influence for the creation of those games. I mean, considering how obscure this title was upon release, and still is to this day, it would be pretty silly to say that, but at the same time, I'm not not saying it, you know? I think this alone probably makes Rising Zan one of the most interesting games in the whole PS1 library. It feels like a game that is in many ways ahead of its time, giving you a surprisingly skill-based combat system with an emphasis on getting big points to earn high rankings at the end of each level, but at the same time, it also doesn't take itself seriously in the slightest, throwing you from one wacky situation and combat encounter to the next, while not being afraid to mix up the gameplay at the drop of a hat. And not only that, it is genuinely very funny too. Now, taking all this into consideration, you'd wonder why this game wasn't a bigger deal when it first came out, and honestly, the answer comes down to one thing. Nobody really knew how to make a game like this yet, and while UEP Systems certainly made a valiant attempt, it's a... Uh, well, it's a PS1 game, alright, let's just... Let's just put it that way. So I suppose the best way to get this across to you is to go through the various controls and combat in this game. And thankfully the training mission does a pretty good job of explaining everything to you. So this mission sees Johnny taking on his final test from his master before he officially becomes a samurai. And fun fact, the voice of Johnny's master is none other than Mario Mario, Charles Martinet himself. Defense is the most important thing. Keep that in mind. That's fun. So this training mission gives us a bunch of challenges to test out our various abilities, from jumping over obstacles, defending and parrying, and taking out some little Mokujin dudes with both your sword and your gun. Now, all the basic abilities, jumping, slashing, shooting, blocking, are all done by pressing a single button, right? Nothing out of the ordinary here. Well, as long as you consider spinning a blade to hover as your double jump, ordinary, that is. All your special abilities, though, like parrying or your various sword or gun abilities, 
are done by double tapping a direction before pressing the input. For example, parrying is forward forward or one. To spin your blade in a circle, you press left right X. To dash forward with your sword, press forward forward X. Want to do a jumping spin attack? Back forward X. You can do these attacks at any time as long as you have some of this blue meter next to your health, which thankfully regenerates pretty quickly between moves. Now, I've been critical of these types of inputs in the past in certain, uh, action games, but in this case, I think they actually work quite well because there are never more than two directional inputs max, they're easy to remember, and there's only like seven total in the whole game. I mean, the sword dash move is pretty much Dante's stinger attack right down to it being the same input, so if it's good enough for that, it's good enough for this. Of course, where Zan is a little different to Dante is in his speed and controls. Now, Zan isn't exactly the smoothest controlling character out there. Running around is a little rigid to say the least, but it's not exactly bad per se. Once again, I don't know if it's the amount of PS1 games that I play in the regular, but I found moving and platforming pretty easy in this game, even if I can admit it's not exactly very good. On the other hand, one thing that took me a while to get used to was the game's camera and lock-on system. You see, in Rising Zan, you can lock on the enemies by pressing the L1 button, and if you tap the L1 button again while locked on, you swap between enemies. If you use this in conjunction with the L2 and R2 buttons, you can basically sidestep around and circle enemies, which is more or less what the game wants you to be doing. Thing is though, this lock on system is very, very finicky. While it will lock on the enemies, it doesn't always face you towards enemies, nor will it face the camera towards enemies either. In fact, the only control you have over the camera in this game is by holding L1, which will center the camera in front of you, and very slowly at that. Now, given the pace at which this game moves and how many enemies can gang up on you and how easy it is to get the camera stuck in an awkward position, uh, you're probably gonna struggle with this a lot early on. In fact, I'd say this is one of the most janky and awkward cameras and lock-on systems that I've probably ever seen in a game, at least until I got used to it. But truthfully, I don't think the camera and lock-on in this game is as bad as it first seems really. It's certainly not great, not even good even. I think it's just very, very unusual. The problem is if you go in expecting a traditional lock-on system, you're gonna quickly get flustered and lose track of your character quite easily. The lock-on in this game requires careful positioning and timing in some cases. And when you start to understand its quirks, I actually found it could work quite well, to the point where I started getting quite comfortable with and actually really enjoying the combat. It almost looks like I really know what I'm doing here, and honestly, that's half the battle. So much of the combat in this game comes down to watching the enemies for openings, controlling your positioning, making sure to time your attacks to deal big damage, continue to pressure enemies, and also give yourself enough space to avoid and block counter attacks. There's a nice ebb and flow to it once you kind of know what you're doing, and once you nail that stuff down, Everything else is really just a tree. Killing fodder enemies lets you build up your hustle gauge to unleash hustle mode and rain down attacks with a giant sword while running around at high speeds, which uh, never really gets old. You can pick up various different ammos to deal massive damage with your gun against bigger enemies. Hell, even your standard bullets can deal massive damage in this game if you use it properly, especially if you use the special gun attack that auto fires it like a machine gun. The game's quick time events are called all button events, which unsurprisingly let you use nearly every single button on the controller to bash away. And normally, I'm not a fan of games overusing button bashing segments, but there's never a time in this game where a quick time event isn't hilarious or badass. Whether you're facing some ninjas in a bell ringing contest or slicing up a boss, it is always a good time. By the way, throughout the game's nine levels, you're gonna fight a bunch of bosses too, which are probably the highlight of the game for me. These fights often offer up unique patterns and gimmicks to keep them fresh, and when you beat them, you enter into one final all-out attack to do as much damage as you can to get a point bonus at the end, and then you cut them into a number of different pieces depending on how well you did. I don't know how good Ultra Sexy Hero is, but I don't care. That's good enough for me. Anyway, I suppose we should take some time to talk about the game's visuals and presentation too. Now, from a pure technical and graphical standpoint, I think the game is fine. It's certainly a little rough around the edges, but to its credit, the performance is pretty solid. But you are going to see a lot of graphical glitches, some dodgy textures, the odd bit of clipping, especially on the characters, and the level design is truthfully quite limited throughout the game, usually bringing you from one simple room to the next. But even though this game isn't the most polished thing around, I think the zaniness of its characters, the environments and the obstacles that you're going to come up against in this game 
completely distract you from the game's less polished aspects and just leave you with a big dumb smile on your face instead. And a big part of this comes down to the sound as well. Now, this game is fully voiced and the characters who speak in English do a fun, suitably cheesy job. But it's the enemies and side characters that really steal the show for me. Be it the hostages that you can rescue... <laughs> The singing ninjas or just whatever the hell this guy is saying. I cannot get enough of this. I love it so much. The music is also really rather good too. Obviously you can't top the amazing opening theme or the hustle mode music, but some of the levels and bosses have great tracks in their own right. I wouldn't say the game is filled wall to wall with bangers or anything, but the music isn't just silly can't be fun. It's not afraid to turn up the tempo when the action heats up, let me tell you. So, when all is said and done, Rising Zan's 9 levels shouldn't take you much more than 90 minutes to 2 hours to be, and truthfully, once I got the hang of the combat and camera, it ended up being pretty easy too, but fear not. Beating the game doesn't just unlock you a brand new hard mode, but a whole new character to play through the game with as well, called Sapphire, a side character from the main game, who's equipped with an entirely different move set to boot. And with even harder modes to unlock once you beat the game again, medals to get for reaching higher rankings, and even more secrets, it is safe to say, if you liked what Rising Zan has to offer, there is plenty more to keep you busy. So, needless to say, I had a really good time playing this game. Although, that being said, this is very, very much a game that's, uh, let's just say right up my alley. Being a fan of these silly, over-the-top action games like God Hand, like No More Heroes, it's only natural I would gravitate towards this game. But at the same time, I must stress that while this game is a lot of fun, it is also about as PS1 as they come, and the control scheme, combat, camera and lock-on system will be a massive turn-off to some people, that is a fact. But I'm gonna defend all that stuff too, it's certainly not terrible, it's just different. Take your time, be patient, and try to understand it properly, and I think you'll find this game plays a little better than some people would give it credit for, in fact, you might even say it's pretty good. Certainly not great, but when the game's this fun, who really cares, you know? Rising Zan the Samurai Gunman certainly isn't a game for everybody, but if you really love and appreciate the experimental nature and zaniness of early 3D games, even with all their faults, this trip into the Wild West isn't one that you should miss out on. Are you? Yes. 
once in a while.